Claiming the Cowboy, a Royal Brothers novel, Grapeseed Falls Romance, Book 5, written by Liz Isaacson, performed by Caroline McLaughlin. Chapter 1 Shane Royal stood in the kitchen, the pan of scrambled eggs in front of him almost done. He switched off the heat to the burner just as his next younger brother Dylan entered. Whistling. Always whistling. The sound had annoyed Shane growing up, too, but their mother had loved it. She told Dylan he should go to Hollywood and be the voice of a bird in animated movies. That's how good he is, she used to say. Probably still would if Shane ever saw her. Morning, his brother said, pausing long enough in his twittering to speak. Eggs are done, Shane announced. Did you see Austin? He's moving a little slow this morning, Dylan said. He set two pieces of toast in the coaster and scooped some eggs onto a plate. Shane always set out plates and utensils, the way his mama always had. I'll check on him. Shane left Dylan in the kitchen to check on the youngest royal brother, who'd suffered some broken ribs last summer. Sometimes he still had some pain from the accident, though the doctors claimed his bones had healed. Ribs move, Dr. Thelonious had said. Sometimes they'll shift around and cause some discomfort. So basically Austin had to live with the pain whenever it came. Shane hadn't been happy about that, but just like most things in his life, there was little he could do about it. Hey, bud, he said as he climbed up to the loft Dylan and Austin shared. His brother winced as he tried to lift his arm to put on a gray t-shirt. Shane held a soft spot for Austin, as he'd only been 16 when their father had left and Shane had taken him under his wing when things at home had fallen apart. Let me... He strode to the bed and lifted the shirt over Austin's head. I need something easy today, he said, his voice strained. Shane never was sure if it was because Austin was in a lot of pain, or if he was embarrassed he was injured and couldn't do as much as he used to be able to do. Probably both. I've got our monthly meeting this morning, Shane said, so you just stay here until I can get you on something easy. I can do the feeding. All right, then. Shane helped him slip his feet into his boots and steadied him as he stood until he found his balance. I made eggs. You always make eggs. Old habits die hard. And Shane would know as he thrived on ritual and routine. If he could count on things to be the same each day, he didn't have to think about the changes his life had undergone fifteen years ago. He should be over it anyway, but he wasn't. How did one get over his father abandoning his ranch, his sons, his wife, Everything he'd spent his life to build. Not only that, but his mama had known the ranch was half a million dollars in debt, so Shane's father had left them that, too. Shane disliked days that started out with him thinking about his father. He pushed the man he hadn't spoken to or seen in a decade and a half from his mind and helped his brother get breakfast before heading next door for the monthly management meeting. He'd been foreman on his family's ranch for exactly one month before his father had left, and Shane was grateful for another opportunity now, even though he was only co-foreman. Kurt had been leading this ranch for 15 years, but he had a new baby on the way and didn't want the 80-hour weeks. Shane did. Hard physical work kept his anger at bay, and exhaustion kept the ghosts of his past inside the glass boxes where he'd put them. Now that May had moved in, curtains hung on the wall and flowers sat on the dining room table. Kurt picked them up and moved them to the kitchen counter, and May slipped out the back door saying, Come on, Patches. This is boring ranch stuff. Hey, Shane. Kurt glanced in his direction and picked up a plate of baked goods, courtesy of his wife, no doubt. Chocolate, chocolate chip muffins. Come get one. He set the plate on the table along with a pile of napkins. Shane plucked a muffin from the plate and took a seat on the right end of the table. Dwayne and Felicity entered the cabin, chatting to each other, and a flurry of activity followed as they got the muffins and napkins and started asking Kurt questions about May, the pregnancy, and if he wanted a boy or girl. Shane didn't want to talk about the pleasantries of life. He had very little in his life that was actually pleasant, but he'd been trying to not begrudge people who seemed to have found some way to be happy. How was the weekend, Shane? Dwayne asked as he sat across from him. Fine and dandy. Shane put on a tight smile for the boss. What'd you do with your day off? Went out to the North End Zone cabin. It was one of his favorite places in the whole world, and he was grateful for even a few hours of solitude, with only his horse and the Texas breeze to talk with. He loved his brothers, he did, 
but sometimes he simply needed some time to himself to remember who he was and to remind himself not to be so angry all the time. Kurt sat at the head of the table, and Felicity passed out red folders to start the meeting. This is our schedule for the month. We've got Levi and Heather requesting harvesting help in their orchards, and the farrier coming in for five weeks, and a new rotation of men going through the immunization clinic. Gawain said something to which Kurt responded, but Shane couldn't think past the farrier coming in for five weeks. The farrier. Robin Cook. The last woman who'd caught Shane's eye. The last woman who'd broken his heart. All right, so maybe that was an exaggeration. She wouldn't even go out with him, so she'd humiliated him. And yet, his pulse seemed to thrum beneath his skin, and Shane couldn't believe excitement pounded through his bloodstream with every beat of his heart. So, I'll need someone to oversee Robin, Dwayne said. She's bringing her tiny house, and we've got a new cement pad for it on the west side of the homestead. She'll park over there, too, and she'll reshoe and take care of all of our horses for the next five weeks. Felicity wrote something, and Shane's mind spun. Kurt said something about Minnie's hooves, but Shane didn't much care about Kurt's horse. I'll oversee Robin, he blurted, drawing everyone's attention. Dwayne blinked and nodded, waving at Felicity, who wrote something else in her red folder. She looked up at Shane when she finished, but she hadn't been here three years ago when Robin had shunned him, so surely she didn't know. Dwayne had been, Kurt too. Neither of them said anything, and the meeting continued. Shane forced himself to pay attention, but it sure was hard knowing that the beautiful blonde hazel-eyed Robin Cook would be at the ranch in only a few hours. Shane lifted his hat and wiped the sweat from his forehead. Robin was late and the summer heat annoyed Shane, almost as much as someone who didn't respect another person's time. His throat felt packed with sand, and he was about to go around to the back porch of the homestead, where Duane kept a refrigerator full of water, soda, and energy drinks, when he heard the low diesel grumble of a very large truck, Robin's very large truck. He spun back to find the white behemoth turning underneath the ranch sign. His pulse quickened, though he told it not to, with as much confidence as he could infuse in his stride, he crossed the cement pad where he'd been waiting and moved past the long storage shed on the side of Duane's yard. He lifted his hand to get her attention, and she handled the truck with the ease of someone who drove large vehicles on the daily, which, of course, she obviously did. Surprise filled him as a tiny house came into view. In the past, Robin had stayed with a family in town or on another ranch as she worked the ranches in the surrounding areas but this blue-sided tiny house was a new addition. The huge truck it took to tow it was, too, though she'd always preferred trucks. Maybe just not one quite this large. She looked like a doll behind the wheel, a beautiful blonde doll. Shane shook his head, his fantasies already running away with him, and the woman hadn't even gotten out of the car yet. The tiny house sported clean windows in white frames with a white front door and white trim along the roof. The wheels didn't look big enough or strong enough to support the house, but they moved as she inched around and forward and then started backing up. Shane stepped back onto the cement pad where the house would sit. Sure, the tires would pop when she bumped them up from the dirt ground up to the harder surface. The house creaked and groaned, but the wheels made the transition otherwise. He kept waving her back, then motioned to the right when she started to move diagonally. He held his hands up for her to stop, then jogged forward to where her elbow lagged out the driver's side window. He wouldn't allow himself to look straight at her, so he gestured back the way he'd come, toward the cement pad as he spoke. Hey, which way do you want this? The front door toward the shed or toward the range? She turned toward him and Shane couldn't help the magnetic pull she exerted over him, and he swiveled his head to look fully at her. Her hazel eyes hadn't changed, and her long lashes framed them beautifully. Shane pulled in a breath of superheated summer air, and he fought the urge to cough. Hey, Shane, she said, her easy smile almost blinding him. Hey, Robin. His smile flitted across his face, crinkling his eyes, and it felt good, better than he'd felt in a while, actually. The house is fine like that. I do need several feet by the front door for the steps. Shane glanced back at the cement pad. You should pull forward and put it further back to the right, then. I'll guide you. She flipped the truck into gear and eased forward while Shane repositioned himself. When she started backing up again, he waved her in like he was air traffic control or something. But Shane had no idea how long she'd had the house. 
and maybe she hadn't done a lot of maneuvering with it. His heel touched the end of the cement pad, and he held up his hand for her to stop. She didn't. Oh, he called, holding up both hands in the universal stop now gesture. Robin kept on coming, and Shane scrambled out of the way. His ankle twisted and his cowboy boot buckled, and down he went. Adrenaline and fear shot through him as the edge of her tiny house came straight at his face now. And it suddenly wasn't quite so... Chapter 2 Robin couldn't find Shane in her rearview mirror, and she couldn't get the truck to go without pushing on the accelerator. So she put the vehicle in park, assuming the tires had met the cement, which should be far enough. She leapt out of the truck, a maneuver she'd practiced dozens of times at home, parked in her backyard before doing it in public, before selling her house in Temple and buying the tiny house that she could take with her all over the state. Shane? A moan sounded from somewhere beyond the house, and her heart flipped over. Shane? She hurried now, her cowgirl boots slapping against the cement as she moved toward the sound of pain. She found the handsome blonde cowboy on the ground, holding his nose. Oh, holy brown cows, she said. Did I hit you? I told you to stop, he said. Both hands, stop. He held them up and she got sight of all the blood. Blood on his hands, blood smeared all over his face, blood everywhere. The vision of his ice blue eyes and straight white teeth blurred. Please don't pass out, she thought. Do not pass out. She tried commanding herself, but still she swayed on her feet as her stomach swooped and everything turned white. He wiped his face and said, Did you not see me? Before she swiped for the side of the house to steady her, she missed, and her right knee cracked against the cement, shooting pain down to her foot and up into her ribs. Hey, you okay? Shane's voice existed, but Robin's vertigo was too strong to see him properly. She really didn't want him to know about her phobia of blood. She could handle animal injuries. Give her a horse, a dog, or a cow who needed help, and she'd help it. But she couldn't handle her own injuries, or apparently seeing Shane's nosebleed. One of his hands touched her back, providing an anchor point, and the other gripped the one she'd been trying to find with the house. I've got you, he said, and Robin drew in a breath filled with the Texas heat. And Shane's very masculine scent, with hints of musk and cedar, and all kinds of other manly things. So he smelled good. Big deal. She liked pizza, too. Everything rushed back at her, and she shook away the spiraling vision. Finally, she could focus, and the contact points between her and Shane felt way too hot. He seemed to think so, too, because he removed his hands from her body. I'm gonna... I've got... I'll be right back to help you get the steps out. He strode away, still swiping at his nosebleed. Robin saw little drops of blood on the edge of the cement, but they didn't bother her the way seeing his nose gushing red did. She couldn't believe she'd hit him with her house. Who did that? Someone who had no idea what they were doing with a monster truck with a whole home attached to the back of it. That was who. And that person was Robin. And now Shane knew. She shook her head. It didn't matter what he knew or didn't know. She could get the steps out herself, as she'd practice that too, this time in the front driveway. But she could do it with just the right leverage and a special tool the salesman had included when she'd bought the house. It had never been lived in, and the 280-square-foot house had charmed her from the first moment she'd stepped inside. She loved the way it had a full kitchen with full-sized appliances, and she still had room for a full-sized couch, complete with a queen bed under the cushions. There was storage in shelves and cupboards along the wall above the couch, and in the bathroom she could enter easily. It was a tight fit into the shower, but with her petite frame she could do it. And the stairs up to her bedroom loft provided more storage, as well as a wood feature that made the home feel country chic. She couldn't stand all the way up when she got to the loft, but she had several clothing rods for her clothes along the side wall, and she'd pushed her bed against the other wall so she had room to sit on the mattress and get dressed, read, check her phone, or use her laptop. There was even room for Misfit, the little Yorkie still sitting in the cab of the truck. She really only used the loft for sleeping, and if she needed to use the computer, she sat on the couch or one of the two bar stools at the end of the kitchen counter. Without room for a dining room table, the bar was her only place to sit and eat besides the couch. She'd put a picnic table on the patio just outside the front door, and since this was summer in Texas, 
She didn't need to worry about inclement weather all that much. Robin loved everything about it, and once she got the steps in place, she collected Misfit and went inside to take the straps off the furniture and other items she'd tied down for the drive to Grape Seed Falls. See? We'll be just fine right here, she told the little dog, who ran in a circle and then jumped onto the first stair leading up to the loft. Yes, I packed your bed. Don't worry. Shane whistled as he entered, and Robin turned toward him, hoping he hadn't heard her talking to her dog. This is much bigger than it looks. He looked from rafter to rafter. I love the exposed wood. He reached up like he'd been able to touch it, but the ceilings in the kitchen area were fifteen feet tall. Loft bedroom. Lots of sitting room. He met her eye and smiled. This is great. Do you like it? I love it, she said, some of her enthusiasm returning. Did I break your nose? I'm so sorry. I'm still... Robin clamped her lips closed before she admitted she hadn't done a lot of practice backing up with the truck and the tiny house. Shane waved away her apology. It's fine. I tripped. His neck and face turned red and he spun away from her. So I've been assigned to help you while you're here with us at Grapeseed Ranch, he said, his voice lower and rougher now. So, anything you need, you let me know. He was going to be her point of contact. She pressed her eyes closed and said a silent prayer. She liked Shane. That wasn't the problem. Or maybe it was. She liked him too much, and he'd asked her out several times already, and she wasn't sure she could ward off his advances for the next five weeks. Because she'd always been attracted to Shane Royal, and she didn't want to hurt him again. Here's my number. He handed her a slip of paper. I'll leave you to get settled. I'll be in Horse Barn, too, when you're ready, and we can go from there. He flashed her one of his most attractive smiles, and Robin practically swooned against the gray-painted wall beside her. Oh, coming here was such a bad idea. But she needed the money, desperately, and Felicity had offered a permanent place to accommodate her tiny house while Robin did her work in Hill Country, for free. And having somewhere to put her house for free was something Robin really needed, so she didn't have to keep paying high fees for national parks or campgrounds. She'd always loved Grapeseed Ranch, and it had definitely gotten better a few years ago when Shane and his brothers had started working here. So she sent up another prayer that she could weather this summer with Shane so close, and set to work on packing the things she'd reduced to represent her life, including the little bed for Misfit, who curled into it as if she hadn't slept the whole way to Grape Seed Falls. Twenty minutes later, Robin had the house ready for living. Almost. She went around the shed and across the expanse of lawn. Felicity had been right when she'd said the cement pad would provide plenty of privacy. From this side of the shed, the ranch buildings, horse fields, and a grazing pasture spread before her. In the distance, down the road and around a bend or two, sat the eight cabins that formed the cabin community here on the ranch. Robin instinctively knew which one was Shane's, and her eyes went immediately to the sliver of rooftop she could see. Ridiculous, she told herself. It wasn't that he was off-limits. It was that Robin simply wasn't interested in being tied down. And dating and relationships, well, she knew how they ended. In heartbreak or a serious attachment. She didn't want either, thank you very much. After all, she'd given up everything permanent in her life when she'd spent every last penny she had, and then some she didn't have to buy the house that would set her free. She took a moment to draw in a deep breath and enjoy the stillness out here on the ranch. There was nothing like the scene of fresh air and straw, grass and blue sky. All right, then. She sighed and continued toward the back porch. Through the screen door, she heard women talking, and she almost turned right back around and returned to her sanctuary. Oh, there she is, Felicity said, and Robin had to go in now. Hey, she wiped her hands down her jeans. You made it. Felicity grinned at her, a wide, friendly smile. Everything go okay? Besides mowing over one of the cow hands. Yeah, fine. So, Shane's on your service, Felicity said, moving around the kitchen and pulling open drawers until she found what she wanted. He gave you his number? She flicked her eyes toward her, her eyebrows raised. Yes, ma'am. Robin's gaze wandered to the other brunette in the kitchen. She had high cheekbones and the longest, darkest brown hair Robin had ever seen. She sat on a barstool, 
plucking grapes from their vines and letting them drop into a big bowl. This is May Pemberton, Felicity said. She married Kurt last Christmas. Robin's surprise surely showed on her face. Oh, wow. Good for, I mean, congratulations. Kurt was usually assigned to Robin when she came out to Grapeseed Ranch, but of course, she'd never stayed on site here before. Of course, they'd need someone to make sure she had what she needed and that there weren't any problems. Thank you, May said standing. The tiniest baby bump pushed against her shirt. Grapes are done, Felicity. Strawberries next? Yep, and I have the sandwiches bag. Having a party today? Robin asked. Half of her hoped she'd be invited, and the other half just wanted to hook up her utilities and be done for the day. She hadn't anticipated the high emotional toll leaving behind her life in Temple would take, and combined with seeing Shane again so soon after her arrival, and Robin felt spent. Just a quick picnic in the Cowboy Commons, Felicity said. You're welcome to come. Oh, I can't. The words were out before Robin could censor them. I just came over to ask about the utilities. Oh, right. Felicity swiped a paper off the refrigerator. Dwayne left this for you. He said you'd know what to do. She scanned the paper, her eyebrows lifting. I can get Shane to come help. No, Robin barked. Both women looked at her, the food prep stalling for several long seconds. She forced a laugh out of her throat. No, I'll be fine. Thank you, though. Robin took the paper, being careful not to crush it or even look at it, and lifted her free hand in a wave. Thanks, Felicity. She made a hasty escape through the back door, not slowing to see if the two women would start talking about her. Of course they would. Once around the corner of the shed, in a patch of shade and without fear of anyone observing her, Robin looked at the paper. Water was easy enough. Duane had connected a hose to the outside faucet, and all she had to do was screw it into her intake. She had a filtration system on her sink, and that went easily. Electricity was also easy. The shed had power, and Duane had left an insulated high-voltage cord for her to plug in, so she and Misfit would be cool enough, and she'd be able to brush her teeth, cook dinner, and flush the toilet. But where would that waste go? Sewer, sewer, she muttered, reading the instructions once and then again. The ranch had a septic tank, and she needed to connect to that. She had an output line with a standard fitting. She'd never had any problem connecting the RV waste lines and campgrounds. But here, she wasn't quite sure how to connect to Duane's septic tank. She consulted the paper Felicity had given her, and she found the line they'd left for her. She picked it up from the grass, but it looked different from the ones she'd used before. Twisting the two ends together seemed to work, but at the same time it didn't feel quite right. Robin followed the line toward where it disappeared into the ground, and she bent to examine the connection there. The three-pronged end of this line looked more like what she was used to, so she undid the fitting in the green utility box, thinking perhaps Duane had simply put the wrong end here and it just needed to be switched. The hose popped off with a ring of metal, and the horrible, putrid, gut-wrenching scent of sewer came with it. Robin fell back as if knocked over by the smell, desperation causing her pulse to race. The stench made her gag, and she staggered to her feet, determined to take care of this before Shane found out. She did not want him associating her with the smell of sewer only an hour into her stay at Grapeseed Ranch. So she grabbed the hose and started wrestling with it to reverse the two ends, the awful smell making her eyes water. Chapter 3 Shane couldn't help the way his gaze drifted during the picnic lunch May and Felicity had brought to the tables near the flagpole in the cabin community. He couldn't see the homestead past the barns, which meant he couldn't even catch a glimpse of the storage shed and the roof of the tiny house that sat just behind it. Disappointment cut through him when he heard Felicity tell Duane that Robin wasn't coming. His nose throbbed, and he wondered if it had been broken. He told no one about the incident, even when Felicity had asked how he'd gotten a bloody nose. He'd simply shook his head and used the half-bath off the kitchen to get cleaned up. Austin and Dylan flanked him at the table, chattering about the gophers out in the fields behind the cabins. They were fixing to trap some of them, and Dylan kept saying he was going to make gopher stew. Shane let them carry on, though neither one of them knew how to do much more than boil water. If they couldn't slap something between two pieces of bread or fry an egg, they didn't need it, 
and Stu was way beyond their culinary skills. Shane soaked in the easy camaraderie between him and his brothers, as well as the other men who worked at the ranch. Duane and Felicity didn't host picnics much, but they did a good job making sure everyone knew they had a place here at Grapeseed Falls. The sense of belonging was one of the first things Shane had fallen in love with about the ranch. He tried to emulate how Duane treated the men when he interacted with them. Duane had coached him that it wouldn't be easy being the boss, and sometimes he had to make unpopular decisions, and that it wasn't like running a family ranch. Shane had kept his mouth shut and nodded through all the training. The best training had been watching Duane all these years and doing what he would do in any given situation. He was right about it being different than a family ranch, but Shane didn't let the reminder of what he'd lost dig at him. At least, most of the time he didn't. He just started to relax when his phone went off. It wouldn't have been so alarming if both Dylan's and Austin's hadn't sounded in the next three seconds, too. Family text, he muttered, wondering if it was his mother or his father. He hoped his mom. Then he wouldn't have to ignore the message, delete it without responding, and deal with the guilt. It's dad, Austin said. Don't care, Shane said automatically. Don't read it out loud. Austin frowned, but Shane didn't care about that either. Austin, the youngest, had been shielded from a lot of what had happened 15 years ago, and Shane wanted to keep it that way. He'd been asked what was so vile about their father that he couldn't even speak to him, but Shane didn't want to go into details. Austin had been too young to get the full brunt of it when his father had left. Dylan understood more, but he still lifted his phone and read the message. Definitely don't read it, he muttered under his breath before stuffing the phone in his back pocket. But Austin started thumbing out a reply. Not Shane's problem, and he was actually glad that Austin self felt like he could communicate with their father. Shane knew he'd be disappointed sooner or later, though he hoped the sting came later, much later. he just finished his fruit salad, dessert in Felicity's book, which made no sense to Shane. Had she never heard of brownies? When a putrid smell wafted over the group. Duane's head turned toward the homestead at the same time Kurtz perked up. Shane copied them, looking at the barns as if he could see through the wooden nails to find the source of the unpleasant smell. And being a ranch, foul smells weren't that uncommon. But this, this was a whole new level of stink Shane hadn't smelled in a long time. Kurt stood and Shane went with him. This can't be good, the other man said, and he waved at Duane to stay while he and Shane took care of it. They strode past horses, all of them facing the homestead, and that wasn't a good sign either. Kurt pulled out his phone and said, Call Duane in a freaky calm voice even though his pace increased. It's the sewer, Shane said as they approached the edge of the field, and the stench wasn't letting up. A streak of blonde caught his attention and he said, Robin. She stayed behind to hook up the utilities. Kurt twitched and said, Hey, so it's definitely the sewer at the homestead. Shane said he saw Robin, but I don't see her now. He scanned the homestead's yard. What? Yeah, okay. He dropped the phone to his side and said, Duane wants you to handle it. Me? Shane paused already half a step ahead of Kurt. He says Robin was assigned to you, and he wants you to deal with it. What if... Shane set his jaw. All right, I'll let you know. He continued on, making his shoulder as boxy as possible, though he wanted to find a gas mask and get as far away from the offensive smell as possible and the relentless sun wasn't going to help matters. He neared the homestead, and he hadn't seen Robin again. Maybe she'd gotten everything hooked up. Maybe this would be no big deal. Robin? Detouring toward the storage shed, he scanned the yard for puddles or problems. He couldn't see anything. Robin? Coming. A moment later, she appeared at the corner of the storage shed, breathless and red-faced. She scraped her bangs off her forehead and puffed out her cheeks. Hey. Is everything okay? He approached cautiously the way he would a terrified dog. He still couldn't locate the source of the smell. I had a little trouble getting the sewer line hooked up to the septic tank, but I got it. Shane nodded, not wanting to contradict her. We can smell the septic tank over in the cowboy commons. He stopped a few feet away, her beauty striking him full force in the chest. Why couldn't he move past her? Would she say yes this time if he asked her out again? 
Do not ask her, he commanded himself. Before words streamed through his head, a constant reminder of what had happened last time, he'd already made a fool of himself once. Neither of them needed a repeat of that. Want me to check it anyway? he asked. She sighed and her slight shoulders fell. Yeah, you better. She stuffed her hands in her pockets. I've never... I mean, this is the first time I've hooked up to someone's tank. I usually use the RV hookups. Oh? Shane walked alongside her, noticing a fold-up picnic table had been set out to the side of the steps, creating an outdoor eating area. And the steps themselves created a nice porch where she'd put a rocking camp chair. He hoped the wind wouldn't steal that away. But with a shed in the house, the chair should be okay. You've been living in a mobile home lot. Campgrounds, mostly, she said. I'm glad to be somewhere more permanent for a while. Shane let himself scan her from her dark denim jeans to her peach-colored blouse. Her blonde hair he wanted to rake his fingers through. Her lovely blue eyes. That cute smattering of freckles across her cheeks. Her cowgirl hat hung down her back, but she made no move to replace it on her head. More permanent, he asked. I thought the point of having a tiny house was non-permanence. A ghost of a smile whipped across her face. Sort of, I guess. It's about being able to go where the work is and not be an imposition. It's about not having to pay for a house I don't live in much. She lifted the shoulder closest to him in a shrug and pressed her lips together as if she'd said too much. Shane paused at the end of the cement pad. Didn't you tell me you don't want to be tied down? He hadn't meant for the words to come out with quite so much bite, but the way Robin Flinch said they had. Never mind, he muttered before rounding the house and checking the electrical and water lines. They looked good. These work okay, he asked. She appeared at the corner of the house, the cowgirl hat now in place so he couldn't see her eyes. They were probably storming like a hurricane coming toward his shore, and he didn't want to see them anyway. They work okay, yes. The sewer hookup was right next to that, and in a normal campground, she'd connect the two ends and be done. But here at the homestead, it didn't quite look like her fittings matched up with the hose she'd connect it to. He'd gotten used to the smell by now, and he examined the two pieces. They don't match up, he said. Want to go try flushing the toilet, and I'll see what happens. She turned without a word, and several seconds later, the sound of rushing water met his ears. And some of it, clean, came through the connection. He waited until that ran through, and then he wrenched the two ill-fitting pieces apart. He aligned them and screwed them in tight together. Knocking came on the window above him and Robin's face filled the pane of glass. Should I try it again? Her muffled words came through the glass and he nodded. She did, and this time the fitting stayed dry. Now to figure out where the water was going. He followed the tube out into the lawn, which sloped slightly upward to the house. Duane had provided a hookup for her to his main septic line. He turned and came face to face with the gorgeous Robin, who exhaled and stuck her hands in her back pockets. Thanks so much, Shane. The Georgian draw on his name made his whole body heat up. The first summer they'd met, she told him about her mother, how she was raised as an only child on a patch of land only an hour from the seashore. Her mother rescued animals and ran a veterinary office as a secretary, and Robin had gotten her love of dogs and horses from her mother. Sure thing, he managed to say before she thought him mute. You should come on over to the picnic. As soon as the words left his mouth, he wished he could suck them back in. Oh, I... Felicity may have tons of food. It's no imposition. Why y'all having a picnic today? She asked, twisting in the direction of the cabin community. Why had he invited her? It wasn't his shindig, and if she came, he'd be dancing on eggshells and hoping his brothers didn't notice that his three-year crush was still in full force. Robin tilted her head, still waiting for his answer. He cleared his throat. We finished all the planning last week, in record time, so we're taking a long lunch today, courtesy of Duane and Felicity. Robin smiled, her pink lips thinning to show her white teeth. Shane wanted to touch her tanned skin thread his fingers through her hair, and paused just before he tasted her mouth. He backed up a step instead. I better head back and report. She fell back, too, going all the way to her cement pad before saying, Tell them I'm sorry about the smell. 
Shane waved and forced his feet to go in the opposite direction than what they wanted to do. But he would not fit inside that tiny house with her. Not even the huge open range was big enough to contain the feelings he still harbored for her. And he really hated that. Chapter 4 Robin had counted to twenty with her back against the solid wood door of her house, and still the desire to head on over to the picnic raged through her. It'll be fun, she muttered to herself. She didn't have any food in the house, and she didn't really want to go back to town right now. A nap sounded good, but her stomach gurgled and growled a warning that if she didn't feed it soon, there would be a riot. Misfit hadn't even moved from her bed, so Robin spun and burst out of the house calling, Shane, as she spilled down the steps. Surely he wouldn't still be nearby. The man had legs as long as ears, and he'd already been moving fast across the lawn when she'd last seen him. After tumbling around the corner of the shed, she saw him standing a hundred yards away, across the field. He looked at her, and that tawny cowboy hat cocked to the left a little. Her heart pitter-patted, and she wished it wouldn't. She didn't want to hurt the handsome cowboy, but she wasn't interested in him either. You just keep lying to yourself, she thought as she closed the distance between them. You really don't think Felicity will mind, she asked, though the woman had invited her earlier. Nah, it'll be fine, Shane said with a smile. Come on. He stepped slower this time, and Robin tried to hide the fact that her breathing was labored from walking so quickly across the field. Shane probably ran ten miles a day, and then lifted whole heifers with those thick arms and shoulders he had. How's your ma? He asked, his voice low and his eyes trained on the ground. She's doing real great, Robin said, glad for an easy vein of conversation. She's getting ready to retire from the vet's office. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Robin thought it would be easy, casual, if she reached out and laced her fingers through Shane's. But there was no way she could do that even if she did crave the touch of another human being. How long had it been since she'd had physical contact with someone? She couldn't even remember. It's time. She's got all her cats and those four dogs, and now she's got quite the herd of goats. Robin laughed, hoping a measure of joy filtered into the sound. Shane chuckled, the sound deep and delicious, like dark chocolate. Goats? Wow. He looked up and then shot a quick glance in her direction. So you must have sold your place in Temple. I did, she said, moving on to shakier ground now, but going with it. I used the money to buy that tiny house and the truck. It sure has been nice to be able to set up my own place when I'm out in hill country. How many ranches are you doing this summer? Well, let's see. She drew in a big breath and exhaled heavily. Nine, and Levi's stable. Levi's stable, is that right? You must spend days there. He can do it all himself, she said. He just likes to see my pretty face. Robin laughed, glad her melancholy mood has evaporated under this pristine summer sky. At least that's what he always says. Shane stared at her and Robin grinned at him. Oh, come on. He's teasing. I know he's married. She slipped her hand through Shane's arm, the craving for the human touch too strong to resist. Or maybe she just wanted to touch him. Either way, he stiffened for a step and then relaxed. He may have even pulled her closer. It was hard to tell with the uneven ground and the way their steps didn't match up. The sound of chatter and laughter lifted above the barn that stood between them and the picnic. Shane slowed to a stop and faced Robin. Well, some of us aren't teasing when we say we're glad to see your pretty face. Shock lashed her insides, especially when Shane didn't wait for her to say anything. He simply eased his arm away from her hand and left her standing in the shade of the barn. So he still liked her. She could still hear him whisper, You're the most beautiful woman I've ever met, in that husky Texan voice of his. He told her that after he'd asked her out three times, and she'd refused him three times. She still hadn't gone out with him, and he'd stopped asking after that. He'd avoided eye contact for the rest of her time at Grapeseed Ranch, and when she'd come back the next two years, he'd been sure to get himself assigned somewhere far from her. She'd hardly seen him at all last year. But this year... This year he was overseeing her job here. Robin's pulse thundered like a herd of wild horses. Why was he doing that? Had he volunteered? 
or had he simply drawn this short stick? You coming? He called from somewhere along the side of the barn, and Robin kicked herself into gear. She'd always enjoyed coming to Grape Seed Ranch, and the sight of the two dozen cowboys lounging at several picnic tables with the American flag waving overhead was a big reason why. Someone said, Hey, Robin's here, and several of the boys got up to greet her. Robin lost sight of Shane and all the hugging and handshaking that ensued. But his magnetism pulled, pulled, pulled at her until she loaded her plate and needed to find somewhere to sit. And day of her feet didn't take her over to the table where Shane sat backward on the bench, flanked by both of his brothers. Is this seat taken? she asked, indicating the mostly empty opposite side of the table. A couple of paper plates sat there, obviously used but without owners. Chad was there, Austin said, springing into action to collect the dirty plates. But his phone rang. He probably won't be back. No? Robin set her plate down and swung her leg over the bench. Gabe sat down at the other end of the table, facing Dylan. She smiled at both of them and tried not to notice that Shane hadn't even twitched toward her. Nope, Austin said. That was his girlfriend's ring, and he seemed pretty happy she'd called. Oh, who's he dating? Robin asked. Austin told her, but Robin didn't know the woman. Conversation with Gabe and Dylan was easy, and she laughed, undid her hair and pulled it back again, and generally enjoyed herself. Shane didn't look at her once, didn't talk to her, just observed the picnic as if she weren't even there, as if he hadn't just told her she was pretty, as if they hadn't linked arms on the way over. Duane stood about an hour later and made a short speech about how grateful he was that everyone had worked so hard this summer. Then he said, Time to get back to work. Kurt's got afternoon assignments. Cowboys picked up their trash and put it in the garbage cans. Robin joined them and then said to Austin, Well, I have to go get some groceries so I don't starve. Good to see you, Miss Robin. He grinned at her, elbowed Shane, and said, Wasn't it good to see Miss Robin? Shane glared at him, a heated harsh look that probably could have melted steel. Then he switched his eyes to hers for less than a heartbeat. Yeah, great to see you, Miss Robin. He deadpanned before stepping away. Robin's lungs stung, like she'd inhaled popping candy and they were sparking inside. Unable to speak, she lifted her hand in a farewell gesture and turned away from the crowd of men. One step after the other got her emotions back in control and gave her the distance she needed from Shane. Her phone buzzed in her front pocket and she took it out when her feet met the flat ground of the road. Her heart tripped over itself and she almost snagged her feet against the ground too, when she saw Shane Royal blip down from the top of the screen. I meant to set up a meeting with you. When's good for you? Tomorrow, she thumbed out and sent. Seven o'clock too early? Of course, he'd be up at the crack of dawn. To be fair, dawn was more like five o'clock this late in June. Seven's fine, she said, sending the message and sneaking a peek back toward the festivities. Shane stood facing her, his head bent down as he looked at his phone. He lifted his head and their eyes caught. Even across this distance, even though he's just ignored her for a solid hour, something charged and wonderful flowed between them. She lifted her hand in acknowledgement, and he did too. Then she ducked her head and got the heck out of there. Seven o'clock the next morning came much too quickly. Robin had paced the twenty-four length of her tiny house for an hour last night, causing quite a bit of distress for poor Misfit. Eventually, she'd scooped the Yorkie into her arms and tried reasoning things out with the canine. But she hadn't been able to come up with an explanation that didn't sound selfish and demeaning. You know, horseshoeing school's not cheap. That one was a cop-out, even if it was true. She'd spent thousands at the best school in Oklahoma, living on site and learning from the best farriers in the country. It came at a price, and though she'd been working in Hill Country for seven years now, she still had debt from her training she needed to repay. My house is too small for a husband. That excuse was pathetic. She hadn't even been out on a single date with Shane, and she'd already graduated him to husband status. She shook her head as she left her house behind and started toward the barns. Yesterday he'd said he'd meet her in barn too, so she was headed there. I'm just not looking to date. That one was the most true. Robin craved her independence above most things. She'd never seen the need or use of a man in her life, as her mother had raised her alone. Her mother had taught her to cook, clean, 
So, change a flat tire, repair the engine and the lawnmower when it went out, fix fences and anything else that needed doing. Robin had never known her father, and she'd never wanted to. She was just fine on her own, thank you very much, just like her mother. And yet... Yet something seethed beneath her skin, too. Something that wanted her to have someone to cuddle with on her couch tucked behind the stairs. Something that wanted someone to hold hands with and hug when she felt sad and look forward to seeing after a problematic horse had kicked her. But nothing in her life was conducive to such a relationship. Robin had actually made sure of that. No roots, no permanent address, nothing to tie her down or hold her back. Not anymore. Hey, Shane's voice interrupted her thoughts and startling her into spinning toward him. It's just me. He didn't smile or move toward her, but kept a ten-foot distance between them. Sorry, I was thinking about something. Hopefully which horse you want while you're here. He stepped then, but not toward her, toward the stables lining both sides of the barn. Duane said you could have any of them you want. He paused outside a stable labeled with the name Mandarin. Except Mandarin. She's mine. He clicked his tongue at the bright orange bay horse, and she nudged his palm with her nose. She's beautiful, Robin said, taking a chance and joining Shane at his side. How long have you had her? Just over two years now, he said. Levi bought her from a ranch in Northern California where they were closing their doors. I saw her at his stable and fell in love with her. Robin hadn't heard Shane string together so many words in such a long time. She relaxed into the stable door. How old is she? The horse didn't seem interested in anyone but Shane, and Robin felt a special kinship with the animal. Six or seven, we think. He inhaled and added, Okay, so who do you want? Is Midnight available? Shane laughed, the sound ricocheting around the barn. I should have known. You love that stupid horse. He's not stupid. He's literally the only horse on this ranch that could get lost if you took him too far from the homestead. Shane chuckled again, his hand still on Mandarin's black mane. Robin shifted her shoulders and lifted her chin. He would never allow me to get lost. Oh, you think you're the Midnight Whisperer, is that it? He leaned his hip into the stall door facing her, the sexiest sight Robin had seen on a ranch in a long, long time. Why wasn't she interested in dating him again? Her mind went blank, and she was pretty dang sure that if he asked her to dinner right now, she'd blurt, How about lunch instead? He quieted, and the moment sobered between them. Robin wasn't sure if he'd asked her a question she was meant to answer or not. All she knew was that she couldn't look away from him. As if they existed underwater, his hand lilted toward her, moving in a slow motion as it tucked a strand of hair behind her ear. Fire blazed in the skin cells he touched and it took everything Robin had not to sigh and lean further into his touch. She blinked. Shane cleared his throat. He said, I'll get the horse's saddle to meet you outside, before he practically ran down to the tack room. Robin, still stuck in some sort of freaky slow-motion capsule, turned toward him, wondering how much longer she could deny the flame of attraction between them. Chapter 5 Shane cursed himself in his stupid wandering hands as he collected saddles and horse blankets. He muttered to Midnight about being nice to the pretty woman who was going to ride him, but apparently Robin and Midnight had a special bond. Shane wanted a special bond with her too, and if the altercation that had just happened outside Mandarin's stall was any indication, he could probably have it. If she'd let him. If she'd just say yes, just once. But you're not asking he murmured as he led Midnight down the aisle toward Mandarin. Robin had disappeared by the time he'd come out of the tack room, and Shane had been half relieved and half disappointed. Simply sitting at a picnic table with her had been the perfect kind of torture, listening to that sweet voice of her as she teased and talked with his brothers and Gabe, watching her run her fingers through her hair as she gathered it into a ponytail. Definitely sweet, sweet torture. He hadn't been able to say anything to her, Number one, he was sure Dylan would notice the hitch in his voice. Out of all the cowboys at the ranch, only he knew of Shane's agony the last time he'd tried to get to know Robin better. Dylan had tried to talk to Shane about it last night, but Shane hadn't wanted any part of that. He'd showered and then gone straight to bed to avoid the conversation. 
which was silly, really, because with cell phones, conversations couldn't really be avoided. Not like they used to, at least. All right, girl. He set to work saddling Mandarin, and then he led both horses outside. Robin waited with one booted foot on the bottom rung of the training circle, where she watched Felicity work with a horse named Featherstone. You ready? He asked, and she turned toward him. Her ocean blue eyes sucked at his resolve to keep his dinner invitations to himself, but he caught the words before they sounded in his throat. Where are we going today? We've got two dozen horses out in the north pastures, he said. Dwayne wants them rounded up and down here so you can take a look at all of them at once. He handed her midnight's reins. Your horse. She immediately started whispering to the animal, a playful, flirty glint in her eye. He says you've been talking about me. Yeah, telling him what a pain you are, he said. Told him all about how you hit me with your house, broke my nose, and then stunk the place up. He grinned though the smile faded from her face. He says he's still willing to let you ride him, though. Is that so? I can't help what he tells me. Shane swung onto Mandarin's back and watched Robin do the same on midnight, easily, like water flowing over the top of a bucket. Like she did it every day, and of course she did, and Shane really liked that she did. He gave his head a little shake and set Mandarin moving. North pasture, he repeated, his voice more businesslike now. It's a couple of hours' ride. Sounds good, she said, bringing Midnight up beside him in Mandarin. Plenty of time for you to tell me what you've been up to for the past few years. He cut her a look out of the corner of his eye. Same old, same old, he said. I didn't see you much around the ranch the last two times I've been out. Really? She wanted to talk about why he'd made himself scarce. Heck, last year he left the ranch completely and gone to work on Sunshine Farms, several miles outside of town. They needed a temp, and Duane had given permission. So it happened to be during Robin's week at Grape Seed Ranch. No one needed to know she was the reason he'd left, and no one did, except maybe Dylan, who had been perceptive enough to notice the coincidence. Been busy, he chose to say, which was absolutely true, so at least he wasn't lying. What about you? All kinds of changes in your life. Not really, she said. He swung his head toward her, the dark cowgirl hat she wore protecting her from the sun and shading her expression from him. Robin, even your hair is a different color. She looked at him then, and he found the vulnerability in her eyes, the desire, too. Maybe he could just... No, he told himself. You are not making the first move. Robin had already done that when she linked her hand through his arm yesterday, his skin burning you as if she'd just touched him again, and his muscles twitched in anticipation of the next time they'd be able to experience her skin against his. He managed to keep a tight grip on the reins so she wouldn't notice his tremor. I guess I sort of started over, she said, her tone raw and real. Selling my place and really getting away from everything in Temple that was holding me back. What kind of things? he asked. She sighed, only adding the notes of her emotion to the symphony the breeze made in the tall grass. An old ex-boyfriend I couldn't get away from any other way. Whatever Shane had been expecting her to say, that wasn't it. Nor did he tell himself to say, So you do go out with men. The breeze died, leaving only a strained silence and the steady clomping of horse hooves between them. Finally, Robin said, I did, yes. Did, past tense. Shane. It's fine, he said quickly. Not my business. I don't care. But he did care and now his mind spun with all kinds of new possibilities. Possibilities that included him and Robin sharing a meal together, the possibility of walking down Main Street together, their hands entwined, maybe even possibly kissing her in that tiny little house. He turned the fantasies off, wishing the white-hot spark between them was just as easily quenched. He'd learned fifteen years ago when his father had walked out on his mother, the sons, and the ranch that he couldn't control someone, couldn't change his situation just because he didn't like it. Shane had prayed and prayed that his dad would come home, that the bankruptcy on the ranch where he'd grown up and expected to inherit wouldn't be real, that his mother wouldn't have to sell everything she owned just to move into a one-bedroom condo in San Antonio. But none of his prayers changed anything. His dad hadn't come home. The ranch was bankrupt and deep in debt, and his mother and Shane had lost everything. 
Still, his foolish heart and gentle soul couldn't help praying again. Please let me say the right things this time. I'll go slow. I'll do anything she needs. What does she need? No answers came, and Shane's curiosity burned in the back of his throat. Want to tell me what happened with the ex-boyfriend? Maybe if he knew, he could assure her that he wasn't anything like the other guy who'd broken her heart, made her sell her house, and declare of a life where she didn't want to be tied down. Can I get a rain check on that? She asked, just as the wind whipped up. The sun disappeared behind a cloud, and Shane peered into the sky. Dark clouds seemed to multiply before his eyes. Did you check the weather for today? He asked. No. Me either, he said. Summers in Texas were usually the same, hot and long. Though an occasional thunderstorm was known to roll through, he hadn't even thought to check the weather. The clouds moved fast, and Shane checked his location on the ranch. There's a cabin about twenty minutes from here, he said. Let's go there. There's a lean-to for the horses. She hadn't even had time to nod or agree when the first raindrops landed on his arms. Ho! Oh. He urged Midnight to pick up his trot, and then he got the horse loping, changing course from the north pastures in favor of the northwest sector cabin the cowboys used when harvesting. Rain soaked his t-shirt and jeans. He couldn't see much, but Mandarin seemed to know where she needed to go. The steady gallop of Midnight just to his right flank was comforting, and he yelled, There it is, as the cabin came into view. He swung off Mandarin's back almost before the horse had stopped. He had her saddle and fittings off in only a few swipes, saying, I'll take care of them. You go in, as Robin and Midnight joined them in the lean-to. I can help. Robin stayed to unsaddle her own horse, leaving on the bridle so they could loop it around the rail in the lean-to. Closed in on three sides, the horses should be okay. Pattering on the roof meant the rain had turned into hail, and Shane met Robin's eyes. Adrenaline spiked through him, and he couldn't help the smile that curved his lips as he watched water drip from the brim of her hat. This is not funny, she said, swatting at his bicep. He easily dodged her. No, but it's kind of exciting. Easily the most exciting thing that had happened to Shane on this ranch. The fact that he got to experience his adventure with Robin was like icing on the best birthday cake in the world. He ducked his head and put one hand on his soaking wet hat as he dashed out of the lean-to, through the hail and into the cabin. Robin followed hot on his heels, and he slammed the weather out of the structure and sealed himself in with the woman of his dreams. Chapter 6 The smell of rain and wet weather and wood filled the whole cabin, and Robin liked it. It was the smell of Shane, and Robin drew in a deep noseful of it. She scanned the cabin so she wouldn't have to face him head on. A large circular table filled one-third of the cabin in front of the long kitchen counter with a sink, a fridge, and lots of cupboards. She hoped there was food in this cabin, as the sky continued to darken. The idea of food seemed remote, though. This cabin was used for sleeping when the boys came out for a single evening, not big picnics. They probably brought their own food, sleeping bags, and other supplies. After all, she only saw one doorway, and through that, a bathroom. Several folded cots leaned against the wall, and Robin was glad there were at least places to sit and lie down. She finally had nowhere to look but at Shane, who still stood near the door. He'd taken his cowboy hat off and already run his wet hands through his hair. The resulting look took Robin's breath away, and she couldn't help staring as he moved into the kitchen and started opening cupboards. I'm sure we have some towels around here somewhere. He found them in the next cabinet and turned triumphantly. Aha, uh -huh, here they are. He produced a handful of dish towels and handed her a couple before wiping his face with one towel and tussling his hair with another. To distract herself from the gorgeous cowboy she definitely wasn't interested in, Robin turned away and toweled her own hair. So, she sighed, what do you guys do out here for fun? Fun? Shane came up beside her. I don't know what kind of cattle ranches you've been on, Robin, but we work on this one. So you never have fun? She peered up at him and began to drown in his eyes, which weren't quite so icy at this moment. We know how to have fun, he said. She nudged him with her hip. So what do you guys do? A readiness crept into his neck and up into his face. There's probably some card games or a puzzle in one of those cupboards. But neither one of them moved to retrieve them. Shane settled on his back foot, putting extra distance between them. 
His eyes stormed with emotions she couldn't quite decipher. What was that? His eyes slipped down her body to her boots before traveling back to her eyes. What was what? His jaw twitched, and Robin had no problem identifying the anger in his eyes now. Robin, I'm not. I mean, I am, but... He blew out a breath, glared at her, and turned away. He opened a cupboard and stared into it, though Robin could clearly see it held nothing at all. Robin's heart rammed into a ribcage, and she ran her hand through her hair. She took slow steps over to where Shane stood at the counter. He leaned both hands into it, his stature strong and screaming with frustration. Shane, I... Robin looked at his powerful hands, and she wanted to hold one of them. She ran one fingertip along the side of his pinky. He flinched, but didn't pull away. I don't want to hurt you, she said. Maybe stop flirting with me then, he said through clenched teeth. Thunder crashed outside the cabin, and rain and hail whipped against the glass in the windows. Robin felt the same storm in her chest. Thoughts ran through her mind, and she was so tired. She'd been at Grapeseed Ranch for less than 24 hours, and she'd never survive this close to Shane if she couldn't hold his hand, laugh with him, and learn more about him. Help me, she prayed, and the racing thoughts quieted. Maybe I like flirting with you. She tucked her arm through his and leaned into him. Maybe you'd like to take me to dinner if we get back to the ranch tonight. Shane glanced down at her. She could practically see the wheels in his head spinning. We're getting back to the ranch tonight, he said, his voice more growly than she'd like. Her heartbeat wouldn't calm down, though Shane hadn't pulled away. I'm interested in you, she blurted out. Okay, happy now? Shane leaned away again, staring openly at her now. I'm sorry, I must not have heard you right. Robin bumped him again. You heard me. A slow smile curved his mouth. Dinner would be great. She swallowed back her nerves, tore her eyes from Shane's, and looked into the cupboard. Okay. Her voice sounded a bit squeaky. Okay, then, let's find a game and wait out this storm. Shane swallowed, too, and though the storm raged around them, Robin felt perfectly calm as she searched through the cabinets until she found a stack of games. She spun back to Shane, gleeful she held up a deck of cards. He leaned against the table, his cowboy hat back in place. He'd folded his arms and crossed his ankles, that smile still in place. You know how to play hearts? Who doesn't know how to play hearts? She closed the distance between them and slapped the cards against his chest. And I hope you know how to lose, because I'm aces when it comes to playing hearts. We'll see. Shane kicked a chair out from under the table and slid into it, shuffling cards like a Vegas pro a moment later. Robin giggled and sat a couple of seats over from Shane, though she wanted to sit right next to him and cuddle in close. He started dealing and he stuffed his hat lower over his eyes as he lifted his cards and started arranging them. By the time the rain stopped, the clock had ticked halfway through the afternoon. Robin had been right in her assessment that the cabin was foodless, and her stomach was not happy about it. Do you still want to go to dinner? Shane asked as the first outbuildings of the ranch came into view. Kurt will just let us go. He didn't look at her but kept his nose on the track toward the stables. It's three o'clock. And I haven't eaten since 6.30, he said. I'm starving, so if you don't want to go, it's fine. I'll just make something at my cabin. Robin glanced over at him. What would you make at your cabin? I don't know, scrambled eggs or something. And where would Austin and Dylan be while you made scrambled eggs? Working, I'm sure. Shane finally looked at her. You want to come to my place for dinner? She shrugged with one shoulder. I have a Texas State-shaped waffle maker. I could bring that over, and we'll make breakfast for dinner. We have chicken in the freezer, so I could make chicken and waffles, they said together, and Robin's stomach practically clawed at itself. She hadn't had the tasty treat in far too long, mostly because she avoided cooking poultry if at all possible. She always ended up with smoke or fire or completely undercooked meat. But she could make waffles, and she had maple syrup in her pantry. So I'll do the waffles and you do the chicken, she said, hoping he'd simply agree. All right. He tossed her a smile. Fried chicken is one of about four things I can make. 
What else can you cook? She asked. Eggs, obviously. He waved at the wet grasses. And fried chicken and oatmeal. But I really just put that in the microwave. He chuckled. We make a lot of sandwiches and pour a lot of bowls of cereal. What kind of cereal? Austin's favorite is Cocoa Krispies. I like the non-sugary cereals, like Crispix and Chex and stuff like that. Dylan wants Cinnamon Toast Crunch and Cookie Crisp. My favorite is Lucky Charms. With the freeze-dried marshmallows. He chuckled and shook his head. Those are not okay to consume, just so you know. She tipped her head back and laughed, so glad she had the courage to get out of her own way and tell Shane she was interested in him. So, do you cook more than waffles in that tiny kitchen of yours? Sometimes, she said. My mom taught me to make pancakes, French toast, chicken noodle soup, spaghetti, that kind of stuff. Well, Austin's favorite meal on the planet is spaghetti and meatballs. He slid her a sly look. And his birthday's coming up in only a few weeks. You'll still be here. Ramen almost fell off midnight's back. In the hours they'd spent together at the cabin, laughing and talking and playing cards, Robin had never once thought that she'd only be in Shane's neck of the woods for five weeks, but she'd only be in the Grape Seed Falls area for five weeks, plain and simple. She had a schedule to keep, and her next area was over by Austin, with seven ranches that had contracted her services. What would she do then? Drive over to see Shane on the weekends. She didn't even have weekends off. So, maybe a half an hour. Shane leapt from Mandarin's back while Robin realized they'd arrived back at the stable. There you are. Kirk came out of the stable and reached for Midnight's reins. I'll take them. You guys go get something to eat. Robin barely had time to jump down before Kirk took both horses into the stable. See? Shane grinned at her, shuffling one step forward and then falling back. So, thirty minutes. I'll shower real quick and get the chicken thawed. Robin nodded because she didn't want to call things off with Shane before they'd even had a chance to start. But as she walked over to her house, she couldn't help wondering if she'd made a mistake, a mistake that would ultimately hurt Shane again. Chapter 7 Shane showered as fast as lightning struck and took extra minutes to shave, brush his teeth, and maybe even splash on an extra bit of cologne. Robin's words, I'm interested in you, had been screaming in his mind for hours. He pulled the chicken from the microwave and found it mostly thawed. So he got the cast iron skillet on the stove and poured vegetable oil in it. He put together flour, salt, pepper, and a pinch of cayenne before mixing up eggs and a splash of milk. A knock came on the door, and he practically dumped the dredge on the floor when he jumped. He'd wanted to confirm with Kurt that his younger brothers would be kept working, but he didn't want to explain why, so he'd said nothing. And they would knock anyway. They'd probably come in during dinner, too, and he couldn't do anything about that. He pulled open the door to the flirty, fun sight of Robin standing on his front porch. Hey there. He leaned against the door jamb and drank in her wavy blonde hair, that cute smattering of freckles across her cheeks, and the pink sundress that made his throat dry. Hey, yourself. She tipped up on her toes and swept her lips across his cheek. He froze his lungs seemingly encased in ice. The scent of powder and flowers stuck in his nose as Robin swept past him and into the cabin, all the while holding a white appliance under her arm. He finally turned, looking at her and then back to the empty porch with another cabin across the lane. He couldn't believe she'd come here to meet him, to eat with him, to spend time with him, and... His hand drifted to where her lips had touched, kissed him. After managing to get the door closed... He ran his hand down his thighs and tried to fill his lungs with a confident breath of air. This was Robin Cook, the woman who'd starred in his dreams for three years. Slow down, cowboy, he told himself. Just because they'd shared an amazing day, stuck in a remote cabin playing cards and talking and laughing, didn't mean they were together. So she'd admitted she was interested in him. She'd probably only said that because he'd been so obvious about his perpetual interest in her but he had zero interest in having his heart stomped on again, and Robin was only going to be here for five weeks. His hopes swooped to the ceiling and then crashed to the floor along with his heart. She was only going to be here for five weeks. Five weeks. So whatever had prompted him to put on that extra cologne was completely ridiculous. Whatever she'd said as Hale pummeled the roof on that remote cabin didn't matter. 
Time couldn't be stopped, just like Robin's spirit couldn't be lassoed. So this just had to be chicken and waffles, dinner, something to eat because they'd been both forced to skip lunch. Robin was busy plugging in her waffle maker, and then she looked up at him. So, I actually make waffles from a box mix. She shook the pancake mix. Do you have a bowl? He could be nice during the five weeks, so he said, Yeah, I have a bowl. He pulled out the drawers in the cabinet next to the sink and produced a mixing bowl for her. It probably hadn't been used in a while, but it looked clean enough. She moved around his kitchen like she'd cooked there a dozen times before, and Shane sort of stood back and watched as she cracked eggs and added milk to her powdered pancake mix. She finally turned to him and put her hands on her hips. What? What? Nothing. He looked down at the seasoned flour he'd made as if it were an alien substance, and he had no idea what to do with it. The stove made a cracking sound, and he remembered he'd turned on the flame under the cast iron skillet. You were staring at me, Robin teased, her voice set on high flirt. And I need a whisk. He opened a drawer filled with larger kitchen utensils and half turned away from her. I wasn't staring. Where to? She whisk, whisk, whisked her batter together while he cracked eggs and salted them too. I was actually surprised you came, he said. That's all. The whisking stuttered and stalled. Shane, of course I came. He picked up a piece of chicken and dipped it in the egg mixture. So I guess I'm just wondering what changed your mind. Besides three years going by. So I wasn't mature enough for you. Is that what you were saying? Maybe his voice had a heavy dose of flirtation in it, too. She giggled and he reveled in the sound of it. No, you've always been mature enough. Shane wanted to ask, then what? But he suspected he already knew. And it had everything to do with the tiny house and big truck she'd brought to the ranch with her. Still looking for your roots? He asked, his voice set on serious and now much softer than before. Yeah. She nodded, her attention on the batter singular. Something like that. The waffle iron beeped that it had reached the right temperature just as Shane put the first chicken strip in the hot oil. Should I go ahead and start these? She asked. Yeah, I'll put the oven on warm and we can stick them in there. He twisted the oven dial and enjoyed the happy sizzling sound of frying chicken. He warmed the maple syrup in the microwave and set the plate of butter on the island where she worked the waffle iron. Ten minutes later... Shane had a waffle with more butter than any human she consume in one sitting melting in the squares, and four chicken strips atop that. He poured hot maple syrup over everything inside. Ah, chicken and waffles. One of my favorite meals. Because your mom used to make it. Robin looked up at him, and he realized she'd put makeup on. He blinked at her, not quite sure what he was more surprised about, the makeup or her recall of the obscure fact he'd shared with her three years ago. Yeah for my birthday every year. Shane took his plate to the small dining room table the brothers used every night. Shane had said that if they were going to live together and be a family, they might as well eat together too. Did it matter if he served grilled cheese sandwiches three times a week and Austin sliced apples? No, it didn't. He eyed the two extra plates he'd gotten down and settled at the table with Robin right across from him. Do you mind if I say grace? He watched her for a reaction. Watch the surprise roll across her face in a single wave. No, go ahead. She bowed her head and Shane said a simple prayer over his brothers and Robin and the food. He said, Amen, and made to put his hat back on as quickly as possible. Robin's touch stopped him, and he skated his eyes from the point of contact up her arm into her face. His heart pumped and jumped, and his fantasy started without any prompting from him. That was nice. She said sincerely, Thank you. She withdrew her fingers from his, and he stuffed his hat on his head. This simple meal of chicken and waffles feeling very much like a date. Except he wouldn't prey on a date, and he wouldn't have made his own food, and his two loud, rowdy brothers wouldn't have exploded through the front door moments later. They froze as fast as they entered. Oh, uh, Dylan started, but Austin practically flew into the kitchen. Is this chicken and waffles? He looked at Shane hopefully. For us? Sure, Shane said. There's plenty for you. Miss Robin's waffles are in the oven. Dylan closed the front door to seal out the heat, and he approached the scene in the dining room with more tact. Heard you two got stuck in the hailstorm. Sure did. 
Shane said at the same time Robin said, Only for a few minutes. Shane met her eyes and smiled at the same time she did. We made it to the cabin in Sector 7, he said. Spent most of the day there. We can take this over to Kurtz, Dylan said, taking a step away from the table. You don't need to do that, Shane said quietly. The words still sounded like a shout, even over Austin's enthusiastic buttering of his waffle. It's fine. There's room here. He shifted and cut a glance at Robin. Right, Robin? She didn't look away from him as she said, Right, of course, with pure electricity arcing from her to him. Shane felt buzzed by it, and the evening had just begun. After we eat, maybe you guys can come look at my house. Shane narrowed his eyes. What's wrong with your house? I think the hail must have been bigger here or something. My roof's leaking. And she was just now mentioning it. Shane gave her some credit for that and nodded. Sure, I can come look at it. Oh, we can't, Dylan said in a super fake tone. Austin and I promised May we'd come help her with the nursery. We did? Austin asked as he practically dropped his plate on the table between Shane and Robin. I don't want to. Yeah, remember? Dylan practically yelled. She needed help hanging letters. I said we'd come tonight. It shouldn't take long, but you know May. He added a loud laugh that made Shane roll his eyes. But Robin joined in laughing with him, only increasing when Austin looked at her and then Dylan, and finally Shane. What am I missing? He asked, and Shane just shrugged and tried not to inhale his dinner. Chapter 8 Robin enjoyed dinner with Shane and his brothers. The cluelessness of Austin was just too fun, and Shane seemed to enjoy his role of oldest brother with them both. He kept the calm facade in place and reminded Dylan and Austin not to stay too long at May's before they left the cabin together. Well, we got a few minutes together, he said. It's fine, she assured him. They're great. I like them. They are great. Shane kept his eyes on the ground, and Robin resisted the urge to slip her hand into his. After all, he had to live here with all the other cowboys, and she didn't want to cause any problems for him. You go quiet around them she said. Do I? You did tonight. Just tired. We sat around all day. She giggled, sucking back the sound when his warm, wonderful fingers touched hers. On the next step, he latched onto her hand properly and tugged her a little closer. She noticed that they'd left the cabins behind now, and it would be hard for someone to see them as they walked alongside of the hay barn. Sometimes sitting is as hard as working, he said. It's like church. Robin had been touched by his concern for her, and for his brothers. So, I don't go to church much. Yeah, me either. No? When I can, he said. But May and Kurt like to go every week, and since I'm the backup foreman. Co-foreman, she said. Shane smiled, his blue eyes practically dancing with her correction. I usually let them go when I stay here. It's quiet on Sunday mornings out here. It's nice. I've always liked a big open sky with room to think, she said. She didn't understand how people lived in cities, shared walls with neighbors, or went home to the same house day after day, week after week, year after year. Her mother had said she had a gypsy soul just like her father, and she'd better find something that would satisfy her craving to always try something new, be on the go. Seeing as how Robin had never met her father, she didn't like being compared to him much, but she did have a seething need to be free to go where she wanted, when she wanted. At the same time, Shane had spoken true in his cabin. She was still looking for her roots, and she didn't know how to put them down without knowing where she should plant them. She'd settle on Texas, and that alone had taken her a while. She bought a house in Temple, but she hated going home to it. I lost you, Shane said. Tell me what you're thinking. Without giving herself time to censor anything, Robin said, I'm thinking about how much I love my tiny house. Oh yeah? Why's that? because I can take it anywhere with me. No roots, he murmured, and when he lifted his chin, he blew out a long breath. So, you're headed over to Levi's on Monday, is that right? Yes. Confusion scrolled through her at the rapid change in conversation. No roots rang through her mind, but she didn't repeat it and didn't question him about it. I'll be there for a few days. All week, I think the schedule said. If that's what the schedule said... Robin hadn't looked at it yet. 
Tomorrow was Sunday, and she'd spent the morning catching up on her sleep and the afternoon planning her week. As much as she didn't like being tied down, she liked being laid or behind even less. They approached the storage shed, and Shane dropped her hand as someone came down the front steps of the homestead. Shane, I need to talk to you for a minute. Dwayne nodded his hat at her. Hey, Miss Robin, sorry about the hail this morning. You seem okay. I'm fine. She gave him her best smile so he'd know she was telling the truth. I think my house has a tiny leak in the roof, and Shane said he'd help me with it. Her hand felt naked without Shane's to anchor her, and she slipped it into her pocket so no one could see how it twitched. Can I steal him for a few minutes, fifteen cops? As Shane was already walking toward his boss, Robin didn't see how she had a choice. She said, sure thing, and continued on her way around the shed. She'd been in a hurry earlier, so she hadn't had time to examine the roof or anything. But when she opened the front door, a new puddle sat in the same spot on the second stair leading up to her loft. She definitely had a leak. Misfit yipped and Robin scooped her off the floor. Hey, girl, were you scared this morning? I'm sure you were. She held the dog under one arm while she bent to grab her water bowl. Let's get dinner, should we? Are you hungry? The dog didn't answer. She never did. But Robin continued talking to her as she scooped new food into her bowl and wiped up the spilled water before setting down that bowl, too. So, I told Shane I'm interested. Robin used a towel to clean up the puddle on the stairs and then set a juice pitcher there so her wood wouldn't warp. I don't even know what that means. She sighed as she sat next to the pitcher and watched her little dog lap up tonguefuls of water. Does it mean I like him? Or I find him interesting and maybe I'll like him if I get to know him. Misfit threw her a look that said, How should I know? and started eating. Robin rested her elbows on her knees, her mind racing with thoughts. She wasn't sure how long she sat there, thinking about Shane, before she realized Misfit had finished eating and the little dog was now curled up at Robin's feet, snoozing. And Shane still hadn't come over from the homestead. She stood, intending to wait outside on her rocking camp chair, when her phone bleeped. Shane, I can't come right now, he texted. Rain check for tomorrow afternoon. She frowned at her phone, wanting more of an explanation. Or maybe you just want to spend more time with him. She muttered as she thumbed out a friendly, no problem, and sent it. So Robin sat on her front porch in her favorite spot with her dog on her lap and rocked. Something about the action calmed her, allowed her to see things clearly and come to decisions more easily. Tonight, she'd rocked forward and back three times before she blurted, I definitely like Shane Royal. And this time, the admission made her lean her head back and smile. Three years ago, it had scared her senseless. He'd asked what had changed, and Robin hadn't been able to answer him. But as she rocked, she knew. She had changed. Monday morning found her walking down the aisle on Levi Rhodes' premier boarding stable. This place is nicer than my house and temple, Robin murmured as she took in the spotless floors, the solid wood walls, the numerous stalls. Each one held a horse she'd be attending to this week. The office sat way down at the end of one of the stable buildings, and when she knocked on the closed door, a woman called. Come on in. Surprise and curiosity pulled through her. Levi had never used an office manager, but Robin supposed a lot could have changed in the years since she'd been here. Heather? The brunette sitting behind Levi's desk was definitely Dwayne's sister, and someone Robin considered a true friend. Robin! Heather beamed as she stood and came around the desk. She laughed when she hugged Robin, and Robin imagined that if she had a sister, it would feel like hugging Heather. I heard you were back in town. Robin pointed to the desk calendar. I'm sure that told you, too. My brother told me. Heather perched on the edge of the desk and grinned at her. Surprised to see me here. Of course not. I came to the wedding. Robin glanced around the office, which definitely bore a hint of Heather's feminine hand with the new curtains and the dozens of pictures she'd taped to the walls and cabinets. How's Ellie doing? One more year of high school, Heather said. She wants to go to New York and model. I'm sure you can imagine what Levi says about that. Robin had barely drawn her breath to respond when Levi said, Hey, I'm nothing but supportive of my sister's crazy dreams. To her face, Robin cocked a right eyebrow at him. That's all that matters. He edged into the office, too, and Robin shifted to her right as he looked at her. Hey, Miss Robin, good to see you. He gave her a quick side hug and then kissed Heather fully on the mouth. Hmm, good to see you, too, Mrs. Rhodes. 
She giggled like a giddy schoolgirl and swatted at his biceps. Behave yourself. We're not alone. Embarrassment heated Robin's face, and she cleared her throat as Heather continued to gaze up at Levi like they were indeed very much alone. At the same time, she couldn't tear her eyes away from the two of them, so obviously in love with each other. Robin couldn't remember her mother dating anyone, ever. She'd always say, I have you, Robin. I don't need anyone else. She'd never gone on a date, never brought anyone home. It was always just Robin and her mom. Robin had the sudden urge to talk to her mother. Excuse me, she said, and made a quick exit before any more kissing happened. She stepped past the tap room and outside, her fingers tapping to make the call. Robin, sweetie, how are you? How's Hill Country? Her mom sounded upbeat and positive, same as always. She never answered the phone with hello, and she always asked how Hill Country was. Beautiful, Robin said, completing the conversation about Texas. Her mom hadn't tried to get her to stay in Georgia, hadn't questioned her decision to sell her home in Temple, hadn't said a word about horseshoeing school in Oklahoma. No, Robin's mother had been nothing but a support for all Robin's 32 years of life. What's going on, then? The Georgian accent made Robin smile as it wrapped her in warmth. Just thinking about you, Ma. How long until you retire? Sixty-eight days, she said instantly. She laughed. Not that I'm counting down. Robin guffawed. No, of course not. She sobered quickly, the question she wanted to ask teeming against the tip of her tongue. Mom, how come you never dated while I was growing up? Silence came through the line, and Robin didn't like it. She had an open relationship with her mother and always had. Whatever Robin asked, her mother had answered. Until now. Mom? I guess I didn't want to make life more complicated, she said, for you or for me. Robin nodded, though her mother couldn't see that. I had you, honey, and I needed to figure out how to make things work for us. I never needed a man. Robin had heard that before. You don't need a man, Robin. You want to do something? Go do it. Robin had never wondered about her father. Her mother had always been enough. She never asked about her father, either. Her mom had told her since she was old enough to talk that he'd left when he found out her mom was pregnant. They weren't married, and he didn't want to be a father. But I wanted to be a mother, she'd said, and you're the best daughter I could have ever hoped for. Robin had heard that a lot, too. She believed her mom. She'd never needed a man. Until Kevin... Her heart twisted painfully in her chest, and she turned away from the pastures dotted with horses. I just wanted to hear your voice, she said, her own straining along the edges. Have you met someone, Robin? Her mother spoke slowly with care, and Robin pressed her eyes closed. I don't want to get hurt, she whispered. Not all men are like your father, she said, or like Kevin. What's this man's name? Shane, Robin said without any direction from her brain. The same Shane you mentioned a while ago. Robin opened her eyes. When did I mention him? I don't know. A few years ago, maybe. Robin didn't remember talking to her mom about Shane, but anything was possible. The door behind her opened, and she glanced over her shoulder to see Heather standing there. I need to go, Ma. Love you, and I'll call you later, okay? After her mom said goodbye, Robin pocketed her phone and faced her friend. My mom. Levi's ready for you, she said. Everything okay at home? Home. Robin wasn't even sure where that was at the moment. Yeah, my mom's fine. She moved to step past Heather, but she blocked the way. Really? You look sad. Robin looked into Heather's dark eyes and wanted to trust someone, tell someone, be friends with someone, make roots with someone. I'm not sad, Robin started, trying to sort through how she felt. I like Shane Royal. Heather fell back a step, her eyebrows lifting. Oh. Cowboy who works for my brother's ranch. Yep. Where you're now living in your tiny house. Robin smiled and cocked her hip. Don't tell me you didn't already know we got caught in the hailstorm together on Saturday, or that he made chicken and waffles at his house for dinner that night. Heather lifted her chin half an inch. I did not know about the chicken and waffles. Mm-hmm but you didn't know about my giant crush on Shane. The whole town probably knows, and I've been here for two days. I didn't know that either. I knew you two had gotten stuck out in the cabin, that's all. Robin cocked her head, trying to find the lie. 
I swear, Heather laughed. Though, now that you've said it out loud, I'm sure it'll be on the news tonight. She glanced around like a reporter would jump out from the corner of the barn, a device recording everything they said. I'm an idiot, right? Robin said as Heather led her back inside. I mean, I don't live here, not really, and I've already broken the guy's heart once. Oh, I don't think so, Heather said. No, which part? The part about breaking his heart. She gave Robin a half smile as she turned into the office. That Shane Royal is a tough nut to crack. I think you have a shot with him. You really think so? Are we going to talk about Shane all day? Levi asked. All day? Heather asked at the same time humiliation rolled through Robin. I've been outside for three minutes. Well, he just called and he's on his way over. Levi nodded toward the phone like it would confirm it. Really? Robin said in tandem with Heather. Why is he coming here? Robin exchanged a look with Heather, who wore a smile the size of the Gulf of Mexico. I called and said you were giving a lesson, she said. All of our employees will be there, too, and I wondered if he wanted to come. Half of Robin wanted to be furious, was furious with Heather. The other half wanted to spend time with Shane, even if it wasn't a group of other people. And you didn't know about the chicken and waffles, Robin scoffed. Biggest lie I ever heard. Even I heard about the chicken and waffles, Levi muttered. Which leads me to ask once again, are we going to talk about Shane Royal all day? No, Robin said in her best authoritative tone. Is this what you guys do? Levi asked. You and May, when you get together with Allie and the girls at Sotheby's, you talk about us men, don't you? Of course not. Heather tipped up onto her toes and swept a kiss across Levi's mouth. Believe it or not, we have other things to talk about. What about before we got married? Levi pressed. Oh, well, yeah. Heather grinned and went around the desk. Before we got married, when I went to Sotheby's, I talked about you. What did you say? Heather sighed and looked up at her husband. Robin, she prompted. Women tend to need a nudge in the right direction, Robin said as Levi swung his attention toward her. So May probably told Heather she was dumb if she left you, that you were a great guy, that kind of thing. You are a great guy, Heather said, picking up a pen and looking at the computer. And Robin just needs a nudge with Shane. Nothing wrong with that. Robin wanted to say she'd already held the man's hand, already told him she liked him, but she clamped her lips shut around the confession. He was the one who hadn't come to her aid on Saturday. He hadn't stopped by or texted all day Sunday either. So maybe Heather's phone call was more of a nudge for him than for Robin. Maybe men needed a little relationship help sometimes, too. At least that was what Robin told herself, until she saw the gloriously handsome cowboy walk through the door and head straight toward her. Chapter 9 Shane chuckled as Robin met him in the hallway, tucking herself right into his arms with a smile. He held her against his chest, liking the way she fit there, liking the way she breathed in and out as if it was easier within his embrace. In that moment, he realized how much peace she brought him. She'd only been in town a few days, but he hadn't been as angry as he normally was. The fury he carried around never left him, always seemed to be boiling right beneath the surface. When he got too tired, too hungry, or simply couldn't hold the anger back anymore, he snapped. Dylan took the brunt of it, but Shane had lashed out at Kurt and several other men, too. He'd always apologize once he'd cooled down, but he needed to get a grip on his emotions if he wanted a real chance with Robin. And blast it, though he tried to talk himself out of liking her for the past 36 hours, he couldn't do it. He really liked her, and he wanted a real chance with her. Missed you yesterday, she said. Yeah, I was able to go into church, he said. So I did. There was a picnic afterward, and I stayed for that, too. The ranch was really quiet. I bet it was. Shane released her just as Levi stepped into the hall. He ducked his head and tried not to look like he'd just been caught by his father doing something he shouldn't. I can come look at your house tonight, after this if you still need me to. The roof's leaking, she said. But since it hardly ever rains here, it's fine. Supposed to rain tomorrow, Levi said. He shook hands with Shane. Good to see you, man. You coming to dinner tonight? A mix of emotions traveled through Shane. Is that tonight? He purposely didn't look at Robin. Sure is. So I can come help with the roof in the morning, 
he said as Robin stepped to his side. I'm up super early anyway. What dinner? Robin asked. Oh, it's a family thing, a, a grapeseed ranch thing. Shane looked at Levi for help. You should come, he said to Robin. Shane's lungs forgot how to breathe, especially when she looked up at him, but he couldn't tear his gaze from Levi. She should come. Sure, Levi said easily. Kurt'll be there and he's bringing May. Shane wanted to bolt. How did the whole town know about his five-minute meal with Robin? He'd been careful to make sure no one saw them holding hands. He trusted his friends on the ranch, but it only took Felicity mentioning to Heather that Shane liked Robin to make things into a big, huge deal. Kurt's married to May, Shane said, shifting to put some distance between him and Robin. There wasn't much room in the aisle between stalls, and Levi's presence was so big anyway. Shane wished she had the other man's confidence. It's fine. I... Of course she can come, Levi said. It's nothing big, just dinner. But Shane could tell Levi deliberately wasn't saying something. He nodded and nudged Robin to move down the aisle. Where are you starting, Robin? He asked. Levi has all the horses at Neary shoeing somewhere, she said. Yard too, Levi said. My boy should be out there already. Since you don't live here full time, I need someone who can keep up with the horse's needs. You should have a vet on staff, Robin said as she moved. She wore dark jeans today with a plain gray t-shirt. She made simple clothes look sexy, and Shane couldn't wait to see her wearing her farrier apron. There was something about the way she cinched it tight around her waist and had all those tools hanging from it that made Shane's head swim. With the number of horses I have, I should employ a farrier full time, Levi said following her. Heather stepped out of the office right in front of Shane, and he let her go first. Hey, she said with a smile. Glad you could make it. Thanks for calling, he said. Duane's always wanted someone who can take care of the horses better. He can't handle the metal-on-metal metal sound. Heather followed Levi and Robin outside. You know, because of his time in the army. I'm interested in learning more, Shane said. I mean, obviously I can shoe a horse and take care of them generally, but with how fast he buys them and how often we use them, having someone to care for them better is a good idea. Heather nodded her approval, and Shane wondered how much input she had for affairs on the ranch. She obviously talked to Duane often, but Shane hardly ever saw her out at Great Seed Ranch. You can bring Robin to dinner, Heather said. You're the co-foreman now, and if you want to bring her, bring her. Shane paused, glad when Heather did too. He watched as Robin stepped through the fence Levi opened for her. Several other men loitered along the line, with a mess of horses beyond them. You don't think that would be, uh, too forward? Shane sighed and let his raging emotions flow through him. I really like her, Heather, and it's obvious to everyone who even looks at me. She likes you, too. Yeah, I guess. What does that mean? Shane shook his head. I don't know. And that was the problem. When it came to Robin, Shane could never predict what she'd do. She might push him away that morning or decide she needed to leave the ranch by evening. He never really knew if he was tying her down or letting her fly, and he suspected she didn't know either. Let's not miss the lesson, he said, striding toward the yard. After all, if he wanted to be Duane's go-to guy for farrier issues on the ranch, he'd need to learn from the woman Duane trusted most with his horses. So, you don't have to go to the dinner, Shane said as Robin started packing up her tools. The sun still shone brightly in the sky, though its westward track had it aiming for the horizon. I'm sure it'll be boring. What's it about? she asked. Duane and Felicity host a ranch dinner once a month, he said. Tonight it's at Levi's and Heather's house. We eat, and we talk about the ranch and our lives, and... Shane trailed off as he realized how much he enjoyed the family dinners. He'd never expected to feel so accepted and like he belonged at another man's ranch, but at Grape Seed he did. Duane was exceptional at including men in his personal life while keeping things professional, too. It was a rare gift Shane wasn't sure how to accomplish. He'd never had to think about it before. His family's ranch was small enough to maintain with family members. At least it had been until his father had bankrupted them and forced his mother to sell the land she'd grown up on. His familiar frustration and fury over his father returned, but Shane forced it away. And what? Robin asked. Shane got the impression it wasn't the first time as she paused in the cleaning of her tools. 
We're friends, Shane said. You can come if you want. It's up to you. Would it be a date? If you consider dinner at someone's house with four married couples a date, then yes. I suppose it would be a date. He peered at her, the smudge of dirt along her cheekbone adorable and endearing. He reached over and tucked back a wisp of her hair that had fallen out of her ponytail. Do you want it to be a date? Only if you do. Shane smiled, a gesture of his happiness, at the same time he sighed, evidence of his frustration. Look, Robin, I'm not interested in playing games. I like you a lot, as I'm sure you already know. Heck, I've tried to stop for three long years. There's just something infectious about you. She blinked at him a couple of times. Infectious. Just what every girl wants to hear. She grinned and laughed, but Shane didn't. That's not what I meant. She tucked her horseshoe hammer inside her bag and rolled the tools together. It's fine, Shane. I know what you meant. She straightened and handed him her tools. I like you, too. She bumped him with her hip. So carry those to the truck for me and let's talk about this dinner. An hour later, Shane climbed the steps to Robin's tiny house with a full-sized front door and knocked on it. Inside, a dog yipped, and a few moments later, Robin opened the door. Her hair flowed over her shoulders in sexy waves, and Shane's lips curled up. She wore a denim skirt with big black buttons down the front and a white blouse that looked like she'd spent the afternoon bleaching it. A large necklace adorned her collar, and his gaze centered there. Are those planets? He asked, reaching out to touch the biggest gem, obviously the sun. It's my galaxy necklace, she said, stepping into his personal space. She turned back to the dog. Stay, misfit. Misfit? Shane backed up to give her room on the porch. She closed the door behind her and tucked her phone into one pocket and her hand into his. She's a Yorkie. Doesn't explain the name. Shane led her down the steps and over to his truck, which was the opposite color of her white one and about two sizes smaller. I rescued her, Robin said. I named her Misfit because, well, she didn't seem to fit where she was, just like me. Shane cocked his head, trying to hear more than what she'd said. You're a misfit? In some situations. She climbed into the truck and smoothed her skirt. But me and misfit, we belong to each other. Shane leaned into the passenger door. You fit here, Robin. She smiled at him, but it was a placating gesture that said, No, I don't. Sometimes I think so, and other times I'm not so sure. I know how that feels. Shane stepped back and closed her door before rounding the hood and climbing behind the wheel. But the longer I'm here at Great Seed Ranch, the more I feel like I belong. It's a unique place, that's for sure. I've always loved coming here, she said. Why is that, do you think? Robin watched out her window for several moments, long enough for Shane to back up and get the truck headed for the carved sign that hung over the entrance to the ranch. I don't know, she said. She sounded sad but when she slid across the bench and pressed her thigh flush against his, the sigh she admitted sounded blissful and happy. Shane threaded his fingers through hers and held on. If this was only going to last for a few weeks, he wanted to enjoy every day of it. At Levi's, they were the last to arrive. The mood inside the gigantic house was light and bubbly, usually everything Shane disliked, but with fresh flowers on the dining room table and happy, smiling pictures of Heather and Levi on the end tables, the high-end lamps and furniture seemed homey instead of clinical. You made it, Heather said, embracing Robin. Felicity smiled and Duane met Shane's eyes with a question in his. Shane barely lifted one shoulder as if to say, So I like her. That's okay, right? Duane grinned and continued setting butter knives next to the plates on the table. And who is this? Shane turned to Duane's father, the man who had first hired him and made him and his brothers feel like family on the ranch. Hey, Chase, you remember Robin Cook. She's the fairy you contracted years ago. Dwayne's dad grinned. Of course I remember Robin. He drew her into a hug and motioned his wife over. Maggie, look at Robin. Maggie Carver came over, her blonde hair almost completely white now. You look great, dear. She hugged Robin, too, and looked at Shane with fondness. And how's your mother, Shane? She's doing just great, ma'am. Last I heard she had a cough she was fighting which was last month. She's over that now. Shane grinned at Maggie. 
She still wants that corn chowder recipe you promised her. Maggie laughed and said, I'll text it to her, as if the women text it regularly. All right, all right, Heather said loudly. We're ready, Levi. Baby back ribs, he said. Heather's got mashed potatoes in this special salad from her mom's cookbook. Is this the one with the sour cream and mayo dressing? Dwayne asked. Yes, sir, Heather said, beaming. Shane wasn't sure what that was, but Dwayne said, I love that stuff. Great, Heather said. You can say a prayer and then we'll eat. After the blessing on the food, after everyone had gone through the line and loaded their plates with food, after everyone had sat down to eat, Levi stood. So, Heather and I have an announcement. Shane paused with a fork full of mashed potatoes halfway to his mouth. Robin settled her napkin on her lap and looked at Levi expectantly. For some reason, Shane felt something shift in the air. We're expecting, Heather said, her face splitting into a wide smile. She laughed and Maggie jumped to her feet, a squeal filling the cavernous dining room. May stood too, her baby bump obvious as she moved behind the chairs to hug Heather. Questions filled the air from, When are you due? to, How long have you known? to, Do you want a boy or a girl? to, Will you go back to the school in the fall? Shane stood because everyone else had gotten to their feet, but he wasn't sure what to do. In that moment, he definitely felt like a misfit in this close-knit family. Then Robin's hand fitted into his, and he felt less alone, less unsure, less angry. He liked how she made him feel with such a simple touch, and he liked himself better when he was with her. A sob cut through all the congratulations, and Shane turned in time to see Felicity shrug out of Duane's embrace and run from the room. Silence descended, and Heather stepped over to her brother. What's wrong? Duane. Tall, strong, nothing bothers him, Duane blinked back tears. We just found out Felicity can't have children. Chapter 10 Robin felt like the wrong fly on a wall she never should have seen. She couldn't help overhearing Duane as he explained to his mother that, yes, he and Felicity were waiting to start a family, but now Felicity was ready and she couldn't get pregnant. It felt like a very long time before he said, I should go find her, but was probably less than a minute. Everyone sat back down to eat, but Robin's appetite had fled with Felicity. It's fine, Heather, Levi murmured, but she didn't stop weeping. Everyone ate, but the conversation had died. Heather finally got up, and despite Levi's protests, she took her plate to the kitchen sink. I don't really have anything to do with the ranch anyway, she said before walking through the living room and turning right down a hall. Sure she does, Chase Carver said. She's busy at the stable, Kurt said, wiping his hand down his face, and the orchards, right where she should be. He gave Levi a tired smile. Should we go, Miss May? Maybe Sotheby's will have some of that famous chocolate cake. Not likely, she said. I made that cake. Juan Carlos makes excellent cake, Levi said as he stood and moved to the fridge, and it's right here. The mood lightened after that and Levi served cake and everyone went out on the deck. The evening sun was blocked by the tall trees surrounding his property, and the soft sounds of animals could be heard in the distance. Robin took a deep breath of the peach-scented air, a sense of peace cascading through her. It's nice here, Robin said to Shane, who stood at the railing of the deck, his cake already half gone. Levi has a lot of money, he said. Confusion tainted Robin's next bite of cake. So what? so it's easy to make things nice when you have a lot of money. He turned away from the railing in favor of Chase and Maggie Carver, and Robin watched him go, wondering what she'd said wrong. When it was time to go, she settled in his truck and said, Tell me what you're thinking. He seemed fond of asking her to reveal what was happening in her head, and she wanted the same privilege. I'm thinking that I don't want to talk about anything serious right now. He shot her a glance out of the corner of his eye. I'm thinking... Maybe we should just go fix your roof and enjoy the sunset through the windows of your tiny house. All right, she said, though she knew there was something serious brewing in Shane's mind. But she let him drive and climb a ladder to a roof and patch the shingles that had been damaged and enter her small space with his big shoulders in even bigger presence. She handed him a cup of coffee and flashed him a smile. He took it, but as she went to move past him, he put his free hand on her arm. They stood side by side, facing different directions, and Robin waited inside the bubble of his masculine scent, 
her heart hammering. My father left my mother with a pile of debt and no way to pay it. He spoke in a slow, controlled way, his voice barely loud enough to reach her ears. I haven't spoken to him in 15 years, and I hate him for what he did to my mom. Robin looked up into his eyes and found them blazing with brilliant blue light. And you think you need a lot of money before you can... What exactly? I know I like you enough to be thinking about the future, he said. And I don't even own a house, tiny or not. Robin reached down deep and plucked up her courage. At least you knew your father. Mine didn't want me, so he refused to marry my mother and left before I was born. Shane blinked, and Robin almost regretted sharing this very intimate detail with him. She'd shared some parts of her life, favorite foods and childhood activities, but nothing too serious, nothing that would bind her to this place and this man. And he seemed to know that she'd just done something she normally wouldn't have done. So, I guess this means you kind of like me. Is that it? He turned slightly, his hand sliding along her waist. I guess it means I like you enough to be thinking about the future, too. She liked being close to him, enjoyed the heat from his body as it stole through hers. And I think it means we have to do a lot of talking about things to make sure we don't mess up as badly as our parents did. My father made a choice, Shane said, a measure of anger entering his tone. Lots of them, actually. And one of them included a new girlfriend who's younger than I am. Oh, Robin wasn't sure what to say. Austin tells me stuff, Shane said, finally looking away. Our father keeps in touch with all of us, but Dylan and I, we don't respond. I don't even read the texts. What is Austin, then? He was only 16 when my dad left. He wasn't the one working the farm he thought he'd inherit. He wasn't the one who had to put everything up for sale, clean out the house, or help his mother relocate. Shane drew in a breath that trembled the slightest bit, and Robin loved that he was as vulnerable as he was strong. I have a lot of anger, he whispered, his lips sweeping across her temple and landing in the middle of her forehead. I've never really tried to get over it. Fear bolted through her at the intimate way he touched her, held her so close to his heart, shared so much of himself with her. She'd never let anyone in as far as him, not since Kevin, and she wasn't sure she wouldn't run from Hill Country at first light. Shane backed up and retreated to the window above her kitchen sink. In some houses it would have been a great distance, but in hers, Robin could still reach him in only two steps, and by reaching out her hand. So let's go watch the sunset he said. Something simple. He turned and faced her before lifting his coffee to his lips. Robin thought about kissing him, pasting the coffee and cream and sugar on his mouth, and a stronger jolt of fear hit her. The sunset, she managed to rasp out. Sure, let's do that. She left her coffee behind because she knew she couldn't handle the caffeine. Besides, being with Shane was like threading a live wire through her veins. She certainly didn't need another stimulant. Shane drove under the ranch sign and west, away from town for about ten minutes. The sun sank lower and lower in the sky, and when Shane pulled over, it was almost twilight. He jumped in the back of the truck and spread out a blanket while she climbed up. She let him settle against the windows, and then she leaned into him. He curled one arm around her and exhaled, like it had been the longest day of his life. Neither of them spoke as the sun dipped lower. She wasn't sure what he was thinking about, but her thoughts revolved around him and what he'd said about his family and why she'd never seen the anger he'd spoken of. When it was full dark, he asked, You're not going to leave in the morning, are you? What makes you think that? I know you better than you think, Robin. You run when things scare you, and I saw your face at the house. Deciding to be honest, Robin admitted, The thought of leaving crossed my mind. His fist clenched on her shoulder for a quick moment before it released. Why? Because just like you have this anger living inside you, which I've never seen, by the way, I have this... this... I don't know... this thing inside me that doesn't want to be caged. Robin thought about Kevin and all he'd wanted her to give up so they could be together. The general idea of a boyfriend scares me. Yeah, it's called a free spirit, Shane said and nothing more. His breathing evened, 
Robin didn't want to leave the comfort and security of his arms, so she let him sleep. She even closed her own eyes, but the worry over this developing relationship kept her awake. By Sunday, Robin never wanted to see another horse's hoof. Levi owned and housed almost a hundred horses, and though she'd spent the week with Shane at her side, borrowing her tools, asking her questions, Robin had never cleaned so many hooves, checked so many tendons, or shod so many horses as she had in the past five days. So she slept late and listened to several vehicles start up and rumble down the lane and on toward town. When everything was silent, she got dressed and picked up Misfit. Let's go for a walk, girl. She set down the little dog when she reached the lawn, grateful for the brilliant sun and the wide blue sky, grateful that she hadn't gotten in her truck and left the ranch this morning, grateful for an anchor to hold on to when her spirit needed to be tethered. Rounding the corner of the house, she came face to face with Felicity. Oh, Robin backed up a step. I'm sorry, I thought everyone had gone to church. Felicity tucked her dark hair and ducked her chin. Didn't feel like it today. Something huge sat between them, and Robin didn't know how to erase it or move it. I'm sorry about... things, Robin said. Felicity lifted her eyes and met Robin's. I'm sorry I made dinner awkward. Tears filled her eyes. For a while there, I didn't think I wanted children. I'm not the most domestic of women. I prefer working with horses and shoveling stalls to laundry and cooking. She gave half of a laugh that was mixed with a whole sob. And now it turns out that when I'm ready, I can't actually get pregnant. She swiped at her tears. Sorry, I'm just kind of a mess right now. Robin's whole heart bled for Felicity, and she wrapped her in a hug and held on tight. The other woman's shoulders shook, and Robin felt her anguish all the way down to her own toes. It's okay, she whispered, the way her mom used to when Robin's heart was breaking and she had nowhere else to go. It'll all be okay. Felicity cried for a few more minutes, and then she backed out of Robin's embrace. Dwayne says we can adopt, she said, nodding. We're going to look into some other options. I just need time to, I don't know, mourn or something. She turned back to the way she'd been coming. But I'm not going to wait too long, she said over her shoulder. That's a lesson I've learned, Robin. Don't wait too long for something. It might not be there when you decide you want it. She walked over to the vegetable garden and bent over to examine a tomato plant. Her words rumbled through Robin's head, moving down and infusing into her heart. She spun away from Felicity and the garden, her need to get to Shane intense and inexplicable. Did Dwayne go to church? She asked. Yeah, he said it gives him peace. Felicity didn't look away from her plants. I just couldn't go today. I understand. Robin stood at the edge of the garden while Misfit sniffed the dirt. Do you know if Shane went into town this morning? Felicity looked at Robin. Are you serious about him this time? She stood and clapped her hands together. I, I don't know. Don't hurt him. Felicity said. He's never gotten over you, and he holds on to things for a long time. Trust me on that. Robin thought about Shane's father, and how he'd abandoned Shane fifteen years ago, about the anger he said he still had about that. He scares me, Robin admitted, words surging up her throat. He's permanent, and he's steady, and I'm... I'm... Nothing about me is permanent, and that's the way I like it. She drew in a big, deep breath, desperate to make her heartbeat stop rippling in her chest. Maybe you do like that. Felicity wiped her hands on her jeans. But maybe you'd like Shane's permanence more. And maybe you shouldn't take too long to figure it out. She gave Robin a meaningful look before heading for the back porch. And I don't know if he went to church or not. He sometimes goes and he sometimes doesn't. Felicity entered the house, and the crack of the door slamming closed behind her an exclamation point on the conversation. Robin spun back to her tiny house, her indecision warring through her mind and heart. In the end, she dipped to pick up Misfit and cooed to the little dog. I need to go find Shane, okay? I just want to talk to him. She mounted the steps and entered the house. Do you think he'll be at church? You think I've waited too long already? She rushed into her loft and pulled the sundress off a hanger. Misfit stayed downstairs because the Yorkie couldn't actually climb the stairs by herself. Robin kept talking to her anyway. 
Maybe he is the type of permanence I need. What do you think? She fluffed her hair after pulling the dress on. After grabbing a pair of heels, Robin hurried down the steps to the little dog. She crouched in front of the animal. I sure like him, and I don't want to mess up too badly this time. Misfit cocked her head, and Robin took that to mean, All right, get on over to the church and talk to him. And that was exactly what Robin was fixing to do. Chapter 11 Shane became aware of the disturbance earlier than some, but definitely after Duane. He leaned forward and hissed, She's looking for you, cowboy. Shane frowned at his boss, unsure of what had happened. He only knew that something had. Duane nodded his head toward the far right side of the chapel, and Shane's heart catapulted to the top of his skull and back. Robin stood there scanning the crowd and bending over to talk with the patrons sitting there. The man, Stockton Harrison, turned and pointed in Shane's direction. Robin smiled and nodded, but she still hadn't located him. Pastor Gifford had definitely noticed Robin, and his words slowed to a stop. Sorry, she called, tacking on a short, nervous laugh. I'm just looking for Shane Royal. Chuckling came down the row of cowboys where Shane sat, and Dylan elbowed him and grinned like it was his birthday and Shane had just given him a new horse. Go on, then. Why are you still sitting here? Shane wasn't sure, only that he was frozen. He stared at Robin in that light blue dress that barely brushed her knees, while Pastor Gifford said, I think Shane's here somewhere. He peered into the crowd, and everyone in the two rows in front of him turned and looked at him. He cleared his throat and stood. When Robin's eyes caught his, relief stained her features. He hooked his thumb toward the lobby and said, Sorry, way too loudly for the small chapel before getting out of there as fast as he could. Problem was, he sat several places from the end of the row, and five cowboys, bulky cowboys, were in his way. They all stood and he edged past them, and by the time he made it to the aisle, his whole face flamed with embarrassment. Kurt, who sat on the end of the back row, grinned at him and reached up to grab Shane's arm before he could make his full escape. She's got it bad for you. No, she doesn't, Shane whispered back. At least Pastor Gifford had started talking again. She's probably here to say goodbye. And with those final dread-filled words, Shane went to see why Robin had interrupted church to find him. She turned when he came through the doors and into the lobby. Her beauty made his chest ache, and his feet stopped short of reaching her. What are you doing? He managed to take most of the incredulity from his voice before he spoke. I just wanted to talk to you. You could have sent a text. She giggled, and it contained a whole lot of nerves. I was in such a hurry, I left my phone at home. He put all of his weight on his left foot and folded his arms, unsure of why he was being so closed off. Well, what's going on? I know it's not Dylan or Austin, because they're here with me. Robin's hand twisted around and around each other. I don't want to make any mistakes. Maybe come to church before the sermon starts, then, he said, softening toward her. He couldn't help it. She was adorable when she was nervous, and something about her made him want to protect her from feeling that way around him. Or just come in and sit in the back, he suggested. I didn't know what door I was walking through, she said. Why is there a door that's right in the front? Fire escape, he said, totally making the explanation for the door up on the spot. She cocked her head and said, Ha ha, very funny. He approached slowly, keeping his hands tucked into the pockets of his slacks. What do you mean by, you don't want to make any mistakes? With you, she said, tilting her head back to maintain eye contact with him as he inched closer. But I'm pretty freaked out about how strongly I feel about you, and I've only been here for a week. Nine days, Shane murmured, only realizing after he spoke that he'd just given a lot away. You're counting? She asked. Yes. He lifted his chin in defiance. I'm counting, Robin, because you'll only be here for 35 days, and I need to know when to put my heart back inside my chest so it doesn't break. She took a few seconds to riddle through what he'd said. He'd spent an unhealthy amount of time thinking about Robin this week. Even when he was standing right next to her in the arena, a horse's hoof between them, he thought about her. When he held her hand, he wondered if he could ask her to stay in this part of Hill Country indefinitely. When he picked her up and drove her over to Levi's stable, he fantasized about kissing her when he dropped her off. He hadn't, hadn't held her close to his heart again, 
hadn't brought up any more serious discussions. He had, however, joined an online counseling app, and he'd met with a counselor about his anger three times in the past week. With the app, he could message his counselor and get a response within 12 hours. He could chat as much as he wanted, and he'd actually found the few sessions he'd had to be cleansing and worthwhile. That's what I mean, she said earnestly, putting both hands on his chest and sliding them up to his shoulders as if they were going to slow dance. I don't want to break your heart. Then don't. I don't know how not to be me, she said. I've never had a relationship that worked. Her bottom lip trembled and she steadied it with a quick swipe of her tongue between her lips. Either I'm not girly enough, I've heard that plenty of times, trust me, or I'm too needy, or I have to give up everything that makes me me, and I don't want to do that either. I like you just the way you are. Her soft curls brushed her slim shoulders, and Shane couldn't imagine a man on earth who wouldn't find her gorgeously feminine. Sure, she had muscles in her arms. She had to, to hold the horses in place. She had a strong personality. She had to, to keep her reputation as the best farrier in Hill Country. I have a bald eagle spirit, she said. I love to soar. I know that, Robin. He sighed and stepped back so her hands would leave his body. He could barely think with her touching him. That's why I'm counting the days. So you can soar when it's time to soar. Shane desperately wanted her to say she wouldn't soar away from him in only 26 days. Or maybe that she'd take him under her wing and teach him how to soar too. And you're okay with that? She asked. He exhaled, wishing he was back inside the chapel, listening to Pastor Gifford talk about helping the less fortunate. What do you want me to say, Robin? What you're thinking? I'm thinking that no, I'm not okay with that. He took a step toward her, the scent of her frilly perfume filling his nose. I've had a crush on you for three years. I've watched you come and go for three years. But I guess this summer, I decided it would be better to have you be mine for 35 days instead of not at all. His chest felt like oxygen was the wrong thing to breathe. He moved forward again, and Robin backed up, her expression positively terrified. I know you like me, too. He brushed her hair off her shoulder in an excuse to touch the bare skin there. He was seriously considering kissing her right now, right here, in the lobby at the church. Something told him that if he did, he wouldn't see Robin at the ranch again. So he just trailed his fingers down her bare arm and let them fall back to his side. Sorry if that scares you. I don't know how to help you with that. Just like no one could really help him with his anger issues, he'd learned in the short week he'd been in therapy that he couldn't solve Robin's fear for her. You won't wait forever, she said. Probably not. But he didn't know how to let her go. Even after she left, Shane would hold on to her, waiting and counting down the days until she came back the following summer. Then after this summer, after holding her hand and being this close to her, He'd probably have to go visit his mother during Robin's time in the Grape Seed Falls area. Robin stepped into him, and it was as natural as breathing to lift his arms and hold her tight. I don't want to be like Felicity. I have no idea what that means, he murmured, his mouth getting dangerously close to her earlobe. But this feels nice. She said she waited too long to have kids. I don't want to wait too long to... I don't know. Have you in my life... I'm in your life right now. For longer than 35 days. Shane stepped back and everything happened so fast. She'd said so much with so few words, and he needed a minute to sort through it all. You're talking about something more permanent, he said, shaking his head to get rid of the multitude of thoughts taking up space in his brain. That doesn't sound like you. That's just it. I want it to sound like me. Shane liked the sound of what she was saying, but a river of worry cascaded through him. He wanted her to be her too, and if that meant she could never stay in one place so they could be together, he'd have to deal with it. How, he wasn't sure. But he didn't want to be the one she resented when she realized she'd become someone she wasn't. Look, he said, how about we take it one day at a time, okay? One day at a time? Yeah. And today he wanted to hold her hand, so he slipped his fingers between hers and squeezed. Today's day nine. What should we do? She looked up at him, the fog clearing from her eyes. Don't you have to work? Yeah, but just this afternoon. We could go up to the river this evening if you wanted to. And do what? 
Shane had a lot of ideas, most of them ending in a sunset-lit kiss, but he just shrugged. Take some food, listen to the river, talk, whatever. I never met a man who wants to talk. I like talking to you, Robin. He squeezed her hand again. I want to know everything about you. He leaned closer and her eyes drifted halfway closed. His ideas about kissing her and that she'd let him roared forward. I'm especially interested in why you've never had a relationship that's worked. She groaned. I don't want to tell you all the bad stuff about me. Well, tough, he said, bringing her knuckles to his lips and placing a kiss there. If we want to figure out how to make our relationship work, we'll have to examine the past. He tugged her outside where the sun threatened to melt the flesh right off his bones. Fine, she said, but you'll have to start. I've already finished, sweetheart. Or did you not hear me when I said my father left our family 15 years ago, and I'm still furious about it? Or maybe you forgot the part where I said I've had a crush on you for three years. Shane forced a chuckle out of his mouth, a half-hearted attempt to lighten the mood because he had just as much work to do to make something viable between them as she did. Maybe more. Chapter 12 My mother thinks I get my free spirit from my father. Robin had no idea why the words spilled from her mouth. And I don't like that. I mean, I never even knew the guy. Why does he get to make my life complicated? Shane stepped a few times before saying, We don't get to choose our parents. How very pragmatic of you, she said. A heartbeat of silence went by before he said, I started therapy. A blip of surprise moved through her. Really? When? She glanced at him, the same handsome, strong cowboy she'd admired for so long. You've been by my side for days, and we spent evenings together, too. It's an app, he said. I can text or chat a counselor and we talk. Robin absorbed his words. What's it called? Maybe she could talk to someone about how to be less flighty, how to put down roots without freaking out and running away. She'd been doing that for so long, she wasn't sure it was possible to change now. It's called Talk to Me, he said. May told me about it. It's pretty good. Shane paused near the driver's side door of her truck. So I bet I can get my work done by three. You want to head to the Lano River after that? Robin found herself nodding and unlocking her truck. Sounds like a date she said. Oh, boy. He chuckled and then leaned into the truck after she'd climbed behind the wheel. If you bring food, it's definitely a date. I'll swing by the grocery store while you're doing your chores. Robin enjoyed flirting with him so much, and as he leaned closer, she thought he'd kiss her right there in the church overflow parking lot. He gazed at her the way she'd always dreamed a man would, with adoration and excitement in his expression. Then he tapped the top of the truck and backed up. All right, then. I'll come pick you up about 3.30. That should give us plenty of daylight. Robin started the truck, but then waited as she watched Shane saunter away. The man was devastatingly handsome, kind, faithful. Why was her stomach twisting and her heart pulsing against itself? Because he's your boyfriend, she muttered to herself, reaching over to turn up the air conditioning. And boyfriends had brought Robin nothing but trouble. Instead of driving to the grocery store... She pulled out her phone and searched the app store for Talk to Me. The pricing plan seemed reasonable, and she put in the information required to sign up. The app led her through a series of questions about what kind of help she needed, if she preferred a phone call, texting, or a video chat, and several other options. In the end, she was matched with three therapists, their rates listed next to their pictures. Again, the $25 for the first session seemed reasonable, but Robin hesitated with her thumb over the Connect button. She didn't need someone with a bunch of letters after their name to tell her she was like her father and there was nothing she could do about it. Worse, she didn't want a psychiatrist to tell her she needed to give up parts of her life she loved so she could be with Shane. Then what would she do? Robin sighed, set her phone on the bench seat next to her, and drove to the grocery store. She spent the hours while Shane did his chores putting together the best potato salad she knew how to make and building a killer ham and cheese sandwich for both of them. She was just spreading out the caramel corn she'd made when Shane knocked on her door. He poked his head into the tiny house a moment later. Wow, it smells good in here. Robin's whole body warmed with his presence. Thanks, there's a lot of food. Are we swimming? He asked. She spun from the counter where she worked. We're swimming? The river is nice in the summer, he said, 
I wasn't sure, but I threw my trunks in the back of the truck. He scanned her. But I don't see you wearing your suit. Robin wasn't sure how to answer. The thought of seeing him in a pair of swimming trunks and nothing else made her mouth dry, and her skin shivered when she thought of wearing a swimming suit in front of him. I don't think I even own a swimming suit right now, she said. I, uh, downsized a lot when I sold my house in Temple and packed up this tiny thing. All right. He glanced over her shoulder to the cooler on the counter next to the popcorn. I brought a blanket, too. We can just lie around and eat. His right hand flitted along her waist, finally making direct contact and bringing her closer. He pressed the side of his face to the side of hers and drew in a deep breath, almost like they were slow dancing in her minuscule kitchen. As quickly as he'd done that, he stepped back. You ready? What can I help you with? The cooler, she managed to whisper. After clearing her throat, she added, I'll bag this popcorn and be right out. We take a misfit? If you want. Will she wander off? No, she's afraid of tall grass. Robin laughed, her heart expanding two sizes when he scooped up her tiny dog off the bottom step and patted her. All right, see you out there. He left with the dog in the cooler and Robin sagged into the countertop. She was in so much trouble and she hastily pulled out her phone and dropped her thumb onto that connect button. A message from Dr. Seely Smith popped up only moments later. Tell me what you have on your mind regarding your relationship, and I'll get back to you within twelve hours. Robin stared at the chat bubble, unsure of how to articulate what she had on her mind. Shane was waiting, and she hadn't even started bagging the caramel corn yet. Her thumbs flew like falcons as she typed. I have a really great guy in my life, and I'm scared. See, I'm not the settling down type, and he is. She read over the words. That was exactly what was on her mind, so she sent the message before she could delete it and then erase the app from her phone entirely. Everything okay? Shane's voice made Robin drop her phone. She swiped it back into her hand, heat crawling through her face now. Yes, I'm coming. He watched her from the front door, which was only a few strides away. Robin kept her eyes down and her hands busy, hoping it would be on the end of the twelve hours that the therapist would get back with her. She wasn't sure why she cared if Shane knew she'd signed up with Talk To Me. She didn't have anything to be embarrassed about. But somehow, for some reason, she wanted to keep her therapy sessions to herself for now. I think that one looks like a dragon, she said, pointing to a wisp of cloud on the horizon that barely looked like a snake. Shane simply chuckled and shook his head. I'm not even going to look. There aren't any clouds in the sky. And even if there were, you wouldn't be able to see them through the leaves. He put another forkful of potato salad into his mouth, a quirk in his eyebrow that made her laugh. If there was one thing Robin had learned on this trip, it was that Shane could eat, and eat, and eat. It was as if the man hadn't consumed anything in a month. And she thought she'd made a lot of potato salad, but it was almost gone. The drive up to the Lano River had been forty minutes of laughter and talking, and Robin was glad she hadn't tainted this afternoon with her melancholy thoughts about therapy and why she couldn't commit to a relationship, to anything really. But that wasn't really true. She'd been a farrier for a decade, and she'd certainly dedicated her life to that. My mama would love Texas, she sighed. The clear blue sky is somehow better here than in Georgia. But I can't get her to leave her patch of land. She looked right at Shane. I just don't get that, you know? There's something about having somewhere to call home. He finally finished eating and leaned back on his elbows, a sigh leaking from him, too. Not that I would know. You have your cabin. I don't own that cabin, he said, a bit of flint coming into his voice. He closed his eyes and Robin admired the lines of his face, a strength in his shoulders. I had my whole life mapped out, he said. You know, I worked my dad's ranch since I was six years old. It was gonna be mine. Somewhere I could raise a family of my own. Robin didn't know how to soothe him. She reached over and patted his arm like he was her 90-year-old granny. He didn't flinch or yield or anything. She settled next to him and he opened his arm so she could cuddle into his side, resting her head against his chest. I'm sorry about your dad. He has another family now, Shane said quietly, his words mingling with the breeze in the trees. I don't understand it. My mom was a good woman. She's loyal and strong and he just threw her away. What you really mean is he threw you away. Yeah. His arm around her tightened. 
And what are you, my counselor on Talk to Me? She smiled, though there wasn't much to be happy about. Sorry, I guess I just know what it feels like to be discarded. He pressed a kiss to her temple, and they fell into the silence surrounding them. Misfit trotted over and tried to jump up on Robin. She giggled and helped the little dog up, where she settled in the crease where Robin's body touched Shane's. I think we need to get a bigger dog, he said. Robin's mind seized onto several things at once. She asked, Why? Then it couldn't sit right here on both of us. I'm afraid I'm going to step on this one and kill it, he said. Well, she lives with me, so I think you'll be okay. Hmm. Robin wished she felt tired, but she didn't. What kind of dog would you get if you could? I don't know, something like a German Shepherd or a Black Lab or something. Well, that's out, she said. Why's that? My whole house is 280 square feet. There's no way a dog that big will fit. Oh, so we'll be living in your house. Well, we can't share with your two brothers. A beat of silence passed before Robin burst into laughter. Thankfully, Shane joined in almost simultaneously. He shifted and Misfit fell into the gap between them now. He faced Robin and while he looked joyful, he was deadly serious at the same time. What are we talking about here, Robin? He reached over and tucked her hair behind her ear, and Robin loved the simple gesture. It spoke of his care for her, and how gentle he was, and how big of a heart he possessed. You're the one who said we should get another dog. She blinked slowly, like her eyelids were too heavy to lift back open. We do have unique living situations, he said. That might have to change. She stiffened. Ah, uh. So there's the first thing that makes your relationships unsuccessful. His eyes crinkled as he smiled. You don't like change. No one likes change. Maybe you don't want to change for someone else. Maybe. But Robin hated how selfish that made her sound. Maybe I'd change for the right man. So you're saying none of your previous boyfriends were the right man? Boyfriend, she corrected. Singular. You've only had one boyfriend. His eyebrows shot up and Robin wanted to smooth her hands over them to make them go back down. One man I'd label a boyfriend, yes. His name was Kevin. Oh, you don't belong with a Kevin. She laughed. No, absolutely not. His chest vibrated with a laugh, too. When he sobered, he said, He probably wanted you to do all kinds of things you didn't want to do. He did. Like what? Robin pressed her eyes closed, but the summer sun still permeated her lids. He wanted me to leave Texas for one, and he wanted me to move to California with him, and he wanted me to give up my job and find something else to do on the beach while he did his residency at a hospital in San Diego. Shane stroked his fingers through her hair, lighting her scalp on fire with the intimate touch. Hmm. And if Kevin were the right man, would you have done it? I don't know, she said. He wasn't the right man. And he's the only boyfriend you've had. He wasn't asking this time. I guess. There have been other men and a few dates here and there, but like I said, I'm never girly enough or whatever. I think you're plenty girly, he murmured, his breath washing across her forehead just before his lips pressed there. What makes a man your boyfriend? He asked next, his mouth migrating to her cheek and touching there. Robin could barely think. The scent of him infected her reasoning. She only continued breathing because it was an involuntary thing she didn't have to prompt her body to do. Would kissing you be too much of a change for you? He asked, his mouth catching on the corner of hers. No, she managed to whisper. And it was the first time she'd used the word no to really mean yes. Yes, please kiss me. She drew in a breath, waiting, hoping, praying. Finally, his lips brushed hers, and fireworks popped through Robin's whole system. The next time his mouth met hers, it held on. And Robin wondered how she'd lived her whole life without a kiss from Shane Royal. Chapter 13 Shane hadn't kissed a woman in a very long time. Too long. Still, it seemed like he remembered how to do it, and Robin enthusiastically responded to his touch. She tasted the fizzy soda she'd packed in the cooler, and enjoyed the softness of her lips against his. He pulled away, a chuckle rumbling through his chest. I've wanted to do that for a long time, he whispered. In response, 
She kissed him again. Shane became aware of his racing pulse, the sound of the river rushing nearby, the heat of the summer pressing down on him. His blood pounded through his veins, and every sense became heightened. And he wondered if that was what it felt like to be in love. He wasn't sure, had never fallen in love before, but he let one hand slide up Robin's back to cradle her head. She broke the connection this time, and Shane opened his eyes to look into the stunning beauty of her face. I don't want to be like my father. His voice barely left his mouth, and to Robin's credit, she didn't seem freaked out about his topic of conversation immediately following their first kiss. Okay, second. Robin pushed her fingers through his hair, and the touch only made Shane want to kiss her again. So he did. Slower, but shorter than before. I don't know him, Robin said. But you can't be anything like him. You fulfill all your responsibilities around the ranch. You take care of your brothers. She put a small smile on her face. I think you're wonderful. Shane did work hard to take care of everything, make sure the bills were paid, checked in on his mother. But he thought his father had done all of those things, too. I spent the first 21 years of my life wanting to be just like him, he said. I thought he was wonderful, too. Robin tucked herself into his arms, the crisp apple scent of her hair filling his nose. I'm sorry, Shane. He was, too. He'd ruined their perfect afternoon with his insecurities, drawing in a deep breath to push away the seedlings of anger that had started to take root in his gut. He squeezed her. Tell me why you became a farrier. She seemed to sense that he just needed her to talk, because once she started talking about her education at the horseshoeing school in Oklahoma, Shane simply lost himself in the pretty cadence of her voice. You should go, she said. Hmm? He shifted so he could look into her eyes. The horseshoeing school? Yeah, it's an amazing place, and there's a huge demand for farriers. He didn't dismiss her outright, but he said, I have a job, a good one. Maybe Levi would hire you full-time at the boarding stable if you got the training. The idea rolled around in Shane's mind, but he'd heard her mention how expensive the school was and that she lived on site, another requirement. Sure, it only took a few months for the longest, most expensive course, but Shane couldn't afford to take months off of work. Can I? He asked the Lord. I like my job at Grapeseed, and my brothers are there, and it allows me to send money to Mama. I can't leave that, right? He and Robin breathed in and then out together, and a feeling of peace descended on him, wrapped him up in a warm blanket, and told him that he had everything he needed in his life. If she'd stay. If she'd stay, he'd have everything he needed in his life. Desperation to make her stay clogged his throat, and he couldn't swallow it away. Dr. Sloan had counseled him not to bottle up so many emotions, so Shane let his fears his frustration, his fury swirl through him and infect the atmosphere. It felt freeing to lose the negativity instead of trying to stuff it back into a too small box inside his mind. His phone buzzed against his hip and he shifted Robin so he could check it. Sometimes it's my mom, he told her. And sure enough it was. Do you mind? She sat up saying, Of course not. And Shane swiped open the call. Hey, Ma. Happy Sabbath to y'all. Shane. The fondness in her voice was always there every time she said his name. How she wasn't angry and bitter he didn't know. What y'all doing this afternoon? He sat up too, switching the phone from his right hand to his left so he could hold Robin's hand in his. Oh, you know, wasting time by the river. A few seconds of silence came through the line, and Shane realized he'd never wasted time by the river before. When he called her on Sunday afternoons, it was a quick chat between chores, or just as he and Dylan and Austin were about to sit down to eat. He's Dylan there. He looked at Robin, wondering if she could hear the conversation. Her eyes beamed like blue starlight, and he lifted his eyebrows as if to ask her permission to tell his mother about their relationship. He couldn't tell if Robin understood the meaning of the gesture or not, so he said, No, Ma, Dylan's not here. I'm spending the afternoon with my girlfriend. That made Robin suck in a breath, and Shane saw the pure terror as it streamed through her eyes. She looked away, and he wondered if he'd changed things too fast between them. His mother squealed, 
and Shane yanked the phone away from his ear so he wouldn't go deaf. You're dating someone. Her voice could clearly be heard, and he met Robin's eyes again. So maybe I don't date that often either, he said with a wide smile. Thankfully, she returned it, and Shane told his mom about the beautiful blonde sitting next to him. I didn't think you'd ever date after what your father did, his mother said. I know, Ma. Me either. And still he wasn't sure what he was doing. His last conversation with his father had been more of a screaming match, and in the end, his dad had simply deflated. Said, At some point, Shane, I just fell out of love with her. Someday you'll understand. I'll never understand. That was what Shane had said, and he still didn't. Loving someone was a choice, something he knew would require constant effort and perpetual forgiveness. He knew because he'd chosen not to do those things with his dad. And that had been the last thing he'd ever said to his father. I'll never understand. Shane still didn't. He ended his conversation with his mom and tossed the phone onto the blanket beside him. After watching the river flow past for several long seconds, he asked, I didn't say anything that wasn't true, did I? He swung his attention toward Robin, who likewise gazed at the river. About me and you, I mean. She shook her head. I suppose not. So it's okay if I call you my girlfriend. Insane hope filled his chest, and he reminded himself that she would only be in his neck of the woods for 26 more days. Still, He'd already decided he'd rather have her for only 26 days than not at all. Her eyes met his, and she moved toward him at the same time he inched toward her. Her slender cool fingers traced along his jaw, making a shiver slide down his shoulders. Yeah, she breathed into his mouth. It's okay if you call me your girlfriend. She kissed him, and Shane thought day nine with Robin couldn't get any better. On day 10, Shane had to go back to his regular job at Grapeseed Ranch. He couldn't afford to follow Robin around to all of her ranches, and they'd agreed to meet up later to ride together. When he'd first become the co-foreman, it was so Kurt could work mornings and have afternoons and evenings off to spend with May, who worked a demanding schedule at her family's restaurant. But now that they were married, the schedule was more relaxed, and Shane wanted afternoons and evenings to be with Robin. So he knocked on Kurt's door before 7 a.m., unsurprised to find May just on the other side of it, already pink-cheeked and ready for the day. He's coming out now, she said with a smile. Thank you, ma'am. Shane started toward the chairs on the front porch. He'd observed Kurt's daily ritual of drinking his coffee there, patches his border collie at his feet. The dog's claws clicked the wood floor as the old animal came forward, his tongue lolling out of his mouth. Shane bent down to scratch patches as May said, so where'd you and Miss Robin disappear to yesterday? We missed you at lunch. I had to work, he said, sidestepping the question about Robin. Sorry I missed lunch. But then you left with Robin, right? She pressed. Shane straightened and looked at May. She'd always been so nice to him, and the usual anger he'd feel at her prying into his personal life simply wasn't there. Grateful for that small miracle, he smiled. Yes, ma'am, then I left with Robin. Don't interrogate the man, Kurt said, nudging his wife aside with a fond look on his face. He can go out with Robin if he wants to. He cut Shane a harder look and nodded toward the chairs, a small table between them. He handed Shane a cup of coffee, and though it was already 70 degrees, he took a sip of the boiling hot liquid. You make great coffee, he said as he sat. Hmm. Kurt never said much during their time on the front porch, that had always been okay with Shane, today included. I know we split the workload so we're both not working 80 hours a week, he said. But I was wondering if I could take the bulk of my chores in the mornings now. So you can see Robin in the evenings. Shane couldn't deny it and didn't even want to. Yes, sir. Kurt finally looked fully at him. And she's reciprocating this time. Shane thought of all the kisses they'd shared yesterday his face heated and he lifted his coffee mug to his mouth to hide his smile. I think so. And what will you do when she leaves? I don't know, Shane admitted. In the back of his mind, he'd been toying with the idea of asking her to stay. But it felt impossible, as he had nowhere to provide for her to stay, and she'd already said her ex-boyfriend had wanted her to give up her job 
and she couldn't do it. He wanted her to stay in Texas, so that wasn't a problem. But simply wanting her to stay was. I'm getting help for my anger issues, he said next. That's good. They sat in silence until cowboys started coming out of the other cabins, until the coffee was gone. Kurt put his mug on the table between them and stood. I'll take afternoons and evenings. He looked at Shane. Be careful with yourself, okay? Shane stood too, glad for his powerful friendship between him and Kurt. I really like her. I know that. I may be an old man, but I've seen you around her for three years now. He clapped his hand on Shane's shoulder. I just don't want you to give her too much of yourself and then be devastated when she leaves. Because Shane, she will leave. Shane nodded, his jaw tightening as Kurt's hand fell away, and as he gave Shane a sympathetic look before walking down the steps and on over to the ranch outbuildings. Shane stayed on the porch for a few more minutes, Kurt's promise rotating through his mind. She will leave. She will leave. And he knew the other foreman was right. Robin's whole existence could be packed up in a race from a place in a matter of hours, and he was a fool to think she'd find a way to make room for him in that tiny house of hers. Hey, Dylan called from the porch next door. There you are. I didn't hear you come in last night. Shane set his mug on the table next to Kurt's and went down the steps in tandem with his brother next door. Sorry, I didn't want to wake you guys. So he'd stayed out late with Robin. They'd come back to her house and she'd open the skylights in her loft. They'd lain on their backs, him on the floor and her on the bed, and watch the stars wink to life as darkness surrounded them. So, his brother said, everyone's saying you and Miss Robin. Yeah, Shane said. I was going to tell you. Oh, please. Dylan laughed and adjusted his cowboy hat. I've known you've had a crush on her forever. Don't make a big deal out of this. They started walking across the grass and past the flagpole, their feet finally meeting a gravel path that led out of the cowboy commons and toward the barns, arenas, and the stables of the ranch. Why not? Do you know how hard it is to meet a woman when you work on this ranch? Dylan looked at him with wide eyes. We're all jealous you've snatched up the only one we've seen in a month. Shane laughed, the sound somewhat foreign as it left his mouth and filled the sky. In that case, make sure you tell all the boys she's taken. And while Shane knew no one could ever own Robin, that she would never be caged like that, he also didn't want any of the other men on the ranch to think she was available. Besides, you dating someone is a big deal, Dylan said. Do you know how many times you've told me you'd never get married? I've never said that. Have, too, about a thousand times, Dylan insisted. And trust me, I get it. What Dad did was cruel. I guess. I guess I'm just surprised, that's all. Don't be, Shane said, a measure of negativity returning to his gut. He paused outside the hay barn where he'd be working that day. I'm not going to marry Robin. No? Shane shook his head, the truth of it sinking deep, deep, deep into his soul. No, Dylan. She's not the marrying type. What does that mean? It means she doesn't ever want to get married. He pulled open the door with more force than he intended, but it was somewhat satisfying to hear the loud clunk it made when it connected with the wall. He strode inside, leaving his brother behind so he wouldn't say anything else he might regret later. Chapter 14 Robin scraped her bangs off her forehead and pinched her fingers around the hoof. So then, we just foul down here. Exhaustion bled through her, but she kept her smile in place and made her voice as kind as possible when she explained to the mothers and daughters standing nearby what she was doing. The Sugar and Spice Ranch always had her care for the horses and then demo for the summer campers. She liked it, but not after the late nights she'd had with Shane for the past several evenings. Now that the weekend was here, they were getting off the ranch and heading south to Lukenbach for a big food truck festival. Robin liked to eat as much as the next person, and she couldn't wait to see how much Shane could pack away. All in all, she just enjoyed spending time with him, which is why she found herself yawning again when she should be focused on this trim and shoe. The horse she worked on, a palomino named Paisley, had a bit of Robin's free spirit, and she tried to pull her leg away. Every muscle in Robin's body bunched, and she worked to keep the 1,600-pound horse in place. But every horse herd had a leader, 
and Paisley was clearly the pack leader in this herd. She nickered her displeasure about what Robin was doing, and she said, Just one more, girl. Hold still. She explained what she was doing with the nails, and she hammered the last few pieces in place. Then we just need to file it. She placed Paisley's almost done hoof on the metal piece and grabbed the file. The sooner she got this job done, the happier everyone would be, Paisley included. She finished, and the girls in their mother's clap. Robin grinned at all of them and answered all their questions. Patsy, the horse coordinator at Sugar and Spice, approached in her denim jeans and a pink and white checkered shirt. Robin grinned at her and wiped the sweat from her face. Great job, Patsy said. I think this is always the thing the moms love most about their week here. You always say that, but I'm not sure I believe you. Robin untied her apron and folded the leather. No, really. They're in all that someone actually does what you do. Robin had heard it all before. Her job was unique, she supposed. But really, it was just nail clipping on a huge horse hoof. So I'll be back tomorrow to do the rest of the horses. Patsy smiled at her and handed her an envelope. Yep, it's good to see you again, Robin. What are you up to these days? Robin had so much more to say than ever before. Instead of spilling all her personal secrets, she said, Oh, you know, same old things. I heard you sold your house and temple. Robin nodded, glad that it was what she'd heard and not something about a certain cowboy. Yeah, it wasn't a good fit anymore. I travel so much, so... She shrugged like anyone would have given up their comfortable home in a good neighborhood to live in a house on wheels. Do you like your new place? I do. She started packing up her tools, not wanting to be rude, but not really in the mood for small talk. Did y'all hear that I got engaged? Robin nearly dropped the heavy file on her toe. Her steel-toed boots would have saved her, but still. She met Patsy's twinkling eyes and a grin pulling at her mouth. I didn't hear that, no. Patsy waggled her left-hand fingers, and Robin took them in her hand to examine the diamond. Wow, well, Patsy, he's a lucky guy. Oh, well, I've been with him forever. Dante? Surprise coded the two syllables. But last summer you said you were breaking things off with him. I tried. Patsy waved her hand as if such a notion was ridiculous. But we kept getting back together. She giggled and looked at her ring finger. We'll get married over Thanksgiving. Sounds amazing, Robin said, finishing with her tools. She was just going to walk away. Tuck the envelope with her money in it and walk away. Instead, something tugged her back to Patsy. How did you know you... I mean, why don't I? Patsy admired her ring a moment longer. I don't know. I just knew we'd always be together. Even when you'd broken up. Patsy nodded. He was just the one for me. And what will you guys do? Do? You know, after you're married. You have a place here on the ranch, don't you? Robin had known Patsy for a decade, and she indeed knew that Patsy's family owned this ranch and that Patsy had her own house here. Yeah, I do. He'll probably move out here with me. Wasn't he some sort of mechanic? Motorcycles. He works in a shop in town. Town here was Kerrville, about a 20-mile trip from the Sugar and Spice Ranch. Robin nodded. The details of how Patsy and Dante would live after they'd gotten married, absolutely none of her business. Thanks again, Patsy. She gave the other woman a hug and said, I love your shirt. Where'd you get it? Well, I'm lying somewhere, she said, already looking at her phone. This is my daddy. I have to go. See you again real soon, Robin. She swiped on the call, her face already aglow and the conversation hadn't even started yet. Robin watched her for a few moments as she strode away. She was tall, strong, confident. She ran all the affairs of the horses on this ranch, and there were well over fifty of them. She was engaged. She had two loving parents. Robin wasn't sure if she was more jealous or more relieved that she didn't have those things. As she headed back to her truck, where she could blessedly turn on the air conditioning, she looked at her naked left ring finger. She wondered what kind of diamond Shane could afford and what her hand might feel like with more weight on it. She tossed her tools and aprons in the back of the truck and climbed behind the wheel, starting the vehicle so she could get some cool air on her skin. Is Shane the one? she asked. Who she was asking, she wasn't quite sure. Herself? Maybe. God? Maybe him, too. While she'd never been particularly religious, she wasn't against the idea of a supreme being. As she drove the miles back to Grapeseed Ranch, 
She planned her outfit for the food truck extravaganza that night, sang along to the radio, and anticipated the next time she could kiss Shane. That happened the moment he walked through her front door, smelling like musky cologne and looking good enough to eat, even without his cowboy hat. The moment between them was flirty and fun, and Robin's smile seemed stuck to her face permanently. So what are we eating tonight? He asked, slinging his arm around her shoulders as they walked to his truck. The cabin community sat far enough from the main homestead to make it a healthy walk, and he'd always driven over as if they were going somewhere. Who knows, she said. There's something like 60 food trucks at this thing. The website said 82. There you go. She waited while he opened the door for her, but she paused before climbing into the cab. This thing between us feels right, don't you think? Robin needed some sort of validation, and she didn't even know why. Dr. Cecily Smith had received one message from Robin, and while she had contacted her within the 12-hour time frame, Robin hadn't known what else to say. Shane gazed down at her. It feels great. He dipped his head and kissed her, a slow union that left Robin with fog in her brain. He'd kissed her like this before, and she was starting to recognize the ways he'd showed her how much he liked her. The kiss in her house had been full of giggles and fun, a uh, wow, I haven't seen you for a whole day kind of kiss. Sometimes he kissed her quick, like he just needed one more taste before going home. Sometimes his mouth was a bit harder, more insistent. Those kisses were filled with passion, and they said, I cannot get enough of you. And then he kissed her with soft lips that hung on, almost hungering for more but not taking it. This was her favorite kind of kiss, because it told her that Shane liked her. Could he love her? This particular kiss, as it lingered between them, certainly felt that way. He pulled away. So, he cleared his throat. Should we go eat? Robin kept her eyes closed, savoring the nearness of him and the way so much love swirled through her body. Her eyes popped open. Could she love him? She found him watching her, a strange look on his face she couldn't identify before he turned and walked around the front of the truck. She felt woozy, like her legs couldn't support her weight, as she turned and got in the truck. Country music filled the silence between them on the quick drive down to Lukenbach. Robin enjoyed the fact that she didn't always have to have something to say, that they could be together without much going on and still be comfortable. When they arrived at the food truck festival, she marveled at the size of it. Oh, wow! Have you never been to this? he asked. I've heard about it. She gazed at the rows and rows of parking while Shane inched down one aisle, searching for a spot. But I've never been. She twisted toward him. I guess what they say is true. Everything is bigger in Texas. He laughed and swung the truck into a spot that seemed too small for even a sedan. Somehow he made his truck fit as they walked back to the enormous area laden with trucks, two stages for entertainment, tables, and more people than Robin had ever seen in one place. He tucked his hand into hers, too. As they sampled nachos, tacos, chili, and some of the best fried pickles Robin had ever tasted, she kept the exhaustion at bay by sheer willpower. The back of her throat itched, and she tried to quell the feeling with raspberry lemonade and then honeyed sweet tea. The noise and swell of the crowd made her stomach swoop as she turned down Shane's offer of a churro. He ordered one, and while he waited, he said, You ready to go? She nodded, the motion making her brain slosh around in her skull. I don't feel well. He pulled her into a side and pressed his lips to her temple. I'll take you home. With his steadying presence beside her and the delicious scent of cinnamon and sugar, she made it back to the truck. He stayed by her side all the way into her tiny house, and he filled a glass of water and presented her with ibuprofen as she sat on the couch and kneaded her forehead. Thanks. She managed to smile at him, realizing how close he crouched to her. The moment stilled, stopped and her hand seemed suspended in midair as she reached out to cradle his face in her palm. He closed his eyes in bliss, and it felt like it took forever. In that lengthened time, Robin saw his love for her, felt it all the way down inside her very soul. And it was huge, and all-encompassing, and the very thing that normally would have scared her right out of town. But as he sighed and leaned into her touch, all she felt was the same love for him. She tipped forward, whispered, Can I kiss you even if I'm sick? I'm willing to take the risk, he 
murmured, enjoying the shape of his face in her hand, the wild cowboy smell of his skin, and the sweet taste of his mouth. Robin kissed him in that soft, slow way, so he'd know how much she adored him. She broke the connection sooner than she would have liked, and leaned her forehead against Shane's. I'm not scared, she whispered. He knelt down in front of her now, his body between her knees, and he nestled his face in the hollow of her throat. His strong arms stayed around her as he breathed, and the wisps of air against her collarbone sensual and welcome. I should go, he finally said, his voice thick. Let you rest. We've had a busy week. He started to stand, but Robin stopped him with two fingers against the side of his neck. Their eyes met, and a powerful heated moment moved between them. It's been a great day, she said. Thank you. Day fourteen, he said, and she suddenly hated how he had the days numbered. Maybe I won't leave at day thirty-five, she said, her voice tightening and choking on the last word. She coughed, and she lifted the glass from where he'd set it on the floor after she'd taken the painkillers. He simply watched her as she drank, took the glass back into the kitchen, and paused at the front door. I'm headed out to the eastern sections tomorrow, he said, but I'll call you when I get back, all right? She closed her eyes and nodded, seriously considering just sleeping right here on the couch, though it was barely dark. All right. She was aware of him slipping out of her house, aware of her little dog curling up on her left foot, and then she fell asleep with the hope that the medicine she'd taken would work all night. Chapter 15 Shane's phone rang, again, and he ignored it. Robin had been sick with a head cold for a few days, and he checked all the calls, thinking one would be her, asking him to bring her something to eat, more medicine, or just to come over and keep her company while she slept. She'd done all of those things over the past few days, but it wasn't her calling, and he knew it. His father had called four times this morning already, and Shane simply wasn't in the mood. He wished Austin hadn't gone into the Fourth of July German pancake feast hosted by the Grape Seed Falls Fire Department. Then he could tell Shane what their dad wanted. Maybe you haven't made as much progress as you thought, he told himself as his phone finally stopped buzzing in his pocket. He yanked on the hose to get more slack as he moved to the next trough. Horses didn't care if it was a holiday, cows either. They needed to be fed and cared for, no matter if it was Independence Day or not. If Robin was feeling up to it, they had plans to go to the fireworks show later that night at Lady Bird Johnson Park. He loved the park, as it was one of the first places he'd gotten to know when he'd first come to town. It had a swimming pool, tennis courts, and hiking trails. He'd seen people get married there, celebrate birthdays there, enjoy time with their families. He'd always gone with other cowboys, and it seemed the park put off an air of belonging no matter who came to it, no matter what reason. Tonight, the open fields would be filled with blankets as people came together to celebrate, and Shane sure hoped Robin would be feeling better. The past few days had been hard for her, as she still had a schedule to maintain, and couldn't really afford to take time off. People counted on her to come whether she was sneezing or not. Horses, too. Shane couldn't help feeling like the days he had left with her were slipping away, right through his fingers like smoke. He finished filling one trough and moved to the next one, this one for the colts that had been born in the spring. What do I do? He begged the Lord. Something that had been happening more and more lately. He didn't want to watch Robin walk out of his life in only seventeen days. With a jolt, he realized that today was the halfway point of her stay here on the ranch. Day eighteen. What do I do to keep her? He whispered as if the two horses now drinking in front of him would answer, or worse, spread his question all over the ranch. He spent so much of his time and energy trying to keep things together, he should be able to figure this out too. After all, he'd kept his brothers together after everything had fallen apart. He kept his mother from getting hurt too badly financially. If he'd wanted to, he could have kept his relationship with his father on good terms too so he just needed to figure out how to keep Robin in his life when day 35 came. He finished watering the livestock and retreated into the tack room. No one was scheduled to go out today, and he'd have some privacy behind these walls. He opened his Talk to Me app and hailed Dr. Sloan. The man had helped Shane a lot over the past week or so, but he needed more. So, my dad keeps calling and I can't answer the phone. Should I? I know it's just going to make me mad, and I don't want to be mad today. He 
He sent the message and immediately began typing out another one. I'm also dating someone, and she's set to leave in only a couple of weeks. I'm desperate. He stared at the word, trying to think of a more positive one. He couldn't. He was desperate. So he left the word and kept going. I'm desperate to keep her in my life, and I just don't know how. She's a free spirit, and I'm afraid if I ask her to stay, she'll leave forever. If I just... Just what? He wondered. He stared at the sentence, at a loss for how to finish it. So he sent it as it was. Act like I don't love her? Pretend like I don't care if she leaves? Shane exhaled and tipped his head toward the ceiling. I love her, Lord. What should I do? His phone beeped, a sound specifically for the Talk to Me app. With pure frustration and absolute desperation pulling through him, tears gathered in his eyes as he bent to look at his phone again. Dr. Sloan had messaged. Do you have time for a phone call? Yes. Ten seconds later, his phone rang and Shane swiped the call on. Hello, Dr. Sloan. Morning, Shane. The man had a pleasant, deep voice that never varied. He never acted like Shane was putting him out, even on a holiday. I thought a call would be better. Is it okay? Absolutely fine. So, let's begin with your father. Shane sighed and ran his gaze along the saddles hanging on the wall. If we have to. I think you should answer the call, Dr. Sloan said. This could be the exact closure you need. I don't want to be friends with him. I know that, and you don't have to be. What I'm saying is, maybe it's time to talk to him again, even if it's painful. Maybe then you can close that chapter of your life. Maybe then that anger you harbor can be released. Maybe. So much depended on what his father would say, and Shane hated that he didn't know why he was calling. You have to let go of it at some point, Dr. Sloan said, and it wasn't the first time he'd told Shane such a thing. Perhaps a phone call would allow you to do that. I'll think about it, Shane said, making a decision on the spot. If his father called again, he'd answer the phone. After all, if he called five times in one day, it must be something important, right? All right, that's all I can ask of you. So let's talk about your girlfriend. Why is she leaving in a couple of weeks? Shane explained about Robin, her job, her tiny house, and their somewhat crooked road to where they were now. And I... I'm in love with her, and I don't think I can let her go this time. Have you told her any of that? No. Like I messaged... I think it'll push her farther away, not bring her closer. Could give her something to think about. It could, but sometimes when Robin had too much to think about, she chose not to. She chose to leave so she wouldn't have to. I don't know her, Dr. Sloan said, but I have a pretty good idea of who you are, Shane. You're a hard worker, a good man. If you're in love with her, is it possible that she's in love with you too? Shane replayed his last kiss with Robin a few days ago in her house while he knelt before her and she fondled his face. It's possible, he admitted. She'd even said, I'm not afraid, though he supposed she could have been talking about transferring her germs to him. He hadn't gotten sick, so the kiss had been worth the risk. She has other jobs, though, he said, and she won't give them up to stay here with me when there's nothing for her to do. So find something for her to do. Dr. Sloan made it sound so simple. Duane wouldn't hire her full-time, as his operation was 99% cattle. Sure, he might want more horses, but not enough to employ a farrier, especially one as skilled and highly trained as Robin, full-time. All right, he said with a note of sarcasm in his voice. Shane, if you want her to stay, she probably just needs one reason, especially if you think she could be in love with you, too. Find that reason. Find that reason. Shane echoed. Footsteps sounded outside the tack room, and he poked his head into the hall to see Kirk coming his way. I have to go, Dr. Sloan. Thanks so much for calling. He hung up just as Kurt met his eye. Hey, what are you doing here? Shane lifted his phone. Talking? What's up? He pocketed his phone. I got all the livestock fed and watered already. He watched as Kurt opened Lucy's stall. Yep, great. Felicity just wants to go for a ride this morning. He cut a glance at Shane. She's not doing well. May thinks we should do something for her. Like what? Shane loved Duane and Felicity, 
and he couldn't imagine the pain they were going through at having to deal with not being able to have a family when they wanted one. Oh, you know May. She thinks food will fix everything. Cake, specifically. Kurt smiled, but it didn't hold its usual humor. He stepped into the tack room to retrieve Felicity's saddle. When he returned, the grin had faded from his face, only to be replaced by a frown. But Felicity doesn't seem to be eating much at all, not even cake. Shane didn't know how to help her, or Duane. I'll start thinking of something we could do. Robin's been over there, helping with the garden the last few days. She has. Duane says she's coughing all over the cabbage, but yeah. Shane looked west, toward the homestead, like he'd be able to see through the barn walls and find Robin carefully moving vegetables out of the way as she searched out all the weeds. I could take my brothers over and make sure their yard is always kept up. I already offered that. Duane said he likes doing it. Something different from the ranch. Gives him time to think. That kind of thing. Kurt finished saddling Lucy and took the reins in his hand. Come on, girl. Let's go see your ma. He took the horse down the aisle, leaving Shane with yet another thing to think about. He had thirty seconds to think about heading back to his cabin and making breakfast when his phone rang. Again. Adrenaline spiked and his stomach fell, an uncomfortable sensation that left him a touch dizzy. He pulled his phone from his pocket and saw his father's name on the screen. Five times, he muttered. The line rang again. He didn't answer. His heart thundered in his chest. Another ring. One more and the call would go to voicemail. Shane took a deep breath and swiped open the call, ending his fifteen-year silent treatment with the words, Hey, Dad. A long bout of silence came over the phone, so long that Shane frowned and checked to see if the call was still connected. It was. Hello? I just wasn't expecting you to answer. His father's voice triggered something in Shane he hadn't been expecting, and his chest hitched. He wanted to speak and couldn't. His dad seemed to be having the same problem, because neither of them said a word. Finally, his father said, It's so good to hear your voice. Shane's eyes felt so hot, and he hated that he was almost crying for the second time that day. When had he become so soft, so sentimental? You too. He managed to squeeze through his throat. He left the stables in favor of the fresh air and the wider sky. He needed clarity of thought, and he needed time to sort through his tangled emotions. Thankfully, there was nowhere better than Texas to do exactly that. Your mother said you were dating someone, he said, and every defense Shane had flew sky high. That's why you called? And when do you talk to Mom? His dad sighed, and Shane put the brakes on his anger. I mean, I didn't know you talked to Mom. Of course we talk, his dad said. We have three sons and a history together. History, Shane almost snorted. Yeah, they had a history all right. Still, he marveled that his mother had found the patience and forgiveness to speak to her ex-husband after what he'd done to her and their family. I called because I wanted to apologize for everything. Shane's jaw tightened and he asked, What's everything exactly, Dad? I know we all lost a lot. No, Dad, you didn't lose anything you wanted to keep. Mom lost everything. The house, her friends, her spouse. I lost everything. The ranch I'd worked on for decades. My home, my livelihood. You, you didn't lose anything. Shane tasted the bitterness in his words. But as I left his body, he didn't harbor so much ill will anymore. You weren't around when we sold off everything we could to pay your debts. You weren't there when I moved Mom from the home where she'd lived for four decades of her life into a condo. You aren't here when I sent her money every month. So I'm really interested, Dad, in knowing exactly what you think you lost that was so precious to you. His father didn't say anything. That's what I thought, Shane said. He couldn't believe his father had called five times on a single morning to stay silent. Look. I don't have time to talk right now. Maybe you can text Austin. He still seems interested in knowing you. At that moment, Shane realized why he was so angry, why he'd been carrying this furious load around for 15 years. Along with everything else he'd lost, he'd also lost his father and best friend, a man he once admired and aspired to be exactly like. And he hated that the man's blood ran in his veins, that he had the potential to do what his father had done. You don't know me, 
His father said so quietly Shane wasn't sure he'd spoken or if the breeze had whipped up. You're right, I don't. Shane took a deep breath. And honestly, Dad, I don't really want to know you. I don't want to think you're happy and thriving when I'm still paying for the choices you made. He thought of Robin and how he didn't even have somewhere for the two of them to live. She has a house. The words were right there in his mind, but he dismissed them. He wanted to be the one to provide for her, give her somewhere to plant her roots. What are you talking about? That woman I'm dating. I have nothing to offer her. I work someone else's ranch, living in a cabin meant for two with the three of us. Why would she even want me? He shook his head, more realizations rolling over him. I really can't do this right now. My counselor said I should talk to you. But man, I knew I'd feel this way. You're in counseling. Another thing I'm paying for because of your decisions. I messed up, Dad, and it's your fault. Shane took a big breath, his voice about to break. It's your fault. It did crack that time, and the tears did fill his eyes. He didn't care. There was no one around to see. And his father should have known all this time the hurt, the pain, the furious injustice his actions had caused his sons. I'm so sorry, Shane. It was nice to hear, Shane would admit, but the apology also didn't fix anything. It wouldn't erase the $25 he had to pay Dr. Sloan for the phone call this morning, and it wouldn't miraculously provide him with a big house in which he and Robin could raise a family. I'm sorry, too, he said. I have to go. He hung up before his dad could say anything else. He let his arm drop to his side, the phone still clutched tightly in his fingers. He closed his eyes and tipped his chin toward the sky, letting the sunlight paint over his face with heat and light. Help me let go of this anger, he prayed. Instead of the peaceful, filling sensation Shane had hoped for, a scream ripped through the sky. His eyes popped open, his heart pounded, and his feet already moved in the direction of the sound. Please don't let it be Dylan or Austin, he prayed. Not only because he didn't want more medical bills he couldn't pay, but because he didn't think he could handle watching another brother suffer through something right now, then he felt like a jerk, hoping it wasn't someone related to him. He didn't want it to be anyone on the ranch, or Robin. No one screamed again, and he couldn't see anything in the pastures between the barn and the homestead. The radio on his hip sounded with, Dwayne, Kurt, Shane, it's Chadwell. The coyotes have been here, and Miss Robin found the evidence. Relief poured through Shane that the casualty wasn't a human being, but he still wanted to reach Robin as fast as possible. Judging by the scream, she'd been pretty upset. Where? He barked into the radio. Her house. It was her dog the coyotes got. Chapter 16 Robin couldn't stop crying. Liquid leaked from every hole in her head, and she just couldn't stop. Come on now, someone said, and she looked up into the concerned face of Shane. His eyes swept the cement pad at the bottom of the steps, taking in the same scene Robin had seen, the same sight that had torn the scream from her lips. His arms came around her and she collapsed into his hold, sobbing against his chest. She became aware of the movement around her, the sound of running water, and men talking. Shane walked her backward, away from her tiny house, humming in her ear the whole time. I, I thought she was in, inside, Robin said. She's too little to come up the steps. I ha have to carry her. She wiped at her eyes, but they kept on dripping tears. She hiccuped and she hated this out-of-control feeling bouncing around inside her. It's all right, Shane said. You didn't know. Robin couldn't make sense of her emotions, her sense of loss. I've had her for three years. I know, sweetheart, he said. Though he couldn't know how long she'd had Misfit, she hadn't told him that. Misfit was a good little pup. She appreciated that he didn't mention getting another dog, that he couldn't believe she'd fallen apart over a six-pound animal. Robin had reduced her life to almost nothing, but it had never crossed her mind to get rid of Misfit. They were the same, she and the dog, outcasts, people and pets no one wanted. Shane drew her back into his chest and rubbed her back. It's okay, love. It's going to be okay. Robin wasn't sure how that could ever be true, but she held on to Shane until she was sure she could stand on her own. Finally, she stepped back but kept her head down. She was in serious need of a tissue in her solitude. 
The itch to leave this ranch and never come back crept forward. Shane extended a tissue to her and she worked up the nerve to look at him. How do you always have exactly what I need, exactly when I need it? She took the tissue and wiped her nose and then her eyes. Luck. He settled his weight away from her. Robin didn't think it was luck. She thought she'd very much like to be wherever Shane was, even in California, if that was where he felt called. I'm so sorry about Misfit. Dwayne approached and Robin caught the look he exchanged with Shane. It's my fault, she said. I thought I'd brought her in last night and I apparently didn't. The little dog couldn't even go up and down the steps by herself. How had Robin forgotten about her? Her eyes rounded when the pieces started falling into place. She had taken Misfit out to take care of her business, and Shane had texted. She'd gotten caught up in the flurry of messages after that, and she'd wandered back inside by herself. He wore such a look of agony that, though it was her dog that had been killed, she couldn't bear to tell him it was his messages that had distracted her. Felicity started breakfast at the homestead, Duane said. Why don't you come on over there this morning? Okay, Robin said, a numb feeling starting in her chest. Duane gave Shane another look and wandered away, and Shane scanned Robin. You want to go get dressed first? He shuffled his feet away from her as horror snaked through her. Yeah, yes. She folded her arms across her penguin t-shirt and hurried back to her house. She tried not to look at the wet cement, tried not to see the echo of Misfit's broken body. But she blinked and saw it all, though nothing remained. After hurrying up the steps the cowboy had cleaned for her, she practically crashed through the front door and slammed it closed behind her. After changing out of her black shorts and pajama shirt, she pulled on a pair of cutoffs and the red, white, and blue plaid shirt she'd been planning to wear. She bypassed the red sandal she'd probably wear that night and slipped into her flip-flops instead. Shane waited at the picnic table outside her front door, his head in his hands. Hey, she said. You okay? He jolted like she'd connected his body to a source of electricity. He wore his exhaustion in the crinkle lines around his eyes as he tried to put on a smile for her. I'm great. He reached for her hand and clasped it in his. Now. He grounded her too, but she couldn't tell him. Not right now. As they walked across the grass toward the back door of the homestead, she said, So will you take me to the animal shelter to find a new dog? Really? You want a new dog already? Robin slowed her step as the deck came into view. I don't like living alone. Shane stopped completely and stared at her, the wheels in his head turning mightily if the curious look in his bright eyes was any indication. What? she asked. Well... I don't rightly know how to make that line up with what I know about you. What you thought you knew about me. She bumped him with her hip and tugged on his hand to get him moving along. Seriously, Robin, I thought you wanted to be alone. Who wants to be alone? Women who buy tiny houses with the intention of driving them all over the state and only stopping when they feel like it. Robin felt like someone had dumped a load of quick-drying cement on her feet. She stared up at Shane. I have jobs all over Texas. He sighed. I know that. I'm just saying that I'm surprised to hear you don't like living alone when all the evidence points to the contrary. So I'll go to the shelter myself. I'm sure I can find it. I have no doubt you can. He swept his fingers along her brow line, the touch electrifying and sweet at the same time. But I'll take you tomorrow if you want. Maybe I'll get a cat, she said, eliciting a snort from Shane, exactly what she knew he'd do. A cat is not a pet. He said, they're an accident waiting to happen. My mom loves her cats. You've just solidified my point. She climbed a few steps to the deck and turned back to him. With the extra height, she looked right into his eyes. Maybe we could pick out the dog together. She searched his expression for his reaction, but all she got was a blink. Together? Yeah, you know, something we can both live with. I think you said you wanted a bigger dog last time we talked about it. He looked like she'd splashed ice water in his face. And then he relaxed. Yeah. All right. All right. Robin leaned into Shane and hugged him. I miss Misfit already, but thank you for being here. He squeezed her and whispered. Nowhere I'd rather be. Robin still felt the tiniest bit shaky inside, but she extracted herself from Shane's embrace and turned to face the homestead. All right. Breakfast. You think you can eat? Probably not. She took a step toward the doorway anyway. But I don't want to be alone. 
The thought surprised her. She wasn't alone. Shane would let her stay by his side all day if she wanted. He'd feed her lunch and take her to dinner, and then the fireworks show. She knew he would. And while he was enough for her, she wanted the bustling energy of a kitchen full of people, the smell of bacon and maple syrup, and easy conversation. For the first time in her life, Robin wanted a family. A family that had more than two people in it. As he reached past her to open the door for her, she looked up at him and said, You're making it really easy to fall in love with you. She waited for him to say something, but he just stood there and stared at her. Robin cleared her throat and forced a laugh through the narrow opening. Okay, shouldn't have said that. I'm already in love with you, he whispered, his voice hoarse and husky and a whole octave lower than she'd ever heard. There you are. Dwayne came rushing forward, and Robin looked at him as more emotion than she knew how to deal with slammed into her, hard. May was about to march over and get you herself. Come on in. Don't make the pregnant woman mad. I'm not mad, May yelled from around the corner. She appeared and put both hands on her hips. But I'm gonna be if you guys don't get in here right now. Oven pancakes should be served hot, and they already came out. Robin looked back at Shane, whose throat worked against the swallow. He gestured for her to go first, and she had little choice but to join Duane, who watched them with worry in his eyes. When did I interrupt? He asked. Nothing, Shane said, stepping into the house so close behind Robin that his body heat mingled with hers. Nothing at all, boss. Oh, how much of a liar was he? Her heart bumped around in her chest, never quite settling into a regular beat. It kept saying things like, Shane loves you. Shane la la loves you. He loves you, loves you, loves you. He wouldn't look directly at her, but no one seemed to be doing that. Robin couldn't very well shout her feelings for him into a room full of cowboys, so she loaded her plate with food she couldn't force herself to eat and tried not to look like she'd just been told the most magical words in the world. Shane went back to work after a leisurely breakfast. Robin stayed at the homestead and helped clean up. Then she braved the intense heat and went out to work in the garden. Eventually, she had to go home and freshen up for the celebrations that evening. Shane sat on the picnic table when she came out, her hair braided into two pigtails. He flipped one of them and said, This is new. Believe it or not, I don't always pull my hair into a ponytail. I like it. He moved toward his truck without taking her hand in his, or putting his arm around her, so she claimed him by slipping next to his side and snaking her hand along his waist. He grinned down at her before helping her up into the truck. A great big something sat between them, and Robin knew exactly what it was. Three little words. I love you. She supposed she'd heard six words. I'm already in love with you. They meant the same thing, but he didn't seem to want to talk about them. Instead, he said, I talked to my dad this morning. Robin choked on her own breath. You did? What did you say? Shane looked out his window, concealing his face from her. A lot of stuff I wish I hadn't. Really? She leaned forward and peered at him. Shane? She reached over and touched his elbow. Really? He flicked her a look. Really, really? Well, what did you say? Chapter 17 Shane didn't want to go into details about the conversation from that morning. I said a lot of stuff I've been thinking for 15 years. He wasn't sure if Robin would judge him or accept what had happened. Uh, oddly. I felt better after unloading on him. Do you think it'll help? He scoffed. No, I don't think so. I don't think he understands the full repercussions of his actions. He didn't need to detail that he told his father that he had nothing to offer Robin. What would that help? Nothing, he told himself. He had, however, followed Dr. Sloan's advice and told Robin he loved her. That big old admission hung between them, and they hadn't been able to talk about it. He wanted to bring it up, but at the same time he just wanted to eat hot dogs and chips and stretch out on a blanket and listen to the bluegrass band until the fireworks started. He'd said it. She'd heard him. She could do with the information what she wanted. But you feel better? A little, yeah. Shane repositioned his fingers on the steering wheel. It was nice to let go of some things I've been holding on to for too long. It's hard to let things go. 
Yeah, Shane knew better than most. Who else would have perpetuated their three-year crush on a woman they saw once a year? Most men would have moved on a long time ago. Probably after that first time she threw his dinner invitation back in his face. All right. He turned into the parking lot at Lady Bird Johnson Park and swung into a spot. I'm ready for chocolate cake and barbecue chips, preferably in the same bite. Robin giggled and slid across the seat to jump down from the truck after him. That's sick. Sweet and salty and savory, he said. It's delicious. Wait, you've actually had chocolate cake with barbecue potato chips? No. He chuckled and dodged out of her reach as she swatted at him. But it sounds really good. They held hands and wandered around the festivities at the park. He got his hot dogs and his chips and his cake. And sweet tea and then popcorn while they waited for the sun to darken enough to start the fireworks. Then he got to lie on that blanket the way he wanted to and hold Robin close to his heart and kiss her as the first blue fireworks exploded against the black backdrop of the sky. And though it had started badly, Shane decided day 18 with Robin was the best one yet. Four days later, Shane was counting. After all, he finally got his chores done before six o'clock at night. The stars had aligned because Robin had texted that her job at Sunnyside Farms had ended early. He pulled up to the shelter only moments before she parked beside him, and she squealed as he swept her into his arms. Wow, you're a sight for sore eyes. He didn't mind that she smelled like metal and fire and horse. It was one of the most alluring scents to him, actually. He kissed her and pressed his forehead against hers. Those three little words bubbled against the back of his throat. But he didn't dare say them again. She hadn't brought up his confession, and he felt like he'd put the ball in her court. Let's go find us a dog, he said, and she practically skipped to the entrance. The scent of bleach mixed with animal hit him, and he almost turned right back around. So, nothing too big, she said. The whole house is under 300 square feet. I'm aware. If they spent time together in the evenings, it was usually at her house. He couldn't find more than ten seconds of privacy at his cabin, though she seemed to enjoy spending time with his brothers as much as she seemed to like kissing him. A staff member led them to the medium-sized dogs, and Robin started reading name cards, which included ages and breeds and known health problems. What's a Sheltie? she asked, crouching down in front of the long-haired black-and-white dog. It's a Shetland sheepdog, Shane said, bending to look at the dog, too. He's pretty. The Sheltie had a broad white chest with classic gold markings on his cheeks, which faded into a black halo around his head and ears and all the way down his back and tail. I like him, Robin held out her hand and the Sheltie inched forward to sniff her. Can we see him out of the kennel? Joan, the staff member, came forward with a set of keys and she let the Sheltie out of his kennel. We just got him, she said as the dog inched forward. That's a good sign, Shane said. He's not afraid. He's a good pup, Joan bent down and patted him. His name is Arthur. Arthur, Robin said in the Sheltie cocked his head at her. She looked at Shane, and he could read the hope in her eyes before she said, Please? He waved at the dog. How much does he weigh? Joan looked at him like that was a bizarre question to ask. She lives in a tiny house, he explained. Well, he doesn't take up much room. Yeah, but her house is 280 square feet. Shane said, enjoying the way Joan's eyes widened. Total. He's much bigger than my previous dog, Robin said, kneeling down and scrubbing her hand along Arthur's back. The dog practically purred, and Shane shook his head. I don't think it matters how big he is, Shane said. She wants him, so we'll take him. There's some adoption paperwork, Joan said, and Shane nodded. As they went back out to the lobby, Shane muttered, Well... That didn't take long. What can I say? She danced in front of him, pure joy radiating from her face. I know what I like when I see it. Oh, is that so? Is that why you wouldn't go out with me the first time I asked? He caught Joan looking at them before she bent to pull open a filing drawer. Yes, that's exactly why, Robin said, a fibbing air about her. But you're taking the dog home with you. I didn't get to do that. She leaned into his side. I know what to do with the dog. Shane met her gaze, and while she was still flirty and fun, he also found a measure of seriousness there that was all too familiar. 
Men are about like dogs, he said. Feed us, let us sleep in your bed, and put us out sometimes. Joan snorted, and Shane gestured toward her. See, I'm totally right. Robin gave him a half-glare before turning to Joan. Are you married? Yes, ma'am. Twenty-four years to the same man. And is he right? You feed your husband, let him sleep in your bed, and then put him outside sometimes. She leaned her elbows up on the counter, standing on her tiptoes to do so, a flow about her that Shane found so sexy. He's about right. Joan slid the paperwork toward Robin as Shane laughed. Though sometimes dogs smell better. Robin's peeling laughter filled the shelter, and Shane shook his head at her. Come on now, I'm starving. The sooner we get this dog adopted, the sooner we can go to dinner. Oh, I'll need you to fill all this out. Joan pushed a pen closer. And you can't leave an animal in a car in this heat. Of course not, Robin said, shooting Shane a look. We would never do that. We'll drive through somewhere. Shane said nothing, but he had a feeling this Sheltie was about to change his life. For better or worse, he wasn't sure yet. Are we keeping the name? He asked. Of course, Robin said, the pen stalling on the paper. He knows his name, don't you, boy? Don't you? She dropped her voice to a sort of growly cartoonish tone before resuming the paperwork. We can train him to go by a new name, Shane said. I like Arthur. You do? You don't? It's all right, I guess. It's very royal, regal, kingly. She kept filling out the paperwork, and Shane decided to stop distracting her. He honestly didn't care what she named her dog, and he wandered over to the bulletin board to look at the items hanging there. If you're both adopting, you'll both need to sign. Shane spun back to the counter. We're both adopting? I told you this was our dog. Robin waggled the pen at him. Now come sign. Without much of a choice, he scribbled his name on the line. She paid the fee, and Joan handed him a leash with a pretty little sheltie on the end of it. All right, Arthur, he said, the name tripping against his tongue. Let's get you out to your new home. He led the dog through the door. It's a ranch, and there are a lot of animals. I think you'll like it. He's right, Robin said, talking to Arthur like he was a human and not a canine. You'll really like Grape Seed Ranch. Everyone does. He opened the passenger door and pointed to the interior of the cab. Load up. Arthur jumped up and in, and Robin beamed like he'd just solved global warming. She climbed up behind him and Shane rumbled. What have I got myself into? as he rounded the hood of the truck. Back at the ranch, she jumped down and said, Come on, Arthur, let's go explore your new house. Wait a second, he said. He's half my dog. Why do you get to take him on the first night? He got the reaction he wanted, open mouth, wide eyes, chest rising and falling as her breathing quickened. I'm kidding, he said with a chuckle, though I did partially adopt him. I suppose you can have overnight custody of him. He crouched in front of Arthur. Is that okay with you? I don't know if she snores, but I know my two brothers do, so you'll probably be happier here. You can have him during the day, she said. I bet he'd love to run with the other barn dogs. He's a herding breed, too, Shane said. I'll train him to move the cattle. He tussled the dog's ears and straightened. Well, I guess I'll let you two get settled. He swept his arm around her and drew her in for a proper kiss. All the things he carried around with him disappeared when he was kissing Robin. With her delicate, passionate touch, his courage increased, and he said, I love you, Robin. See you tomorrow, okay? Before stepping back and turning toward his truck. There, he'd said it again, and it felt so nice coming out of his mouth. It felt so good to love instead of hate and another piece of anger he'd been holding onto for so long melted away. Wait, Robin said, and he twisted back to her. Yeah? Her fingers wound up the leash she held, and then released it, twisted it, released it. He waited, because she'd asked him to, but she still didn't say anything. Chapter 18 Robin wanted to verbalize how she felt about Shane. She needed to. If she said, I love you too, would she have to stay here? She hadn't looked at her schedule, but she had two weeks from today before she had to be at Roundy Ranch in Round Rock, two hours away. 
She couldn't commute like that and work ten hours a day. But could she leave Shane here without telling him she loved him? Why couldn't she get her voice to work? Oh, you must want the dog food, Shane said, providing her with an easy way out of her stupid silence. Yes, dog food, she said, her voice thick and hardly her own. She waited for him to collect the twenty-five-pound bag of food they'd stopped to buy and carried up the steps to her front door. I gotta say, he said, dropping the bag in the corner of the kitchen. I think this dog is too big for your house. Where are you gonna put this? Robin was still trying to get Arthur past the threshold of the door. It was a step up from the wooden steps to the house, and he didn't seem to want to make the transition. She tugged on his leash. Come on, bud. This is your new home. Shane approached and Robin's heart bobbed to the back of her throat. Somehow he squeezed past her and the dog, saying, Bye, Robin. Bye, she called after him, her stomach clenching around the words she hadn't said. Arthur finally jumped into the house and Robin closed the door behind him. She hoped she wasn't shutting Shane out of her life. Could she text him? I love you. Don't be dumb, she muttered to herself. She busied herself by getting out two bowls for food and water and putting the bowls at the end of the counter in the small space between where the counter was and the front door opened. You'll eat right here, she said, glancing toward the living room and the couch. This is the living room. I have a couch and a lamp, and there's even a TV mounted on the back of the steps there. She pointed to the bathroom. Bathroom here, and I'll get you some bells so you can let me know when you need to go out. Shane will let you work with him during the day. She started up the steps, saying, Come on. When the Sheltie came with her, satisfaction pulled through Robin. He bounded up the steps and leapt onto the bed. Robin giggled. Yeah, you can sleep with me. That's about all we do up here. She bent as she reached the low loft ceiling. She collapsed on the bed, too, her muscles finally loosening and the weight of the day disappearing as Arthur circled and plopped right against her side. She stroked his fur glad for this new companion in her life. Her mind wandered down a new path, one where Shane shared this bed with her. Would he even fit up those narrow steps? He'd have to turn sideways to enter the bathroom, and she couldn't imagine trying to cook with two people in the kitchen. But she also knew he didn't own his own cabin, and that his job here, near his brothers with Dwayne and Kurt, was really important to him. He couldn't join her in this house as she jetted all over the state to shoe horses nor could she stay here and do nothing. What is going on? She asked the ceiling. Why didn't I just keep things professional between us? But she'd gotten involved, and she'd possibly fallen in love with a man she couldn't keep. Lying on her loft bed, Robin couldn't imagine a scenario where she didn't break Shane's heart in only thirteen days. She also couldn't see how she wouldn't leave Grape Seed Ranch utterly devastated. Just the thought of unhooking the plumbing and electricity and rolling away from this place made her heart cinch and everything in her recoil. She closed her eyes and took a deep breath. She'd been to church a time or two in her life, and she wondered if what the pastor she'd heard were right. Would God hear her prayer? Would he answer? Please, she whispered. I don't know what to do about Shane. I don't want to hurt him, and I feel like we should be together. She pulled her hand away as Arthur started licking it. Should we be together? A feeling of peace flowed over her, more comfort and warmth than she'd ever felt before. And while she hadn't necessarily experienced God's love for her previously, she felt sure that this was what she was feeling now. And she knew that she and Shane should be together. How? she begged. But God stayed silent on that one. The next thirteen days seemed to slip through Robin's fingers like water. Each day dawned with Arthur at her side. He ate while she did, and as soon as she opened the door, he leapt from the house straight to the cement steps and bounded into the yard to take care of his business. From there, she'd seek out Shane, who would take the dog during the day. It was nice to see him in the morning when she'd only been spending time with him in the evenings. She liked their morning kisses, their all-day texts, their evenings together. He told her he loved her every night before they separated, and Robin tried to show him how she felt about him. She prayed each night for help with what to say to Shane, help to find a permanent job near Grapeseed Falls, help to ease the transition that was coming. That was now here. 
Robin's fingers trembled as she tapped the top of the dog food bag closed so it wouldn't spill in transit. She hooked all the cupboards shut so they wouldn't open and dump her dishes all over the floor. After latching the living room cupboards and flushing all the water lines, Robin put the few books, magazines, and other loose items in a box and taped it closed. That went in the back of her truck, and she turned to find Shane standing on her cement pad, his hands tucked in his pockets. Day 35, he said. He tried to smile, but it only sort of skated across his mouth. Robin rushed toward him and took his face in both of her hands. I'm just a couple of hours away, she kissed him. Okay, just two hours. He nodded and pressed his lips together as if tasting her again. We'll text and call. He stepped away and bent down to pat Arthur. I think I'll miss you the most, bud. He gave her a wry smile, and her chest felt too small to hold her heart. Help me with the picnic table? She could fold up the table and heave it into her house herself, but the job would be much easier with him. Could she help it if she liked watching him flex and lift the table like it weighed nothing? She stood in her house and looked around. Everything seemed secure. She grabbed her purse and put that in the truck, too. Duane had arrived and he and Shane worked on unhooking the electrical, the water, and the sewer lines. Thank you, Duane. She stepped into him and gave him a hug. Where's Felicity? She and May are packing up a care basket for you. Oh, I don't need that. May insists that you do. He smiled at her and handed her an envelope. Your money for your services here. Robin took it, wondering how often he could really use her. More than once a year, she knew that. She wasn't a vet, but she'd done general horsehoof care here, made over 200 horseshoes, and reshod every horse. She wanted to ask him, and Shane wasn't anywhere in sight. What if I wanted to stay here on a more permanent basis? Dwayne's eyebrows shot under the brim of his hat. Permanent? Well, Shane and I are dating, and me being on the road all the time isn't all that. Robin stopped herself from finishing with great. She'd always loved her time on the road, loved being in a new small town and a new ranch every week. She'd given up her house and temple so she could more easily do exactly that. And now that she'd been working for five weeks, she had the money she needed to pay the few bills she had. Her next stop, the Roundy Ranch, had also agreed to allow her access to their utilities as she lived on site for the next month. But she knew that it absolutely would not be the same experience she just had here at Grapeseed Ranch, because Shane didn't live at the Roundy Ranch. Duane met her eyes and shuffled his feet. Shane's been the happiest I've ever seen him, he said. But Miss Robin, I can't afford to pay you a full-time wage, a living wage. How much could you offer me? With a living pad and access to all the utilities? I might be able to give you that, as well as one day of work each week. Robin nodded, her throat closing as she absorbed the information. She felt like she might be sick. I understand. I'm sorry. He backed up as Shane came around the front of the tiny house. She's ready to hitch up, he said. Don't say anything to him, Robin whispered, and Duane gave a small shake of his head. Help me with the steps, he said to Shane, and the two men collapsed and pushed the steps into place under the house, and Robin removed the wheel box so they could heave the house onto the hitch. Then she backed her truck as close as she dared without hitting Shane this time, and they got everything attached properly. She sat behind the wheel, wondering how she could simply drive away. She couldn't do it. The truck idled and the air conditioning blew. She'd never had a problem leaving before, anywhere. She'd left home at 18, left ranch after ranch, left men who couldn't rope her wild heart. Robin jumped from the truck and ran toward Shane. He stepped off the cement pad and caught her as she wrapped herself around him. I can't go, she whispered into his neck. You have to, he said. It's day 35, sweetheart, and you have a job to do. I love you. Her voice broke. She found her balance before stepping back. I can't go. Shane swallowed, his own emotions storming across his face. He wiped his palms down his sides and said, Call me as soon as you want. Shane, did you hear what I said? I heard you. He kissed her and Robin tried to extract every ounce of love from him that she could. He pulled away abruptly and sucked in a breath. I love you too, Robin. Now go. 
She wasn't sure how she got behind the wheel or when she put the truck in drive. She didn't see anything until she hit the highway past Grapeseed Falls. And then everything blurred behind her tears. Chapter 19 Shane had anticipated the hurt he'd experience as he watched Robin's taillights get further and further from him. But as they faded from view entirely, he realized he'd underestimated how painful it was to live with a broken heart. He sighed and kept his head down as he trudged back to the cabin community. He missed the jingle jangle of Arthur's collar beside him, and he climbed the steps to his cabin, a decision forming in his mind. Austin, Dylan, he called when he entered the house and looked up. Dylan's head poked over the railing of the loft they'd shared. Wanna go get a dog? Dylan grinned and Austin whooped, and they came thundering down the ladder, their boots hitting the wood floor on the main level with loud clunks. What kind of dog? Dylan asked. Can we get a collie like Kurtz? Austin asked, and his blue eyes were so eager, Shane wanted to say yes. We'll see what they have at the shelter, he said, reaching for his wallet and keys, which sat in a bowl on the table beside the front door. Is Robin gone? Dylan asked as Austin went to the pegs in the kitchen where he'd hung his cowboy hat. Shane couldn't breathe for a moment, and he wondered how long it would be before that didn't happen. Probably never. The woman he loved had just driven away, and she wasn't scheduled to be back for another eleven months. He nodded. Yep, on her way to the Roundy Ranch today. Thankfully, his voice sounded somewhat normal. Dad called, Austin said, returning with his hat on his head. He wants you to call him back, Shane. All right, I will later. He hadn't spoken to his father since that first time over two weeks ago. His dad had texted a time or two, and Shane had responded once. Two or three words. He wasn't sure, couldn't remember what his dad had even asked. Because he didn't care. He had been able to let go a lot of his anger simply by saying the things he'd thought for years, and he was grateful for that. But he honestly didn't want to have a relationship with his father. He simply couldn't afford to start to think his father was a decent guy, only to be let down again. And he didn't want to be like his father. He'd spent the first twenty-one years of his life desiring nothing more, and fifteen now trying not to. I want a German shepherd, Dylan said. I know you said we'd see what the shelter has, but I just want to get my wish out there since Austin already said Kali. He opened the front door and stepped through it, a wide grin on his face. I'm so glad Robin got a bigger dog, Austin said, so you could see how awesome it would be to have one. Shane smiled and shook his head. Neither of his brothers understood how much Shane did to keep them together, keep them happy, keep them fed, and he was glad they didn't. A dog had always been one more thing to take care of, but now he also knew what a great friend it could be, and he needed that right now, though Dylan and Austin were always there for him. He'd spent so long keeping things to himself that it was hard to confide in Dylan and Austin. He'd taken to spilling his cares and worries to Arthur, the Lord, and Dr. Sloan. The dog didn't help much except as a sounding board. God hadn't given him any ideas for how to keep Robin in his corner of hill country, and Dr. Sloan was starting to cost too much to talk Shane through every troubling thought he had. And so he drove toward the shelter, secretly hoping there was another Sheltie that had been brought in, or an Australian shepherd. As he and his brothers wandered the aisles, he couldn't see one. There were two German shepherds, though one had been spoken for and the other wouldn't come forward from the back of his kennel. He shook, and while Shane wanted to help him, he also didn't want a high-needs dog that couldn't get along with people, horses, cows, and other dogs. Sorry, Dylan, he said as his brother continued to try to lure the shepherd over to the door. He couldn't see a rescue dog he thought would be a good fit for him and his brothers, as well as the ranch. Everything's too small, he said. No border collies. What do you want? Joan asked. An Australian shepherd, he admitted. I think we're going to have to buy one. My son has an Aussie who had several puppies a while ago. Shane spun back to Joan. Really? Are there any left? Dylan asked. I think an Australian shepherd is almost as good as a German shepherd. Let me ask him. She returned to the front desk, all three royal brothers in her wake, and texted her son. I'll write down his number for you. She busied herself with that while they waited for her son to text back. Who's your son? Roland Jackson, she said. My husband owns a tire shop on the west side of town. Oh, yeah, we know it, Dylan said. I hope he's got one. 
Her phone beeped and she picked it up. He has one left, but it's the run of the litter. Brown and white markings, so not as pretty as the others. I'm sure he's fine, Austin said, looking at Shane. It's a girl, Joan said. Shane looked at Dylan and then Austin, and he knew from the expressions on his brother's faces that they wanted the runty, ugly Australian shepherd. We'll take her, he said. When can we go meet her? Right now, Joan said. Later that night, Shane sat on the couch with Cinnamon, the fluffy brown and white puppy who was cuter than anything Shane had ever seen before. They'd spent the afternoon buying food, bowls, and a collar with a name tag. Shane had put bells in the doors just like Robin had to train Cinny to ring them when she needed to go out, and he'd started teaching her how to sit as well. She was a bright, beautiful dog, and Shane loved her. He stroked his hand over her small body, simply having her at his side soothing. He'd called his mother and found out that his dad was concerned about him because he knew today was the day Robin was leaving the ranch. How do you know that? Shane asked. I told him, his mother had confessed. We're both worried about you, Shane. Well, he wasn't worried for the past 15 years. I don't think either of us knew how poorly you were doing, she said. Shane couldn't argue with that. He hadn't wanted his mom to worry about him, so he'd sugarcoated everything over the past 15 years, for everyone, it seemed. He was glad he didn't have to do that anymore. Dr. Sloan had been right. Saying things he normally wouldn't say and releasing the things he'd been holding inside for so long had freed him. He worked with Cinna every morning, during the day, at lunch, and all evening. By the end of the week, the little dog was quite well behaved and had started hurting the cowboys when they came in for lunch. She got along with the other dogs that lived on the ranch and with other cowboys, and everyone seemed to have a smile for the newest addition to Grape Seed Ranch. On Sunday morning, he loaded the dog into his truck and aimed it toward Austin, a date with Robin on the horizon. Duane and Kurt had been kind enough to give him this day off completely, and Shane couldn't remember the last time he'd had an entire day off. He also knew it wouldn't become a regular thing. He was the co-foreman. He couldn't be leaving every time he wanted to see his girlfriend. But maybe for today, he wouldn't have to think about hard things. Maybe today, he could just be Shane Royal, Robin Cook's boyfriend. They talked several times throughout the week, but nothing was the same as seeing her gorgeous face as he pulled up to her tiny house. He couldn't get out of his truck fast enough, and she was already running toward him by the time his feet hit the dirt. His laughter joined hers, and he swung her around near the front of his truck. When he set her on her feet, he kissed her until the smile left her face, and she returned his affection as intently as he was trying to show her. I missed you, he whispered, running his fingers through her hair. He breathed in the soft, perfumey scent of her and kissed her again. Cinna yipped, and that made Robin pull back. Oh, who is this? She scooped the hopping dog off the ground and cradled her. She is adorable. Yes, you are. You are, aren't you? She touched her nose to Cinna's, still cooing at the animal. Careful, he said. Arthur will get jealous. The shelter lay on the ground underneath the table where Robin had been sitting when Shane had pulled up. So, he looked around the ranch, finding a few cabins further down the road. Show me around. Robin put Cinna down, laced her fingers through his, and started the grand tour. The two dogs followed them, and Shane showed Robin all the tricks he'd taught his dog in only a week. Everything felt right between them, and he wished he could have this reality every day of the week, not just on Sundays. Just this Sunday, he thought. Have you thought of anything you could do closer to Grapeseed Falls? He asked. They'd been texting about it as Robin had started filling her schedule for September, and Shane had asked her if she'd considered parking her tiny house somewhere near Grapeseed Falls permanently. She'd admitted she'd thought of it, but needed a job to make it work. I have only one skill set, Shane. I thought of Levi, he said. Remember how he said he should hire a farrier full time? No. She looked up at him, the breeze lifting her hair and pushing it away from her face. Her beauty struck him full in the chest, and he desperately needed to hold her hand every day for the rest of his life. His chest collapsed, and it felt like a giant was pressing against his lungs. When did he say that? That day we were there, he said, when you showed his employees how to shoe. Robin's expression turned thoughtful, and she didn't say much for the rest of their visit. Eventually, Shane had to put Sin in his truck and start back to the ranch. 
They hadn't been able to make solid plans for the next time they could meet. He had no idea when he'd see her again. As he drove away, he felt like his heart was breaking all over again, and he wasn't sure if he could endure this agony for a third time. Dylan sat on the top step when Shane got home, and he sagged next to him as her pup ran around on the front lawn, sniffing to find the right spot to go to the bathroom. How's Robin? Fine. How's Austin? Fine. He said you never called Dad. Shane took off his cowboy hat and ran his fingers through his hair. Yeah, I couldn't. I get it. You do seem happier this summer, and I don't think it's all because of Robin. It's not. He smiled at the shepherd as she trotted over and appraised the steps. Come on, he said. You can do it. Come on up. Dylan and Shane watched as she tried to hop up and didn't quite make it. She landed on her back with a puff of dust and immediately tried again. She got it that time, and Dylan swept her into his lap when she reached them. I love this silly puppy, he said. I love you, bud, Shane said. How are things with you? Same as you, except I'm not as angry and I don't have a girlfriend. Yeah, well, neither do I. What? Did you guys break up? Not yet. Shane studied the horizon like there was something really fascinating happening. It's only a matter of time. She works all over the state and I live here. You guys will work it out. Yeah, I want to believe that, Shane said as he stood. I'm going to go find something to eat. Don't let her wander off. Shane went inside and set four pieces of bread in the toaster. He pulled out his phone and waffled between texting Dr. Sloan or texting Robin. Trusting the writhing feeling in his stomach, he chose Robin. I don't think this is going to work. He stared at the words, trying to find the strength to send them. He should have been brave enough to say them to her face earlier this afternoon. But he didn't want to watch her cry. And he felt stuck between two impossible situations. The bread popped out of the toaster, but he made no move to butter it. What do I do? He prayed. The same question that had been on a loop in his mind for the past six weeks. Let her go. The thought came to his mind, as did the memories of how he'd released certain things this summer and been happier because of it. He didn't believe he'd be happier without Robin, but maybe she'd be happier without him. Maybe now just wasn't the right time for them to be together. He'd always known she was a free spirit. And she knew he had nothing to offer her. Maybe they'd never be able to make things work between them. As much as the idea added cracks to his already shattered heart, Shane didn't want to make Robin's life more difficult by insisting he be in it. So he sent the text, slammed his phone on the counter, and stalked out of the cabin, leaving his bread to cool right where it was. Chapter 20 I don't think this is going to work. I'm not cut out for long-distance dating. I'm going to let you go and hope you'll come back to me one day. Robin stared at her phone, reading and rereading the three text messages from Shane. They'd just shared a great day together, but she'd felt the distance between them. He'd still kissed her with all the love he ever had, but he'd walked away a lot easier than she'd been able to drive away last weekend. Robin read the messages again, a flash of emotion making her throat tight and her eyes burn. Tears slid down her face, but she couldn't argue with him. She couldn't lead him on as she roamed all over the state. She sucked in her tears and wiped her face. I know how hard it is for you letting things go. I'm sorry we only had 35 days together. She sent the message, hoping and praying he'd contradict her numbering system, as they'd had today, too. He didn't and she climbed the steps to her loft with the words, Come on, Arthur. The dog looked at her with concerned eyes as she wept. This crying was different than what she'd done when she'd found Misfit's body. This was a slow, burning ache that required more somber tears. She changed into her pajamas and curled into a ball in the bed. Arthur's weight next to her was the only comfort, and her pain deepened when she remembered Shane was half-owner of the dog. She'd made it through the following day, but it was one of the worst Mondays on record. A horse at Three Bars Ranch in Stables had kicked her in the thigh while she was cleaning the frog of his hoof, and she dealt with a throbbing pain in her leg, her head, and her heart for hours before she made it back to her tiny house. Melinda Roundy had invited her to dinner at the homestead each evening, but Robin couldn't bring herself to go that night, or the next. By Wednesday, she'd ignored two calls from her mother, 
been injured again when she lost focus with a wily horse who was getting her first pair of shoes, and she really wanted to call Shane and tell him about it. The loss of his friendship felt too deep. The fact that she couldn't kiss him seemed a tragedy. And when Melinda knocked on her door and said, I know you're in there, Robin considered hooking her house up to the truck in the middle of the night and making her escape from Texas Hill Country completely. Instead, she opened the door. Yeah, I'm in here. Melinda, a petite woman who could pack a punch, appraised her. Her dark curls swung as she shook her head. Oh, honey, y'all are looking terrible. I've been kicked a lot this week, she said. Three bars has three horses going into shoes for the first time. Arthur edged past her and jumped down to the grass without touching the steps. Robin could get him to go downstairs if she leashed him, but she rarely did. Melinda had a pair of boys who weren't in school, and they'd been taking Arthur during the day while Robin worked. So you should need some supper then, Melinda cocked one hip. I just want to take some painkillers and go to bed. Robin didn't want to admit that she didn't want to socialize. Sure, her muscles hurt, but it was a heartache that brought the exhaustion. Her eyes burned just thinking about Shane, and she willed herself not to cry. Not in front of Melinda, who Robin had known for several years, but not well enough to bear her soul to. I'll send Joey over with a plate then. She turned as if the decision had been made, and Robin didn't argue. Ten minutes later, the eight-year-old boy knocked, and Robin gave him the best smile she could manage when he handed her the plate with lasagna and a green salad on it. Tell your ma thank you, Robin said. And is Arthur still out there with you guys? He's in the house, Joey said. I'll bring him over later, okay? Sure, okay. The boy left, and Robin ate the food, wishing she could cook the way Melinda did. She was decent enough in the kitchen, but this was homemade lasagna, not the frozen kind Robin made. The 280 square feet seemed to swallow her whole, and Robin went up to the loft, hoping the smaller space would help her box in her emotions. All it did was condense them so they were more potent, and she fell asleep with tears staining her pillows. Robin existed in the same pattern for a week, and then two. She had two more weeks in this area of hill country, and then she was moving north into the panhandle, stopping at a few remote ranches on her way up to Three Rivers Ranch, just east of Amarillo. She didn't want to go to Three Rivers, and she kept putting off Squire Ackerman's calls. Squire and Duane were cousins, and she felt sure that everyone at Three Rivers, which had grown to a huge conglomeration of several horse businesses, would know about her and Shane. Which was ridiculous, really. Shane was from the San Antonio area, and had never been to the Texas panhandle that she knew of. Still, she didn't want to go. She feared if she went that far from Shane, she wouldn't come back. After all, it was only a hop, skip, and jump from Three Rivers to the Oklahoma border, and she could find work all over that state, too. Maybe she'd never come back to Texas. By the time the third week dawned, she knew she'd need to talk to Squire. She'd either need to commit to him or tell him why she couldn't come. After all, he'd taken on her business from Duane's referral, and she'd only been going up there for the past four years. She looked at herself in the small mirror above the bathroom sink, and she barely recognized herself. This isn't right, she said to her reflection but she had no idea what was right or what to do to rectify the situation. Talk to me. She stepped out of the bathroom and sent a text to Cecily Smith, who answered by the time Robin had dressed and pulled her hair into a ponytail. Good to hear from you again. I see a lot in this paragraph. Should we schedule a phone call? Robin had an hour before she was expected at Rooster Ridge Ranch, so she simply thumbed out yes. Dr. Smith called twenty minutes later, and her higher sweet voice reminded Robin of her mother. So, Robin, how are you? Miserable, Robin said, deciding to go with the first thing that came to her mind. And she wasn't going to censor herself either. She wasn't sure how much longer she could live like this, and she'd take any help she could get. I read that you and your boyfriend recently broke up. Yes. Tell me more about it. Robin launched into the story, and she said things she hadn't even thought about at least not on such a cognizant level. She ended with, And I really thought we could make it work, but I just don't see how. This is a unique and tough situation, Dr. Smith said. I don't have a perfect answer for you. You talked about a lot of things that feel right or don't feel right. What do you think would make you feel right? 
being with Shane, she said. Maybe you should explore every option to make that possible, the doctor said. I don't know what any of those options are. A hefty pause came through the line. Robin, can I tell you a story? Robin wasn't really sure she wanted to pay this doctor to spill fairy tales, but she had another twenty minutes until she arrived at Rooster Ridge, so she said, All right. When I was younger, I was dating a man I really liked. He was tall and handsome and one of the best baseball players in the state. His future was not in Texas, and I thought it was impossible for me to go with him wherever the draft took him. I had a scholarship to Texas A&M, you see, and I'd work really hard for it. My family was in the area, and I didn't want to leave them. Robin hummed, because she could already see where this was going. So you gave up what you were doing and followed him? No, Dr. Smith said. I didn't. I didn't think I could. We broke up, and he went to the Miami Marlins and won the World Series. He's married with children, and they have a wonderful life in Florida. Okay, Robin said, not sure what she was supposed to take from this story. I finished my degree, and I've been working in the Dallas area for a couple of decades with my family nearby. Maybe that was what was right for you, Robin said. Maybe, Dr. Smith said. But I've never been married, and while I have my family and my degree, there are times when I wonder what I could have experienced. What greater things might have been in my life had I been willing to give up what I thought was most precious? So you're saying my job might not be as important as I think it is. I'm not saying that, she said. I'm saying that there are dozens of paths, and if you feel like you're not on the right one, step on to another one even if the price is something you think you can't pay. Robin swallowed as her fear expanded. I don't know if I can do that. It takes a leap of faith, that's for sure. Something I wish I'd had all those years ago with Eli. She sounded sad, wistful, and Robin's heart went out to the woman. All right, she said. I don't like this path I'm on, so I will try to do something about it. Let me know how it's going, any time, day or night. Robin promised she would as she pulled into the ranch where she'd be working that day. As she filed and hammered, shaped and reshaped metal, all she could think about was finding a way to work in the Grape Seed Falls area of hill country on a permanent basis. Putting down her roots there felt like the right thing to do, but she couldn't do it without a job, so she just needed to get a job. Duane said he could employ her one day a week, give her a place to park her house, so she just needed to work four more days a week and Shane had mentioned Levi. She had heard the boarding stable owner say he needed to hire a farrier full-time. She'd mentioned a veterinarian, but she didn't have those capabilities and gone to teach his staff. Levi had never said anything, and her doubts that he could employ her full-time intensified. But she really wanted to get back to Grape Seed Falls. So with a prayer in her heart and with new determination to get off this miserable path she was on, she vowed to call Levi as soon as she finished her farrier work for the day. Chapter 21 The only reason Shane made it through each day was because of Cinna. Strangely, though he'd broken up with Robin, he wasn't nearly as angry as he even was a few months ago. Not carrying around fifteen years of fury stemming from his father was so liberating. Shane actually had room for his own life, his own problems. The biggest problem was sharing the pup with his brothers and everyone else on the ranch. Dwayne didn't care who had what animals— as long as they didn't interfere with the ranch dogs or livestock and that they were taken care of. More often than not, Cinna could be found at Shane's heels or with Kurt's border collie patches. Since the two next-door neighbor dogs had taken a liking to each other, Shane and his brothers had been eating dinner more and more at Kurt's, too. May really was an excellent chef, and Shane could handle her questions if she kept the chili and chocolate cake coming. As August dawned without any communication with Robin, Shane's heart seemed weighed down with sadness. Perhaps he'd simply traded his madness for melancholy. Perhaps he wasn't meant to find happiness the way he'd hoped he would with Robin. One Sunday he loaded up with his brothers and headed into church. He'd been attending more and more often, the sermons bringing him comfort much the same way Cinna did. He thought church would be much more interesting with Robin's interruptions, but he never brought her up. If he spoke about her, it was because May had asked or Dylan had mentioned her. 
He thought of her endlessly, and he wondered if he always would. A solution to their predicament hadn't presented itself, though Shane had been praying nonstop for divine help for the past three weeks. A giggly brunette latched onto Dylan two steps inside the church, and his brother threw Shane a helpless look that said help as much as it said, I'm fine. Not sure what to do, Shane continued to the row where Kurt and May already sat and slid onto the bench with Austin beside him. The woman took Dylan down the aisle to another row filled with more women, and Shane nodded toward them. Maybe you'd like to sit by your other brother. I'll pass. Yeah? Shane looked at Austin now, his curiosity lifting. Who is that? Selena Bouchard, Austin said, and I'm not interested in her or her nail salon friends. Is Dylan? Dylan's lonely, Austin said. It won't last. Shane frowned, unsure of how to feel about Dylan dating someone he didn't really like. That didn't seem like Dylan, but Shane understood. There were no women on the ranch, and the men worked long hours without much time to meet people. How'd he meet her? He asked Austin. A couple of weeks ago, after church. How Shane had missed that, he wasn't sure. But a couple of weeks ago, he'd been deep inside his own depression about Robin, and he couldn't remember much for about a week's time. Must have happened then. Kurt leaned over from Shane's other side and whispered, Heard Robin's back in town. Shane whipped his head toward him so fast, his neck sent a slice of pain down his back. What? He pressed his hand to the back of his neck. Robin's in town? Shh. Kurt glanced around, but the service hadn't even started yet. Yeah, Dwayne said she came to the ranch on Friday. Friday? Shane needed to go. Now. If Robin was in town, had been for two whole days, he needed to see her. She didn't come see you. A voice hissed in his head. She hadn't even called. Heck, he would have taken a simple four-word text. Hey, I'm in town. The room spun and his stomach felt tingly inside. She didn't want to see him, and his jaw clenched as he vowed not to leave the service and find her. She knew how to get in touch with him. If she wanted to, she could. You didn't know? Kurt whispered, not really asking. Shane shook his head, his teeth clenching too hard to speak. Hey, I'm sorry. Kurt leaned over and whispered something to May, who also looked at Shane. He really didn't need their sympathy. He'd been around when they hadn't been getting along, and he just tried to be there for Kurt. Pastor Gifford stood and the choir wrapped up their opening number. Friends, welcome to our service today. He beamed out into the crowd. I love coming to the Lord's house when the sun is shining so brightly through those stained glass windows. Shane focused on each word, spelling it out so he wouldn't have space to think about Robin. But she was ever present in his mind, just like always. Still, he managed to listen as the preacher began talking about relying on the Lord in times of trouble. People sometimes tend to forget the Lord in the easy times of their lives. We should always be grateful, especially when we have an abundance of blessings in our lives. We're better at turning to God when things are hard, but we mustn't forget to be grateful. You may feel like you don't have anything to be grateful for, or like God isn't answering your prayers for possibly something we desperately need. Pastor Gifford stopped, apparently overcome with a rush of emotion. When he spoke again, his voice was quieter, more sincere. But, brothers and sisters, he is aware of you, and he knows exactly what you need. Ask again. Be grateful, and ask again. Shane closed his eyes, determined to do what Pastor Gifford had counseled. He started listing the things he was grateful for, starting with his mom, his brothers, his job at Great Seed Ranch, his friendship with the other cowboys, and Cinna and Robin. Yes, even Robin. I'm so grateful for those thirty-five days. He prayed. Please, please help me figure out how to get more time with her. He didn't think there was a ranch large enough in this corner of hill country that could employ her full time. But what if she could work one day a week at five different ranches? With a plan, shaky as it was, Shane prayed thank you and determined to call every ranch within a 30-mile radius if it meant he could get Robin to come back and live closer on a more permanent basis. The following day, he hung up with Joaquin Alvarez, the owner of Sunnyside Farms, where Shane knew Robin had worked each summer. He had men who could shoe horses, 
All he needed Robin for was to shape and build a supply of horseshoes, which she'd just done for the next six months. He called Levi, who absolutely had said he should hire Robin full-time instead of having her teach his existing staff her skills, but the man didn't answer. Frustrated and hungry, Shane turned his attention to making lunch instead of trying to find a job for Robin. Sina rang the bell, though she'd been outside all morning with him while he moved hay from one storage barn to the farthest pastures where the yearlings grazed. This late in the summer, without rain for so long, they had to supplement the grass with hay, and it seemed a never-ending job to get the food to where it needed to go. He just slid the scramble eggs he'd made onto a plate when Austin walked in whistling. Hey, bro, are those for me? No, Shane said, but I'll make you some if you want. Yeah, sure, where's Cinna? She rang the bell. You know Patches is gonna get frisky with her, right? Patches is neutered. Shane cracked four eggs into the bowl and tipped in a bit of milk also. Not every dog out there is neutered, Austin said, checking out the back door while Shane poured the eggs into the hot pan. Well, more pups like Cinna can't be bad, Shane said. Who's gonna take care of them? I will, Shane said, mentally adding, I've got nothing better to do. By the end of the week, Shane's sadness was only winning over his fury by a hair. He wanted to text Robin and find out if she was still in the vicinity, find out why she'd come to talk to Duane and hadn't wanted to see him. Not knowing was torture, and Shane found himself working around the ranch with the same furious fervor he'd had for the past three years. Cinna didn't help, and a phone call to Dr. Sloan didn't help, and Shane feared that the only thing that would curb the anger was something, someone he could never have. He honestly wasn't sure what was worse, having a ten-foot wall around his heart or having a broken one. Chapter 22 Robin drove down to Grape Seed Falls for the second time in as many weekends, the radio as loud as she could stand without doing permanent damage to her hearing. Duane had agreed to hire her one day a week, as well as provide her a living pad and utilities. Patsy had signed on for a Tuesday class for all her camps, which meant Robin just needed Levi to agree to hire her for three days. Sunnyside Farms had said no, as had three other places Robin had called or visited over the past week. Levi and Heather had been out of town, but he'd agreed to meet with her that afternoon. She hadn't explained anything to him, but surely he knew why she wanted to talk. He was married to Heather, after all, and Duane knew what she was trying to do. She'd asked him not to say anything to Shane, not yet for various reasons. Number one, she wanted to be the one to surprise him with a solution to their long-distance problem. Number two, she didn't want to get his hopes up, only to find out that she couldn't get the employment she needed to make Great Seed Falls her permanent home. Just being back last weekend had been wonderful. It had taken every ounce of willpower in her whole body not to let Arthur run free on the ranch, and sheer determination to keep herself from tracking down Shane and kissing him senseless. Her feelings had been confirmed, though, and she was grateful for that. Grapeseed Falls was where she was supposed to be. She needed to be here. This was where her roots were supposed to be planted. And so she'd do whatever she could to make that happen. Maybe part-time work is enough, she said to herself for probably the twentieth time that week. If she and Shane got married, they'd have his income to pay for the tiny house, too. Maybe a few days a week would be enough. She could be a canine mom the other days of the week, or volunteer on the ranch, or finally learn how to cook more than the basics. The two-hour trip went by in a blink, and she found herself pulling into Levi's boarding stable before she knew it. Her nerves felt like ping-pong balls in her veins, zinging from top to bottom and back. And she wiped her hands down her shorts as she got out of the truck and said, Come on, Arthur. The Sheltie jumped out of her truck, his tongue already hanging out of his mouth. He looked around like she just brought him to the doggy version of Disneyland, and he trotted forward before turning and looking back at her. Yeah, I'm coming. She forced herself to move forward and enter the stable where the office sat at the end of the long aisle. Horses hung their heads over the stall doors, and she let her fingers drift across their manes as she walked. Levi appeared as if he had spies waiting to report on her arrival. He leaned in the doorway and folded his arms, watching her from under the brim of his hat. He'd always been a tough card to read, but Robin had been hoping his recent marriage would have softened him up a little. But he remained stoic and silent as she approached. Robin finally stopped several feet from him and said, Hey, Levi. 
Thanks for meeting with me today. Come on in. He went back in the office without a hello or anything. Robin typically wasn't really religious, but she took a page from Shane's book and pressed her eyes closed so she could say a prayer. But no words came to her mind, so she went in Levi's office without any help from above. He sat behind the desk already, a bare surface in front of him. She sat in the only chair available and took a deep breath. Shane, just saying his name made her voice tighten. She cleared her throat and pressed on. Shane said you had mentioned hiring a farrier full time. I want to be that farrier. Levi regarded her with emotionless eyes, and Robin wished Heather was in the office with him. How many horses do I have here? Robin wasn't aware this was going to be a trivia session. I would guess over 200, she said, only half of which are yours. Surprise flitted across his face. There one moment and gone the next, but Robin refused to look away from him, so she saw it. What are you thinking? Full time, sir. See, I want, well, I, I want to make my home here in Grapeseed Falls, and to do that, I need a permanent job. How much of this has to do with Shane Royal? Everything, she said, the word more air than anything else. Levi grinned, but Robin didn't know what to make of the gesture. She wasn't sure if this was an interrogation, an interview, or a friendly conversation with a man she'd known for the eight years she'd been coming here to work with his horses and form his horseshoes. Heather said if you admitted that, I could hire you. Relief sang through her, but she didn't dare rejoice yet. He hadn't actually hired her yet. You need somewhere to put your house. Duane. Her voice caught on itself as she thought about going out to Grapeseed Ranch. She'd be able to see Shane this time, hold his hand, breathe in the masculine scent of his skin, kiss his lips. Sorry, uh, Duane said I could park out there again. Levi frowned and put his phone on his desk. Hmm, that doesn't sound right. He tapped out a message she couldn't see and waited until an answer came back. Every breath Robin took felt like torture, but she waited. Yeah, that's what I thought. He looked up. Dwayne's building a shed on the cement pad where you lived last month, so that's not going to work out. I just spoke to him last week, so... Heather and I would like to offer you a spot on our property. He leaned away from the desk on his phone. I have room on my land, sort of nestled in the orchards. Robin nodded. She hadn't been able to see the entirety of the road's orchards, but she'd heard of them and seen how they went right up to Levi's homestead. There's a third home site that hasn't been built on, he said. You could put your house there. It's easy to get plumbed and set up for water and electricity. Robin didn't know what to say. Gratitude poured through her and tears sprang to her eyes. Really? Really. But Robin, I can't offer you full time. Her heart deflated all at once, and it left a horrible empty feeling in her chest. Oh. I've spoken to Duane, too and he said he can give you two days a week if he's not providing you with a living spot and utilities, and I can give you three days a week plus the home site. You'd have to pay your own utilities. I can do that, Robin blurted. But Tuesdays, I've already agreed to work at Sugar and Spice. So you're going to work six days a week? He seemed incredulous. Sure, she said. That's what I do now. His phone flashed and he glanced at it. Heather wants to know if I've hired you yet. He looked at Robin. What should I tell her? Does what I said sound good to you? It sounded like she'd died and gone to heaven. She nodded, her emotions growing and surging like a tsunami. Yeah, sounds good. How long till you can move down here? He asked. I'll need about a week to get utilities hooked up at the home site. A week would be great, she said. I've got Heather's cousin calling me on the daily about coming up there, I figure I better take care of that job first and then come back down here. Levi nodded and tapped with two forefingers to answer his wife. He smiled at her response and said, All right, Robin. Looks like you got yourself a job with 207 horses. He stood and beamed at her. Robin got to her feet, too. Only seven off. She smiled and forced herself not to skip out of his office and down the aisle. Instead, she shook his hand and headed out leisurely, like she wasn't dying to make the 15-minute drive to Grapeseed Ranch and find Shane. Once free of the stables, she burst into a run, her whoop escaping from her throat. Come on, Arthur, she called. We have to go find Shane. Her insides shook like gelatin, and her fingers trembled.
and she could barely keep the truck on the highway as she drove toward the man she loved. Thank you, thank you, thank you, she muttered, her joy making her emotions so close to the surface. She pulled back a sob as she turned under the arch and kept on down the lane toward Cowboy Commons. She parked in front of Shane's cabin and texted him. Can we talk? It only took him thirty seconds to respond. I'm busy. Her heart stuttered in her chest. Arthur wants to play with Sinna again. She dictated as she typed. She smiled at the words, sure he'd come running when he read them. You're here. Parked in front of your house, cowboy. I have something I want to tell you. She got out of the truck when she caught sight of him walking, not running toward her in her rearview mirror. He wore a look of distaste on his face, and Robin's nerves rioted again. He stopped farther away than she liked, and this reunion wasn't going how she'd imagined at all. No, that wasn't him jogging toward her while he laughed and then sweeping her up off her feet and swinging her around before he kissed her. The statuesque version of him was so wrong. How long have you been in town this time? He asked. Robin swallowed and said, An hour or so. Long enough to meet with Levi and get a job at his stables. And so much more. She wanted to tell him all about it, but she waited for his reaction. His jaw twitched and he looked away. Cinna came to a side and sat, her head cocked at Arthur, who lay in the front yard. Did you get the job? Yes, and one here too. I'm moving back to Grapeseed Falls. She hoped he'd rush to her then, and she could hold on to those broad shoulders and laugh with him. I did it, Shane. I found a way for us to be together. If you still want to be with me, I still love you. She took one step toward him and then fell back again when he remained unyielding. So what do you think, Shane? Will you help me put down roots right here in Grapeseed Falls? Chapter 23 I still love you. Shane hadn't realized how liberating those three little words could be, how powerful they were. Everything inside him softened, and the anger that had come back this past week melted away. She stood before him in simple cutoffs and tank top the color of butter, and she was the most heavenly sight he'd ever seen. Of course, he managed to push through his throat, and though only a truck length separated them, it felt like leagues to him. He took a step, and the next thing he knew Robin landed in his arms, her breathing heating the fabric along his collar, and her tears tracking down her face. I called Sunnyside, he said, closing his eyes in pure bliss right there on the front lawn. They wouldn't hire you, and Levi wouldn't call me back. She pulled away slightly, just enough to look into his face. Cinna whined and Arthur came closer, too. You called Sunnyside Farms? I was trying to bring you back to me. Did you talk to Duane, too? No, he said. Kurt mentioned you'd already come back to the ranch. He shuffled his feet as she aligned their hands. She didn't head for the cabin, but for the lane that led back to the entrance. I was real mad you came to talk to him and you didn't text me or anything. More negative emotions were released with the admission. He was learning that he couldn't hold on to things, that if he spoke them out loud, he didn't have to experience them over and over again. And I wasn't sure you believed me about Levi saying he should hire a full-time farrier, so I called him too. Shane gave a half-shrug, wondering how this Saturday had been chosen as the one to change his life. God obviously heard and answered prayers, and he snuck a look at Robin. So, what did Levi say? He's given me three days a week at the stables. She lifted her chin toward the sky, and I got Patsy at Sugar and Spice to let me come do classes for our camps every Tuesday, and Duane's agreed to two days. Murray crashed through Shane when he should be grateful. Robin, that's six days a week. I always work six days a week, and hey, no Sundays, so we can go to church. Though he had been going every week since she'd left, he said, I don't get every Sunday off. She paused and Shane kept his eyes on the horizon. It sort of feels like you're not happy I worked things out. What? No. He faced her and ran his hands down the sides of her face. Of course I am. Her beauty made him ache, but it was so much different than the broken-hearted pain he'd been dealing with for weeks. You haven't said I love you. You haven't asked where I'll live. Kurt said you asked about pulling up here again. I guess I just assumed... Robin stepped into his arms and pressed her cheek against his chest. The world seemed right when she stood in his arms like this. 
both dogs sniffing something along the side of the road, and the sky so blue overhead. I'm not living here, she said, and Shane pulled away. So tell me where you'll be. Levi offered me a home site on his orchard as part of my compensation. Surprise bolted through Shane, though he wasn't sure why. Levi Rhodes was very wealthy, running the huge boarding stable as well as his family's thriving peach orchards. That's great, he said. It was only fifteen minutes to the orchards, and that was a heck of a lot closer than Round Rock. I have to pay my own utilities, but that's okay. I should be able to afford it. So many things marched through Shane's mind. He landed on, Will you keep the tiny house? Or are you going to build something on Levi's land? I'm keeping the tiny house, she said. I don't think it was an invitation to build there. Mm-hmm. They started walking again, and the serene Saturday seemed at odds with the clashing questions inside Shane. What about us? he asked. What about us? Do you have room for me in the tiny house? He took a deep breath, everything about to come spilling out. You know I have nothing to offer you, right? Just my job here. My loud-mouthed brothers who eat too much. If we get married, I'll have to move in with you. He sighed, glad his thoughts were between them now. I personally think I'll fit in the house with you, although Sinna adds a fourth member. Robin blinked up at him. If we get married... So that was what she'd latched on to. He could see the hurt right there in her eyes. I want to marry you, he said, his emotions coloring his voice. But you know I'm not rich like Levi, right? It might take me a while to save up to buy you a ring. I don't care about a fancy ring, she said. I wouldn't even be able to wear it while I work. What about when we have kids? He asked. There were so many things they hadn't quite talked about in their 35 days together. Do you even want kids? She swallowed and nodded. A whole house full of them. With your house, that would be one, and it would have to sleep on the couch, he said, smiling. He leaned down, the urge to kiss her powerful. We have a lot more to talk about, but I want you to know how much I love you, Robin. His lips trailed along the bare skin from her shoulder to her jaw. Her hands came to his shoulders, claiming him, and he enjoyed the sensation of belonging to her. Then he claimed her mouth and all his fears for the future evaporated. They'd make it work. Whatever they had to do, they'd do. Shane knew because kissing Robin was the most magical and most beautiful thing he'd ever done. Eleven long days later, Shane woke before dawn as usual. He made coffee in the kitchen as usual. He let Sinna out as usual. But today, everything in his life would change. Today, big things were happening around the ranch. Today... Robin was set to move back to Grapeseed Falls. She'd been up there in Three Rivers, working for Duane's cousin on a much larger cattle ranch. An equine therapy facility sat on the property, too, and she gushed about the horses there and how they were easy to work with. Not only that, but a champion barrel racer had established a breeding and training operation at the ranch, too, which meant more horses, Robin had told him. In their late-night conversations while she'd been gone, she wondered if she could trade some of her days working for Duane for working for Squire Ackerman. She told Shane all about the sprawling ranch with two homesteads, all the barns and facilities and trailers. And he employs 32 cowboys, Shane. He wasn't sure if Robin was suggesting they both move to Three Rivers and put roots down there. When he'd asked her point blank, she'd said, I just think it's a good relationship to maintain, and there are opportunities for both of us on a ranch like his. But Shane didn't want to leave Hill Country. Three Rivers was too far from his mother and brothers, and he really liked working for Duane. But Squire and his family were helping with Robin's move today, and Shane would be meeting them. If Robin wanted to maintain a good relationship with the Ackermans, Shane could do his part. So he got his morning chores done as quickly as possible and loaded Sin into the ranch truck to get on over to Levi's orchard. He'd arrived before anyone else, but he didn't mind. There was something peaceful about the breeze whispering through the peach trees, the distant bleeding of Levi's goats, and the piece of land where Robin would be parking her tiny house that seemed like it was in the middle of nowhere, and yet connected to everything. He parked off to the side, noting the new white gravel for just such things. There was ample room for a few vehicles, and a cement pad four times larger than what Robin needed for her house. This was a foundation for a home, and Shane walked the perimeter of it, wondering if he and Robin would ever be able to buy a permanent house or not. 
as they talked through having children and if she'd keep working when they did over the past ten days, a lot of changes had been brought up. For one, once he moved off the ranch, he wouldn't have access to the truck he'd just driven over. Two, their income would be reduced if she didn't work as much. Three, there were just too many unknowns that it was hard to talk about and plan for. After all, they couldn't predict when they'd even get married, let alone start a family. Shane sat on the edge of the cement pad, his thoughts rotating slowly in his mind. A sense that not everything had to be planned moved through him, and he seized onto it. Robin's nature wasn't a plan. She wanted the tiny house so she could experience an adventure any old time she wanted to. Their conversations had been hard for her, Shane knew, but he'd been glad she'd been willing to have them. He could have faith that everything would work out when it was supposed to. So when two trucks finally turned down the dirt road toward him, one of them Robin's big white behemoth with the tiny boo house behind it, Shane stood, happier than he'd been before. And it hadn't taken talking to his father or chatting with the counselor over the Talk to Me app. All it had taken was a little bit of patience, a lot of prayer, and the love of Robin Cook. Chapter 24 One Year Later Robin's skin itched where it peeled. She couldn't believe she'd gotten sunburn last week during her shoeing class at Sugar and Spice. But she'd been so rushed to get out of the house that morning, she'd forgotten her cowgirl hat, and she'd been paying the price ever since. As she headed toward the familiar ranch for her weekly class, she daydreamed about the new swing Shane and Levi were installing that afternoon. She could sit there in the shade, a glass of sweet tea in her hand, and unwind after a long day of wrestling with horses and putting on a good show for the campers. Out of her three jobs, she loved her classes at Sugar and Spice the most. Sometimes the camps were just girls, and sometimes they had mixed camps with mothers and daughters. No matter what, they were always respectful to Robin and to the horses, and she loved her time doing the classes. They were more emotionally draining than her work with Duane's animals and Levi's horses, so the backyard swing would be welcome. She pulled up to the barn and parked where she always did, chirping to Arthur to, Come on, as she got out of the truck. Patsy was already in the barn as she usually was. She smiled at Robin when she came in, but the gesture slipped from her face faster than normal. Everything okay? Robin asked, setting her horseshoeing tools and apron on the counter where Patsy stood. Yeah, fine. But the last word broke and she shook her head, tears already gathering in her eyes. Robin hurried to her side and wrapped her in a hug. Oh, hey now, tell me what's going on. It's Daddy. Patsy clung to Robin like she was the only reason she was still standing. He's not doing too good this week, and the doctors say there's not much they can do. You think he'll pass away? Robin swallowed, not sure how she'd become a grief counselor in a matter of seconds. But she and Patsy had grown close over the last year, and Robin had told her a lot of her fears about Shane, and they'd commiserated together that he still hadn't asked her to marry him. He promised the day was coming, and soon— but Robin's left ring finger still didn't know the weight of an engagement ring. I don't know. Patsy stepped back and squared her shoulders. I'll go see him again this afternoon. Please let me know. Robin didn't know what else to say, so she pulled the calendar toward her which listed which horses she'd be using for her class that day. She moved through the stable until she came to the first, a tall, beautiful Sorrel horse named Cindy. She'd worked with Cindy a lot over the past year, and the two knew each other well. Hey, girl, she said to the horse who nickered back. Yeah, still no ring, she grinned at the horse. But I'm getting a new swing today, and Shane and I are going to the rodeo this weekend. After that, she'd spend three weeks at Three Rivers Ranch before she'd see Shane again. He claimed he was fine with her leaving, that it wasn't permanent, and that she should keep the lines of communication open with Squire Ackerman. Levi and Duane and Patsy had all agreed to the time off, and Squire paid really, really well. So I won't see you for a while, she said to Cindy, but I'm coming back. It always felt good to say that, and Robin sent a prayer of thanksgiving heavenward for this patch of hill country she could now call home. Robin rolled to a stop, a grin gracing her face when she saw the huge jar of sweet tea curing in the sun on the steps outside her front door. Shane had definitely been here, and Robin knew for more than the tea and the cute little Australian shepherd lying in the shade under the end of the house. She hopped from the truck and released Cinna from her leash. Did he finish the swing? Did he, huh? Cinna seemed to understand what Robin was saying because she darted around the corner of the house toward the trees on that part of the property. 
Robin followed, and sure enough, the swing was done, complete with a big red bow tied around the middle slats. She walked toward it almost reverently, her smile stuck to her face. Oh, how she loved Shane Royal. When would the man propose? Robin wanted him here when she got home from work, though he worked as late as she did, sometimes later. But she wanted the promise of him in the house, the assurance that he'd walk through the door and kiss her hello, the comfort of knowing he'd be by her side when she woke in the morning. An envelope sat on the swing and she pulled it from the tape holding it in place. She slipped her fingers under the flap and pulled out a single sheet of paper. It said, Bring Cinna over to Levi's. A frown settled between her eyes, and Robin glanced up like she'd find Shane hiding in the trees. Her gaze landed on Cinna. Is this some sort of scavenger hunt? The dog cocked her head as if trying to decipher English and then lay down in the grass. What's the prize, huh? She refolded the paper and tucked it back into the envelope. If it was Shane, she'd complete the journey, so she said, Come on, guys, we're going over to Levi's. She crossed the backyard enjoying the last of the evening sun and the stillness of the air away from everyone and everything else. This was the type of living she wanted. Not alone, not isolated, but private. She walked along the edge of the peach trees and imagined them in the springtime with blossoms and buds of fruit. She couldn't wait. Heather talked about the orchards like they were enchanted when the peaches came on, and Robin wanted to experience it. Levi's goats were causing a ruckus that Robin could hear from the hundreds of yards away, but when she came upon the farm she couldn't see why. Neither Levi nor Heather were anywhere to be seen, though a cat dashed under the deck when Robin's footstep crunched against the gravel walkway. Hello, she called. A slip of crimson caught her eye, and she moved around the far side of the deck to find another red bow tied there with another envelope taped to the wood. Definitely a scavenger hunt and her heart thumped out a few extra beats. Arthur has to be thirsty after that walk, Robin read aloud. And if Arthur was thirsty, Robin would take him to the horse barn where Levi kept bowls for the dogs to drink from. So she spun around, expecting something more than just the serenity of the backyard she'd spent many Sunday afternoons in while Heather made lunch or Levi visited his goats. A noise behind her made her turn and she caught Heather peeking through the blinds, she dropped them quickly, and Robin suddenly felt like she was being set up. Her friend balanced a six-month-old baby on her hip when she came through the sliding glass door. The little boy had her shock of dark hair and Levi's coal-colored eyes. Have you seen Shane? Robin asked. He's been around, Heather said evasively. Robin held up the latest piece of paper. I suppose this means I'm headed to the horse barn. Heather nodded but said, I have no idea where you should go a little louder than necessary. Robin shook her head, a chuckle slipping up her throat. Her excitement grew with every step she took toward the barn, which she'd already passed once. It had not had a red ribbon tied to the door handle then, but it did now. Once inside, she followed the ribbons all the way down to the end of the aisle, where Shane stood, a ribbon around his right wrist. Hey, beautiful, he said, sweeping that hand around her waist. You found me. He gazed down on her with all the adoration Robin had hoped for in her life, and she looked back at him with just as much happiness and love coursing through her. Yep, I found you. She swiped her fingers along the brim of his cowboy hat. So what was with the manhunt? He reached behind her and put a black ring box in the narrow space between them. I wanted to ask you a very important question. Robin sucked in a breath and stared at the velvet. He somehow cracked the box using one hand to reveal a beautiful rose-gold wedding van with a simple diamond in the center of it. Robin Cook, I love you with all my heart. Will you be my wife? She switched her gaze from the glittering gem in the box to the twinkling stars in Shane's eyes. A laugh bubbled up from the depths of her core. Yes, she said. Yeah? Yes. She flung her arms around his neck and kissed him sloppily on the mouth. Yes, she said quieter, her eyes closing as they swayed together. Yes. Chapter 25 Driving Robin's truck with the tiny house attached to it was more exhilarating than Shane could describe. No wonder she loved this thing. It was something indescribable to have everything he owned and needed right on the hitch. He'd agreed to go to Three Rivers with her so he could see the facilities for himself, though he was convinced he wouldn't like it nearly as much as the ranches in the hill country. 
he wanted to at least pretend like he had an open mind for Robin. The town had been charming, a bit bigger than Grapeseed Falls, with not nearly as many touristy attractions, but he could see the allure of living in such a quaint, picturesque town. The ranch, however, was a good forty-five-minute drive from any sort of civilization whatsoever. By the time he made the turn from asphalt to the dirt road, he wondered how often the cowboys who lived out went into town for supplies. He rounded a corner, and the most magnificent sight spread before his eyes. Whoa! He subconsciously slowed the truck to take in the sight before him. A homestead on the right side of the road had emerald green grass with a couple of bikes lying on it. Across from that sat a huge barn and several stables with a large sign that said, Bowman's Champion Breeds. He read the sign aloud and Robin said, She's the champion barrel racer. She breeds horses and trains them out here. She has over two dozen at any given time. Who farriers for her? Shane asked. Whoever she can get, Robin said. She asked me about coming up here more often. How often? He glanced at Robin before taking in the second, obviously older homestead down the road a bit and set back from the other buildings. To the west of that sat all the ranch buildings, the silos, and a huge all-glass building that boasted the sign, Courage Reigns. Every month, Robin said. She wants me for a week every month. Not full time, Shane thought, but there was plenty more to see. And that's Courage Reigns, she said, pointing though she certainly didn't need to. A few cars sat in the parking lot, and a man wearing a huge smile came through the door pushing another man in a wheelchair. They both radiated joy, and Shane wondered if this place could be as magical as Robin claimed it was. Oh, there's Pete. He owns the place. She rolled her window down and Shane brake so she could call to him. Pete brought the disabled man right over to the truck. Miss Robin, you made it. He boomed like having Robin here was the greatest thing that had ever happened to him. This is Riley Wilcox. He just finished his riding lesson. Hello, Riley. Robin looked at Pete. Can I show Shane around your place once we check in with Squire? Any time, ma'am. He tipped his hat at her and then glanced past her to Shane. He wasn't sure, but he felt like he was being weighed and measured, and somehow he passed this Pete's qualifications. You must be Shane. That I am. How the other man knew of him, Shane wasn't sure. Pete didn't elaborate either. Well, Robin, I've got a meeting at one for about an hour, so if you want me to do the tour, don't come then. <laughs> we want you, Pete. Robin grinned and settled back in her seat. Is Squire in the administration trailer? I have no idea where he is. Could be. He turned Riley around, and Shane pulled over into the longer driveway leading to the more established homestead. We can't go much farther with this house. Oh my gosh, the house. Robin turned to check on it. It's fine, Shane said but I'm not getting around that corner. He nodded to the sharp right turn that led in front of the barns and stable and on down to a large metal building Robin had described to him as the administration trailer. This is a big ranch, he said. Yep, Robin beamed at him, and you've already met Squire and his family, so let's go. She hopped from the truck and started down the road toward the admin trailer. Shane had no choice but to follow her, and as he did, he realized he didn't mind doing that. He'd follow her wherever she wanted to go, including up here in the Texas panhandle to this ranch, if that was what she wanted. They met with Squire, who shook both of their hands, and welcomed them to Three Rivers Ranch. He introduced them to his foreman, a silver-haired man named Garth, and his lead cowboy, a blonde cowboy named Ethan. His wife owns Bowman's Breeds, Robin hissed to Shane, and he nodded at Ethan. They walked down to the bullpens and back to the cabins, fifteen of them in all, double the size of Duane's operation. How many head do you have here? Shane asked. Forty thousand, Squire said. Give or take a few. A couple of dogs ran in front of them, but Sinna stayed at Shane's side. She would love this ranch, and the sound of children's voices met his ears. How many kids? he asked. Grapeseed Ranch didn't have any kids beside Kurt's new baby. Oh, I've got four, Squire said. Pete's got three, Bryn and Ethan have one, but they live in town, technically with another on the way. Garth has two. Most of our boys aren't married, but if they have kids, they can bring them out. Cal's got a daughter here every other weekend, Garth said, almost a gentle reminder. Oh, that's right, Squire said. Cal's my veterinary assistant, great cowboy. Former rodeo man like Ethan, Garth added. Nope, Ethan said, shaking his head. What? 
Garth asked almost too innocently. Just no, Ethan said. Shane had no idea what conversation the men were having, but he didn't care much. The sky here was spectacular, and he felt something in the wind that simply didn't exist in Hill Country. So you'll be staying with two great cowboys, Squire said, bringing Shane back to the conversation. Aaron and Tate, here they are. The two men came down the steps of one of the cabins. They all shook hands and welcomed Robin back to the ranch. Robin, you can put your house on the end by Garth's like you did last time. Thanks, Squire. I think we're going to squeeze in a tour at Courage Rains before we get the house settled. Is that okay? Sure, yeah. If Pete's having a meeting today, steal me one of his pastries. He grinned and Shane didn't think the man wanted for much, especially sweets. He said the meeting's not till one, Robin said. Then I know when to come by. Squire turned back to the admin trailer, his head bent toward Garth as the foreman said something. Shane went with Robin between barns and over to the equine therapy facility. It was massive, bigger than he'd thought from the front building, and he whistled as they entered a huge indoor arena where three horses worked. Each had a rider and an assistant, and Shane thought maybe he could get used to the 45-minute drive to town for milk. Robin went to find Pete, and when they returned, Shane couldn't help saying, this place is amazing. Pete grinned and leaned against the railing, too. Thanks. It's been doing well for a couple of years now. For a while there, I wasn't sure I could keep it open, but we managed. How many people does it employ? Oh, gosh. He exhaled, the wheels in his head obviously turning. About fifty, I think. I've got the whole front office to run. I've got trainers and horses and cowboys to look after the trainers and horses. He grinned. How many horses? I buy new ones all the time, Pete said, and I take some of Squire's retired ones. I think I've got 15 in the rotation right now. See, our veterans don't rotate animals. They work with the same horse every time they come. That made perfect sense to Shane, and he swallowed hard before asking his next question. Do you only work with veterans? Pete zeroed in on him, and Shane swore the man could see right through him. Of course not. Anyone who thinks they might benefit from equine therapy. He exchanged a quick glance with Robin. We'd like to try it, he said. Pete swung his head to Robin. Both of you? He's been mad at his dad for years, and I sold everything I owned to buy a tiny house, she said, summing up their issues so succinctly. He's been getting better and better at letting go, and I'm still trying to learn how to put down roots. Pete blinked at both of them. Well... I don't even know who to pair you with for issues like that. We can pick out the horses, Shane said. If there's anything we're good at, it's that. Well, sure, Pete said. You'll be here for three weeks. Let's see what we can do. The three weeks passed like lightning striking. There one second and gone the next. Shane had enjoyed every moment of his time at Three Rivers Ranch. Every moment working a different ranch with different cowboys every moment of his therapy with a big black horse named Shadow. And he did feel better after he worked with the horse. Just like training Cinna, there was something rewarding about working with animals, feeling the bond between himself and another living creature. Horses were a lot like dogs, and they didn't judge him when he got frustrated over a text or snippy because he was hungry and tired. Still, as he rolled back into Grapeseed Falls, the sense of home filled him. He backed the house onto the cement pad with Robin's assistance, and then he leaned out the window while she paused next to him. So what did you think of the ranch? She asked. It was amazing. He watched her carefully. What did you think? I love it there. She put her hand in her back pockets and sighed. But this is home. She looked at Shane, every bit as vulnerable as she allowed herself to be with him. Isn't it, Shane? He got out of the truck and took her in his arms. He gazed at the blue sky here, the same one that hung over three rivers. There were peach trees here that didn't exist there. Neighbors and friends he loved and who loved him. A ranch and a boss he cherished. Yeah, he whispered. This is home. I think so, too. She tipped up on her toes and kissed him. So, let's talk to Levi and Heather about making it ours, permanently. He gazed down at her, love filling him from top to bottom, front to back. Yeah? You want to put your roots right here? She tiptoed her fingers up his chest and thumped over his heart in time with the words she spoke. Right here, 
He leaned down and kissed her, joy spiraling through him. Love you, Robin. He couldn't wait to marry her, make a life with her, right here. I love you too, Shane. Chapter One Dylan Royal aimed the all-terrain vehicle toward the ranch and got the machine going at full speed, the pictures on his phone adding weight to the device in his pocket. Dwayne, the owner of Grapeseed Ranch where Dylan worked, wouldn't be happy. Calls would have to be made. After all, they were losing cattle to the coyotes that had been plaguing the ranch for over a year now. A downed cow here and there was a normal loss. But the pictures Dylan had on his phone marked the hundredth cow they'd lost in the past two months alone. Not just coyotes, he muttered to himself, his bones vibrating from the bumpy ground as the ATV sped toward home. Home. What a funny word for Dylan. He wasn't sure if Grapeseed Falls the town or Grapeseed Ranch was really home but both of his brothers were here, and he supposed that family made a place home more than where a place was physically located. He bypassed the house where Duane used to live before he married Felicity. It was used for dinner sometimes if the wind was particularly bad, and Duane kept the fridge stocked with water and soda and the cupboards with crackers and other snacks. Dylan had stopped by the house dozens of times on his way in from the outer zones, where he spent most of his time. He liked lounging on the comfortable couch in the living room, or sometimes the hammock he tied to one post of the back porch, and the trees several feet from that. The house, which had been empty for a couple of years now, was a great place to get away and just think, just be, reset himself. But he didn't stop today. Today he needed to find Duane and have a serious talk. He knocked on the back door of the homestead. Duane? He entered, but he knew immediately that no one was home. Instead of traipsing all over the ranch to find him, Dylan pulled out his phone and called the boss. Hey, he said when Duane answered. Where are you? Loud laughter came through the line, and Dylan frowned. Didn't they all know they'd just lost 13 more cows to wolves? Wolves, not coyotes. Of course they didn't know. No one else on the cowboy crew at Grapeseed Ranch spent more time in the outer zones than Dylan did. Duane said something over the ruckus on his end of the line, but Dylan couldn't make out the words. Frustration boiled beneath his skin, similar to the way he felt whenever his father texted him. I'm over it, Kurtz. May set out lunch. Of course she did. Dylan loved May and Kurt, his next-door neighbors in the cabin community directly east of the homestead. His stomach growled, reminding him that he'd been out in the wilderness for over 24 hours with only protein bars and bottled water. We lost 13 more cows, he said. Duane sucked in a tight breath. Thirteen in one day? Some of them were killed further out, probably a few days ago, Dylan said. I just now found them. He stepped back outside and swung his leg over the seat of the ATV. Boss, I think they're wolves taking our cows down. You're gonna need to make that call. Duane exhaled like Dylan had asked him to donate his kidney. Yeah, all right. I'll need you there to present everything. Tell me when and where, and I'll be there. He started the ATV and let the engine roar die down before asking, is there still something to eat at May's? Do you know May at all? Duane chuckled. She'll probably box it all up and send it home with Austin. You two will eat like kings for a few days. Dylan's mood lifted and he turned the vehicle toward the cabin community, where all the cowboys lived in a homey four-by-two grid of cabins, with a covered pavilion, a flagpole, and Kurt and May as their ranch parents. He parked the ATV behind his back door because it was his primary mode of transportation around the ranch. While the other boys mostly used horses, Dylan had way too far to go to take an animal. With the scent of chocolate hanging in the air, he walked next door and up Kurt's back steps. The door was open, letting the April breeze blow through the house, and laughter and chatter met his ears. Relief spread through Dylan, bringing a smile to his face. Hey, guys, he said upon entering. Kurt turned toward him, the cutest little girl cradled in his arms. Despite Dylan's hunger, he reached for Greta, the almost 12-month-old who'd stolen his heart the day she'd been born. Hey, my baby. He chuckled at her as her face lit up. With a head full of dark hair, Dylan had been smitten by Greta at first sight. The pull to be a father radiated through him as he cooed at the little girl and hugged her. May and Kurt had been so good to him, letting him watch Greta while they went to town, drove to the river, whatever. 
He'd volunteered to babysit more times than he could count, and Greta snuggled into him the way she always did. Dylan liked to think she loved him third best, behind her mom and dad, and he asked, Did you eat without me? The girl babbled something, and Dylan took her with him toward the food still spread out on the counter. Oh, I see pickles. You love those. He picked up a baby dill and handed it to Greta, holding it for an extra moment until he was sure her chubby fingers had taken hold. An extra six-foot table had been set up beside the dining room one, and Dylan found almost everyone there. His older brother, Shane, and his fiancée, Robin, at the end of the dining room table. They'd be married by the end of the summer, about four months from now. Austin, Dylan's younger brother, sat next to him, engaged in what looked like a heated conversation with Chadwell Dyer, the youngest cowboy at the ranch. Dean Orwell sat across from them, watching but silent. Gabe sat next to Tretton and Jorge, and they tipped their heads back and laughed at something Felicity said. She sat across from them with Duane at her side. Dylan let time slow for a moment, enjoying the sense of camaraderie and family he could feel in this cabin. So his core family had been broken. Shane had found a way through it. Dylan would too. Not that he had any reason to. The lack of females out at Grapeseed made dating difficult. Getting to town hardly ever happened for him because of his isolated assignment on the edges of the ranch. Not that he'd tried that hard, but as he balanced Greta on his hip and took his plate of brisket, baked beans, and macaroni salad to an empty spot across from Shane, Dylan wondered if he should make more of an effort to get some female influence in his life. After all, he couldn't become a father by himself. There you are, Shane said. I called you four times. Out in the North End Zone, Dylan said, feeding Greta a small noodle before taking a whole forkful into his mouth. For three days. He looked at Dean, who worked with Duane on the agricultural side of the ranch. Hey, man, are we still on for ping pong tonight? Dean's whole face lit up, his bright blue eyes practically dancing with fire. He'd come to Grape Seed about the same time as the Royal Brothers, and he and his roommate had just bought a table tennis game for their cabin. Chad's got this whole bracket made. Dylan chuckled. Of course he does. Chadwell didn't do anything halfway, and Dylan spent most of his limited free time with his brothers or with Dean and Chad. Greta squirmed, and Dylan reset her on his thigh. She fussed, and he said, Hey, you're okay? You want another pickle? May appeared at the end of the table and scooped the toddler out of Dylan's arms. Little miss is ready for a nap. Ah, oh, Dylan complained. She just wanted another pickle. Greta's face crumbled, and she started to cry. May bounced her, her expression stern. It's nap time. Come by after work and take her to feed the chickens if you want. She smiled at Dylan, who nodded, a pull of sadness moving through him when May turned and took Greta down the hall to put her to bed. Shane chuckled as he shook his head. What? Dylan asked. You and that baby. I like babies, Dylan said, glancing at Robin. Not all of us live in a 200 square foot house. We're not opposed to babies. Robin said. We're not. Shane looked at her, surprise in his face. Oh boy, Dylan said. Sounds like you guys better work this out before August 25th. Another round of hysterical laughter came from the other end of the table, and Dylan turned toward Felicity and the other cowboys, once again with a full heart and the worry of those downed cows out of his mind. For now. Now? Dylan twirled the ping pong paddle as he glanced out the front window of Dean's cabin. It was almost 6.30 and he'd been done working for an hour. Freshly showered and with a bag of barbecue potato chips, his favorite, he'd been hoping for some fun and games tonight. I called the Texas Parks and Wildlife after lunch, and they said they'd send someone out as soon as possible. It's now. Dwayne didn't speak unkindly, but he also didn't care much about a friendly game of ping pong going on in the cabin community. Fine. Dylan said, give me a few minutes to grab the file from my cabin. We'll be at Kurt's. Duane hung up before Dylan could confirm, and he turned back to the other boys. I have to go, he said. Texas Parks and Wildlife showed up. He tossed his paddle to Austin. I was winning, so see if you can uphold the royal family name. He grinned at his brother, who looked so much like him they got mistaken for twins growing up. Dylan's hair was a little darker than Austin's now, like his blonde hair had been dipped in wood stain and left to dry. They both had a pair of blue eyes, 
but Austin's were more the color of the sky while Dylan's mimicked a deep water. He left his friend's cabin and headed toward his own. After quickly retrieving the folder where he kept detailed records, with pictures, dates, locations, and actions taken for the cattle they'd lost over the past year. Whistling, he headed over to Kurt's, where he suspected Shane had already gone, since their cabin was empty. He couldn't quite imagine living in the cabin with just Austin, but with Shane's wedding right around the corner, and Robin's tiny house parked on a patch of property Levi Rhodes owned, his brother would definitely be moving out. He heard Greta's babble as he climbed the front steps, and he scooped the girl into his arms as she toddled toward him on the porch. Hey, baby. He laughed and started whistling again. His mother had always told him he should move to California and become a professional whistler for Disney. They need people to do birds for their animated movies, she'd said, her face the animated thing in the room. Dylan had always shrugged off her suggestion, knowing it wasn't really what she thought. Who made a living whistling for cartoons? But Greta loved his whistling, and she started to sing along her high-pitched baby babbles not really a harmony that matched. He didn't care, and he danced with her the way he'd seen the princes and princesses do in those animated movies Disney made. The little girl giggled and laughed, and Dylan cut off his whistling to join in. Can I cut in? The definitely female pitch made Dylan freeze, almost giving Greta whiplash. He turned around to find a woman lifting her long, long leg to the top step of the porch and then coming to a rest a brilliant smile on her tanned face. She wore jeans that seemed to go on for miles before they covered a pair of dark brown cowgirl boots. Her pink and black plaid shirt was tucked in, revealing curves that made Dylan's throat dry. She had dark hair flowing over her shoulders, but pinned back from her face so her stunning dark golden eyes could glint at him in what he could only define as flirtatious. Impossible. Though he didn't know who she was, she hadn't shown up on the ranch to flirt with him, a cowboy whose best friend happened to be a 12-month-old baby. You're a great whistler, she said when he stood there, mute. The dancing could be improved, but considering you have to hold your partner up, I'd give it a six. A six? His eyebrows went up, and he glanced down at baby Greta. I think we deserve a ten, don't you? The girl said nothing, simply stared at the imposter on the front porch. Dylan glanced at her, too. Are you from Texas Parks and Wildlife? She gave a little curtsy that sent Dylan's pulse into a frenzy. Her limbs were long, and a smattering of freckles dusted her cheeks and nose. Her smile was quick, with white teeth showing through, and it might have been because Dylan hadn't seen an available female in months, but he really wanted to know everything about this woman. I'm Hazel Brewster, she said. I heard you have a wolf problem, and I'm here to help you with that. She spoke with a drawl that definitely didn't come from Texas. Dylan wanted her to help with a lot more than the wolves stalking their cattle, but he kept that thought to himself. Meetings in there. He used Greta to gesture toward the cabin. I guess we've just been waiting on you. Hazel stepped closer to him, the scent of her skin or her shirt almost making his eyes roll back into his head. She probably used shampoo called vanilla snowflake or something else that made entirely no sense. But in that moment, he didn't care. She smelled feminine and floral and fruity, with a hint of red-hot cinnamon, and he wanted to take a deep inhalation of her scent and hold his breath for as long as possible. Using those long legs, she moved past him and into the cabin, glancing over her shoulder to say, I really do want to dance with you sometime, before turning back and disappearing through the doorway. This has been Claiming the Cowboy, a Royal Brothers novel, Grape Seed Falls Romance, Book 5, written by Liz Isaacson, performed by Caroline McLaughlin. Copyright 2018 to present by Ilana Johnson. Production copyright by Ilana Johnson.